Billionaire at Sea Written by K. L. Middleton Copyright 2022 All Rights Reserved 1. Mia Mia, are you there? asked Ridley from the other end of the phone. Yes, I replied, gritting my teeth. Why didn't you tell me that we were catering a bachelor party? Because I knew you'd say no, she said matter-of-factly. This made me seethe inside. For Pete's sake, Ridley, what in the world were you thinking? You of all people should know that the last thing I want to do is place myself on a boat filled with drunken toddlers for an entire week. Number one, it's a yacht. Number two, they're extremely rich toddlers who will tip us very well. Number three, we only have to be around them for a couple of days, and number four, the owner of the boat is Damien Stryker. Yeah, so. I answered, not recognizing the name and not giving a crap if he was the President of the United States. The thought of being trapped in the middle of the ocean with a bunch of horned-up self-deserving men made my skin crawl. If anything, I was hurt. Hurt because Ridley, one of my best friends in the world, had to know how upsetting this would be. Especially since my ex had cheated on me at his own bachelor party, less than a year ago. If you watched baseball, you'd know he's the pitcher for the Tampa Bay. I don't care who this Damien guy is, I replied, pacing back and forth in my living room. Seriously, Ridley, you know why I don't want to do this. I'm sorry, Mia. I really thought you'd be over the incident with John, by now. Besides, these are all strangers, for all we know, they'll be very well behaved. I'm trying to get over it, but this certainly won't help, I said miserably. My heart still ached from the memory of walking into our newly built house the morning after his stag party. I'd been out of town for a catering convention with Ridley, and we'd returned earlier than planned. I'd found him naked and passed out in bed, but not alone. Apparently, one of the strippers from his party had given him a ride home in her fancy new Corvette, and then another in our bed. After waking him with a cold bucket of water, John had begged for my forgiveness, using the excuse that he hadn't remembered anything. But from the smirk on the stripper's face and the number of condom wrappers on the floor, I knew it had been a pretty unforgettable night. Look, I'm sorry I didn't tell you. The truth is, we need this gig. I'm behind on some bills, and if we don't do something quickly, we're going to lose the catering van, said Ridley. I groaned. Seriously? Seriously. I knew we should have taken that bar mitzvah party last weekend. I had the flu. We couldn't. Maybe I could have tried doing it myself, I murmured. Listen to me, the guest list was too big and pulling it off would have been a nightmare. At least we'd have been paid, I replied glumly. We will be paid big time if we take this gig. I didn't say anything. Come on, Mia, she pleaded. You even mentioned that you were having a hard time coming up with rent for next month. Damien Stryker is paying us enough money that you won't have to worry about it for the next six. I sighed. Look, all we have to do is prepare the meals and hand them off to the servers. We'll be in the kitchen most of the time and probably won't be anywhere near the guests. Admittedly, that didn't sound completely horrible. My brother told me that Damien's yacht is ridiculously huge. Seriously, I'm sure we'll never have to deal with any of the drunken idiots. Mia's brother was a sports agent and had a lot of connections. He'd been the one who'd set up our gig with Damien Stryker. When I'd first learned that we'd be spending an entire week cruising near the Virgin Islands, I'd been ecstatic. Now, I felt nothing but anxiety. Is your brother going to be there? Michael was a decent guy, and someone who I trusted to keep things under control. No, she replied. It's a very private party, 
and even he doesn't know who's going to be on the guest list. More than likely, a bunch of sports celebrities. You know, this could actually be the chance of a lifetime. It may even earn us more business once they try our food. As long as that was the only thing they tried tasting. I couldn't speak for myself, but Ridley was beautiful, and men were always asking her out. She had a boyfriend, however, and wasn't the cheating kind. Even with someone rich, handsome, or famous. I guess it does sound like a great opportunity, I admitted, reluctantly giving in. And, as you said, it's not like we have to be anywhere near these guys during the bachelor party. Exactly. All we have to do is make sure their tummies are happy. As far as other parts of their bodies, we'll let the strippers or hookers worry about that. Yuck, I replied, grimacing. Do you really think there could be prostitutes at this thing? I don't know. They certainly have the money to get whatever it is that they want. I can't imagine a bachelor party without some kind of naked entertainment. Hopefully, it would stop at pornos, but I didn't believe we'd be so lucky. So, what do you think? Are you in or out? I stared outside of my living room window and smiled grimly. What I think is that I'm crazy for agreeing to this. But you'll do it? Yes. It sounds like we don't have a choice. We both obviously need the money. She squealed. This job is going to change our lives. I can feel it in my bones. All I felt was a tight knot in the pit of my stomach. Something told me she was right, but at what price? Two. Mia. The following day, Ridley's brother, Michael, invited us both to dinner to discuss the trip and Damien Stryker. We had a week to plan the menu and purchase what we needed for the stag party, and I had yet to meet the man hiring us. Michael said Damien is going to try and meet us for dinner, she told me, when we were in my kitchen and drinking coffee earlier in the day. So wear that black cocktail dress of yours. John had picked out that particular dress, and I hadn't put it on in months. It was tight, flirty, and drew attention, which wasn't something I particularly wanted. Since breaking up with him, I'd been taking a sabbatical from the opposite sex, and still wasn't ready to return to the dating scene. Why? I asked, narrowing my eyes. Wait a second. You're not trying to set me up with this guy, are you? She gave me an innocent look. No. Of course not. I stared at her hard. Ridley. What, she said, trying to keep a straight face. Even I know that it would be totally unprofessional and in bad taste. Exactly. Removing a binder from around her wrist, she pulled her blonde hair back and made it into a ponytail. I mean, if he finds you attractive and decides to ask you out, that might not necessarily be such a bad thing, would it? He is rich and now very available. He's single? I replied, not even sure why I was asking. I certainly wasn't interested in dating anyone and didn't know what this guy looked like, or even more importantly, how he treated women. He was recently divorced, she said. From what Michael said, it was pretty messy. Let me guess, he had an affair. I said dryly, knowing that I was being cynical but had good reason. No. In fact, I think it was all her. They have a son together, and it sounds like she's a horrible mother. I sighed. Really? That's too bad. Ridley nodded. Obviously, he travels a lot, and apparently she parties like a rock star. I'm sure there's more to it than that but Michael told me that Damien ended up getting full custody of their son. Poor kid. The woman must be truly neglectful to lose in court. You hardly ever see cases go that way. Or the judge is a big baseball fan, I replied, taking a sip of coffee. 
Ridley shrugged. I guess there's always that. Money and fame do strange things to people, even judges. Anyway, you still have to feel sorry for their son. I think he's only eight. Poor kid, I replied, picturing a sad little boy who was probably missing the hell out of his mommy. Even if she was a party animal, that didn't mean he loved her any less. So, if Damien has full custody, does he take his son along with him when he travels? I have no idea. I'm sure he has a nanny or something. So, basically, he probably doesn't get to see his father or his mother very much. Maybe, maybe not. On the other hand, his dad is a famous baseball player and probably spoils the crap out of him. Even so, money can't replace someone you love, I replied, remembering when my parents had divorced. I just turned 11 when it happened. My father had been an alcoholic, and after many years of trying to get him to quit drinking, my mother couldn't take it anymore. One morning, after he'd banged up the car because of drinking, she kicked him out of the house, refusing to let him back in until he sought treatment. Unfortunately, my father didn't believe he had a drinking problem, nor did he like ultimatums. He ended up getting his own place, and I was able to visit him every other weekend. Luckily, he was usually sober during those times, although I suspected it hadn't been easy for him. Tragically, he ended up passing out behind the wheel while returning home from a Christmas party, five years later. His car hit a tree, and it was said that he died upon impact. My heart broke after hearing the news. As many problems as he had, I always knew that my father had loved me, and I'd never stopped loving him. Ridley's eyes softened. I know. You're right, and I'm sure you know that more than anyone. I'm just saying that Damien Stryker wouldn't necessarily be such a bad catch. I'm sure he wouldn't, but I'm not interested in casting out any lines. Not right now, at least. Fine. I get it. But it's been almost a year since John pulled that crap on you, and your social life is like a cat lady's minus the cats. You might be missing out on the man of your dreams, because you're living like a hobbit. And no, I'm not necessarily talking about Damien. I know that this might be hard for you to comprehend, but my life doesn't have to revolve around a man or my search for the perfect one. I'm quite happy being alone. You're quite happy sitting home every weekend all by yourself, she asked with a small smile. Admittedly, I did get bored and even miss John at times. I sometimes had to stop myself from answering his calls or messages. Just last week he'd sent me a text. Mia, I know I made a mistake, but I love you and we can still have a life together. As usual, I'd ignored him, although it hadn't been easy. I'm fine with my life right now. Besides, I told her, most of the weekends are tied up because of the business anyway. I don't remember many of them where I'm sitting at home, bored out of my skull and miserable. Whatever. There's time. I find it with Adam. I am starting to think that you've forgotten how to be single. Believe me, that's definitely not the case, I said dryly. I was reminded of it every day when I woke up and found myself alone in bed. Still, you need some fun in your life. I have fun. I nodded toward my trusty camera sitting on the counter. When I'm bored, I take that out. And take naked pictures, she teased. I snorted. No. Of course not. Ridley picked it up and turned it on. She began looking through my most recent photos, which I'd taken at the beach right before sunset. She glanced at me. I mean, I have to admit you take stunning pictures. Thank you. My father had given me my first camera, after he'd moved out of the house. I soon developed a passion for photography, but mainly as a hobby. Cooking was still my first love, 
which my mother had introduced to me when I was old enough to look over the kitchen counter. The camera, on the other hand, brought me a different kind of joy. It captured moments in time that you'd never get back, but could still reflect on fondly. You know, Mia, you could probably sell a lot of these photos online, she said, looking through more of them. There are websites that allow you to do that. Why would I want to sell them? She gave me a surprised look. For money. I mean, look at this photo. Whose dog is this? He's adorable enough, and you were able to catch him at just the right moment, when he's airborne. And look at this one, it looks like something you'd see in National Geographic. I walked over and smiled at the pictures I'd taken on Cocoa Beach. A man had let his golden retriever puppy loose near the water. He'd allowed me to take a couple of shots while the animal taunted a ghost crab moving in the sand. I doubt I'm allowed to sell most of the pictures I've taken without getting a release form from the models. Something tells me that this one would have given you a rough time, she joked. I laughed. Exactly. Anyway, this really is just a hobby. Not like cooking. She handed me back the camera. I guess I should be happy that you're not investing too much time with this, or making it a career. I don't know what I'd do without you. Although Ridley was a fantastic cook, and we'd both graduated from culinary school together, she didn't have a lot patience, especially when it came to food preparation. If something went wrong, it wasn't unusual for her to fly into hysterics. Usually, it was up to me to calm her down and get us back on track. We do make a great team, I agreed. Although, it would be nice to start earning enough money that we could hire an assistant or two. Then we could start doing much larger parties. At the moment, we were currently working out of Ridley's mother's gourmet kitchen in Miami. Her parents were loaded and owned three homes, one in Florida, one in Hawaii, and one in New York. Her father was some kind of real estate developer, and they were currently in Maui on business. Although it was saving us a ton of money, we really wanted our own facility to work from, and had been discussing the possibility of applying for a loan to do just that. I'm telling you, this gig we have coming up might just allow us to do something like that. How much is he paying us? You didn't really give me an actual figure yet, I asked before finishing the rest of my coffee. Enough so I can purchase those Jimmy Choo sandals I saw at Saks yesterday. Which is? Twenty grand. Plus the cost of food, she said, beaming. I stared at her in shock. Had I heard her correctly? Twenty thousand dollars? She nodded. I knew she'd said the money was going to be great, but I had no idea. That's insane. How many guests? I asked, elated now. Roughly fifteen. I mean, we'll have our hands full. We have to prepare breakfast, lunch, and dinner from Friday through Sunday. And that's not including the actual party. Twenty grand. I can't believe it, I replied, feeling a rush of excitement and relief, especially knowing that the bills really would get paid for the next few months. I could even afford to have someone look at my truck, which was making a clunking noise every time I turned a corner. Are you sure he said grand? I'm positive. We'll verify it with him tonight, since he might be joining us for dinner. I seriously can't wait to meet this guy in person. Maybe I'll stop by Saks on the way home and see if they still have those sandals in my size, she said, grabbing her cell phone. I'd love to wear them tonight. For the first time since I'd heard the name Damien Stryker, I had to admit, I couldn't wait to meet him either. 3. Mia We drove separately and met Ridley's brother, Michael, at Café Bianca, a ritzy five-star restaurant where it was usually impossible to get a reservation unless you had connections. How did you pull this off? 
Ridley asked after we were seated. Was it to Damien? Excuse me, he asked, smiling wryly. I'll have you know that I'm a reputable agent now. Don't you think I have some pull in this city? It's Miami, not one of those hick towns you frequent, where anyone driving a BMW is considered a big deal, she teased. No offense, Jerry Maguire. He pretended to look hurt. Obviously, you missed the memo, little sister. I am a big deal now, and if you play your cards right with Stryker, you just might get an invitation to the club. It's one of the reasons why we've agreed to catering a stag party, she replied with a look of distaste. And of course, the money. Which reminds me, is Damien showing up tonight? He's going to try, replied Michael, sitting back in his chair. Good, she replied. I'm dying to meet him. So is Mia. Michael looked at me. Speaking of Mia, how are you doing tonight, gorgeous? That color looks amazing on you, by the way. I blushed. I was wearing a coral and white sundress that even I had to admit showed off my tan. I'm doing very well, thank you. What about you? Where's your husband this evening? Michael had recently gotten married to a golf pro from Palm Beach. A man named Alex Torrenson. Ridley and I had actually catered their reception, which had been relatively easy, since they'd kept the wedding small. He's working again. I swear I see him less and less now that we're married, said Michael, twirling his wedding ring around his finger. But in all fairness, he has his hands full with the clubhouse, especially now that he bought out the other owner and is running it all on his own. Really? That's wonderful news. Tell him congratulations for me, will you? said Ridley. I know he was talking about doing it for the past few months. He finally bit the bullet, said Michael. And although he's busy, he's a lot happier. Hell, we both are. Alex must be relieved to be away from that jerk, said Ridley. God, yes. The guy wasn't willing to change with the times, which was definitely hurting business. Not to mention the fact that when the prick found out Alex was gay, he showed his true colors. He glanced at me, his smile grim. A complete homophobe. He didn't even have the decency to try and hide it. Good riddance then. Alex is a wonderful man and shouldn't have to deal with that on top of everything else, I replied. By the way, tell him I said hello and wish him the best. I'll do that, said Michael. His offer still stands if you're ever interested in getting into the sport. Free lessons from the master himself. If he can teach me, he can teach anyone. I chuckled. That's very kind of him. Let him know that I might take him up on it one day. Will do, he answered. Not to change the subject, but did you find out who Damien's friend is that's getting married? asked Ridley. No. He's being really tight-lipped about the bachelor party, he replied, examining the cocktail menu. I took a sip of my water and asked if it could be someone on his baseball team. Michael shook his head. I doubt it. It's in the middle of the season, and the only reason Damien is able to throw this party is because he retired last year. Really? Wow. I hadn't heard, said Ridley, surprised. Since when have you followed baseball? He asked, looking amused. Growing up, you couldn't stand it. It wasn't that I hated baseball. I just got tired of you and Dad always hogging the television to watch sports. If it wasn't baseball, it was football. If it wasn't football, it was basketball or hockey, she said. Oh, whatever. You never had time for television, said Michael. If I remember anything, it was that you were always off gallivanting with your friends and never home anyway. Technicalities, she answered, smiling. Anyway, Adam watches baseball religiously and has educated me on the sport. I'm actually starting to like it. 
Adam, Ridley's boyfriend, was definitely a huge sports fan. It seemed like it was all he usually talked about when I was around. Really? That man is definitely a keeper. Michael looked at me. What about you? Do you like baseball? I have nothing against it. It's just a little boring to watch, I admitted. Did you just say that baseball is boring to watch? exclaimed Michael, feigning a look of complete shock. That's blasphemy. I laughed. I'm sorry. I don't know. I guess I'd rather play than watch. Which is why you should get back into the game, said Ridley, grinning wickedly. Get yourself some home runs before you forget how to score. Get back into the game? Were you on a team? Michael asked, missing Ridley's jab. When I was in grade school I played softball, I replied, giving Ridley a warning look. So you lost interest? Michael asked. Not really. I just stopped playing, I said. You have a habit of doing that said Ridley with a glint in her eye. I bet Damien Stryker knows his way around the field and plays a mean game of baseball. I groaned. Would you please stop? At least check out the size of his bat, she said. Michael laughed. Is my little sister trying to play matchmaker? Yes, I said. And it's very annoying. As you can see, she's uptight because she hasn't been laid in months, Ridley told him. I gasped. Ridley. What? I'm only trying to help, she replied, reaching for her glass of water. I don't need your help, I replied, even though she was right. I hadn't had sex since John. I wasn't uptight, however. At least, I didn't think I was. I just didn't like discussing my love life over dinner and with her brother, who was now looking at me with pity. Obviously. You're a beautiful woman, and if you wanted a romp in the hay, I'm sure guys would jump in line for a chance. Don't waste your time with Damien, however. His ex messed him up big time. He's now going through women like you go through shoes, Ridley. Mia doesn't need that in her life. Believe me, I said. I'm not looking to hook up with anyone. Especially a guy who's obviously a big player off of the field too. Understand, Ridley? She sighed. Fine. I'll let it rest. I'd believe it when I saw it. Changing the subject, did you happen to get those shoes you were talking about earlier? I asked her. She gave me a pouty look. No. They were out. I bought another pair, however. What do you think? Ridley stuck her shoe out. It was a white sparkly pump, which went great with the lace cap sleeve dress she wore in the same color. Very pretty. Jimmy Choo. I asked. No, Valentino, she replied. More expensive, but I couldn't resist. You can never resist, which is why you're always broke, said her brother. She stuck her tongue out at him. He smiled and then looked past me. Good. Our waiter must have punched in. I was beginning to think we were invisible. I was wondering what was taking so long myself, said Ridley. The server approached our table. He was in his twenties, and reminded me a bit of a younger Leonardo DiCaprio. Good evening, my name is Ben. I'm sorry to make you wait so long. Welcome to Café Bianca. Is this your first time here? Oh, heavens no, said Ridley, tossing her blonde hair over her shoulder. Why would you ask that? Because I would have remembered someone as beautiful as you, he replied, winking at her. Ridley blushed. Nice return. You know, you should be flirting with my brother. He's the one tipping tonight. He turned to Michael and chuckled. Well, good looks obviously run in the family. I hope you're not offended if I just keep it at that. 
Not at all, he replied, smiling up at him. But I might be offended if you've run out of prime rib. It seems like everywhere I go, there's a shortage. I'm almost 100% sure that it's still available, the waiter replied. But I'll check for you. Thank you, he answered. No problem. He then went over the specials for the evening. The salmon sounds fabulous, said Ridley. I'm probably going to have that. People rave about it. By the way, could I start you out with something to drink? He asked, this time looking at me. Other than water? I ordered a glass of white wine, while Ridley and Michael both ordered martinis. Then, just so you know, there might be another person joining us, said Michael, looking at his watch. A gentleman. Excellent. I'll keep watch after I put your orders in for the cocktails while you peruse the menu. Did you want to order an appetizer? I'm sure we will. Give us a few minutes, if you could. Michael replied. Of course, said Ben. He quickly refilled our water glasses. I'll return shortly with fresh bread. Thank you, replied Michael. I sure hope Damien can join us, said Ridley, looking toward the entrance. By the way, why isn't he playing baseball anymore? He can't be much older than thirty. Isn't that a little young to retire? He injured his arm, and it hasn't been the same. I wouldn't ask him about it, by the way, said Michael, lowering his voice. It's a touchy subject. I bet, I said. So, how well do you really know this guy? I asked, opening up the menu. I met him at a party in Beverly Hills, about five years ago. Like me, he has an interest in classic cars and we've attended some auctions together. In fact, two months ago when I acquired my 67 GTO, Damien bought himself a 65 Shelby Cobra. Talk about a gorgeous car. Are those expensive? asked Ridley. That one was. I believe he paid over 500,000, replied Michael. And that was just on a whim. A whim? Sounds like my kind of guy. Too bad I'm not single and hopelessly in love, said Ridley. I can't even imagine having that kind of money to throw around. He must have made a lot playing professional baseball. I said in a low voice. He certainly did, but that's nothing compared to what he's inherited from his grandfather, who passed away three years ago. Apparently, the man once owned a shipping company and after he sold it, made some solid investments. Michael lowered his voice. Rumor has it that he's worth billions now. Damien is? asked Ridley. Yes. But you didn't hear it from me, he replied. Wow, said Ridley, looking my way. Maybe we should negotiate for more money. Don't you dare, I told her. He's already paying us more than enough. Of course I won't. I was only joking, she answered, but I could tell she wasn't totally against the idea. I looked at Michael. What about his parents? Are they gone? I asked, wondering if he'd inherited the family fortune all by himself. He nodded. They died in a plane crash when Damien was very young. He lived with his grandparents afterward. How horrible. And there are no brothers or sisters? I asked. Or aunts and uncles? I know that he has two living cousins from his mother's side, he replied staring over my head again. One of them is a singer in a band. She is. Which one? asked Ridley. Why don't you ask him? He just walked into the restaurant, said Michael. 4. Mia. Wow, I need to start watching more baseball, murmured Ridley, staring at Damien as he headed our way. Close your mouth. You're drooling, Michael said in amusement. I couldn't blame her. 
He was drop-dead gorgeous, even with his slightly crooked nose, which I learned afterward was the result of a flyball. Even you must admit, he's hot, she whispered to me. I nodded, noticing that we weren't the only ones checking him out. As Damien moved toward us, he seemed to draw the attention of almost everyone in the room. Tall broad shoulders, wavy dark brown hair and eyes that were a vibrant shade of blue. Michael stood up. Look at what the cat dragged in. How's it going, Mr. Stryker? Very well, Mr. Blake, he teased back. They shook hands, smiling at each other like longtime friends. Sorry, I'm late. Did you already order? Just our drinks, Michael replied. I'm glad you could make it. By the way, this is my sister Ridley and our dear friend Mia. Ah, my two gourmet chefs, he said, his eyes twinkling as he shook Ridley's hand. Ridley, I know we've spoken briefly on the phone. It's wonderful to finally get to meet you in person. You as well. We've heard so much about you, she said, her voice higher than usual. I bit back a smile. She'd always been nervous around handsome men, even as beautiful as she was. Not only that, this one was filthy rich and had an impeccable taste in clothing. The gray wool suit he currently wore was no exception. It was obviously a designer, and his tie clip had to cost more than the expensive two-carat ring I'd thrown back in John's face. Oh hell, he replied, glancing at Michael in amusement. And they're still willing to cater for me? These two don't scare easily, said Michael, smirking. That's a relief. I can't really cook, and I doubt we'll be able to order out when we're in the middle of the ocean, he replied, turning toward me with his hand extended. Hi, I'm Damien. I'm Mia, I replied as I shook his hand. It's a pleasure to meet you. Have we met before, he asked, studying my face. You look very familiar. No. I don't believe so, I replied. Are you sure? I hardly ever forget a face. Do you live here in Miami? He asked. Yes. Born and raised here, I said. Interesting, he replied, sitting down on the other side of Ridley. I could smell a hint of his cologne, a light woodsy scent that was very nice. Maybe it will come to me. I know I've seen you somewhere. The waiter took that moment to return with our drinks. Damien ordered a beer, along with a slew of appetizers. Sorry. I hope you don't mind, he said, loosening up his tie. I haven't eaten since this morning, and I'm fading quickly. No problem, said Michael, smiling. You're buying anyway, right? Go to town. Damien smiled. Of course I'm buying. I'm just messing with you. You're my guest this evening, Stryker. If you even think about paying for this food, I'll take it as a personal insult, said Michael. He laughed. Fine. I'd hate to get on your bad side. Speaking of money, my assistant should have deposited your funds into the account number you gave me over the phone, Ridley. As far as the food goes, have the merchants bill me directly or save your receipts so that we can figure that out as well. Oh. Gosh, thank you, said Ridley. I didn't realize you'd pay us so quickly. I wanted to make sure everything went smoothly and you were locked in, he replied, winking. No backing out now. We wouldn't dream of it, she answered. Famous last words, snickered Michael. No. Those will probably be, what in the world were we thinking by getting on board this nutcase's ship, said Damien, chuckling. Okay, now you two are scaring me, said Ridley. Don't worry, little sister. You're going to have the time of your life. Wait until you see his yacht. He took me out on it last summer. It's breathtaking. Not to mention enjoyable, especially when the captain kicks it down. Thank you, said Damien. I'm glad you enjoyed yourself.
It was a blast, he answered. Damien grinned. Good. I'll have to invite you back. Maybe next month sometime? I'm there, he replied, grinning. Just say when, and I'll clear up my schedule. Damien nodded. I'll look at my calendar and give you a call tomorrow. Michael nodded. Sounds good. Ridley took a sip of her drink and then asked Damien if he captained the yacht himself or hired someone else to do it. I have in the past, but not for this trip, he answered. There will be an entire crew on duty. Understandable, she replied. I'm sure you'd like to relax and enjoy yourself with the guests. Exactly. Speaking of our trip, have you come up with a menu yet? He asked, eyeing a waiter carrying a tray of mouth-watering steak and lobster. I cleared my throat. We're working on it. Do you have any special recommendations, or do you know if any of your guests have allergies? Not that I'm aware of. They're all full-grown men, however. If they're allergic to something, I'll leave it to them to avoid whatever it is that might not agree with them, he replied. I guess what I'd like to see is plenty of seafood, along with food favorable to guys with big appetites. Man food, said Ridley, glancing toward me. In other words, things that go good with beer? Damien chuckled. Exactly. Nothing too fancy. You know like chicken wings, nachos, burgers, pizza, steak, ribs. Okay, what about breakfast or brunch? asked Ridley, pulling out a pen and small pad of paper from her purse. Eggs, pancakes, sausage and French toast. Hash browns. Maybe some fruit on the side. Items like that. Again, nothing too fancy, although I'm not against egg souffles, crepes or frittatas, if that's what you specialize in. Most of these guys are used to eating big, hearty meals. Noted. By the way, who is the guest of honor? asked Ridley, smiling at him. Damien smiled back. You'll find out when you're on board. I promised him I wouldn't divulge the information. He's famous then, she asked. Just a little, Damien replied, his eyes glittering. A baseball player? asked Ridley. Enough, said Michael. Quit antagonizing him. He looked at Damien. Sorry. My sister can be a real pain in the ass when it comes to secrets. She just has to know everything. He's right. It's an annoying habit. I'm sorry, she said, blushing. It's okay, he answered. If I could tell you, I would. I'll give you a hint, though, he's been on stage and screen. Really? said Ridley, glancing at me. How exciting. Just don't ask me anything else about the guy. That's probably more than I should have admitted, said Damien. Has he been in anything recently? asked Ridley. Michael and I both groaned. He said no more questions about the guy, reminded Michael firmly. I know, she replied, as the waiter returned with Damien's beer. I'm just so excited about next week. Good, said Damien. So am I. It's going to be a lot of fun. For all of us. That's what I keep telling Mia, said Ridley. She looked at me. See. Nothing to worry about. Damien, catching that, looked at me. I'm sorry, you have some concerns? No. Not at all, I said quickly. She was just a little anxious about the event you're hosting, admitted Ridley, who obviously didn't know when to stop talking. You know, a bachelor party. I gave her a warning look. Ah. Well, you can be rest assured that there's nothing for you to worry about, said Damien. My guests will act like gentlemen around you, and if they don't, they'll answer to me. I'm not worried at all. I said, feeling a little embarrassed. I just, I stopped abruptly. I wasn't about to tell him about my ex and what had happened. 
I understand your concern, he said, after taking a sip of his beer. It's a bachelor party, and they're known to get out of hand. This one is going to be more of a weekend of vacationing among friends. We're going to fish, eat, and drink. As far as raising some hell, if we do, I assure you, it's not going to affect you girls. I will personally make sure of that. I relaxed. Besides, the yacht is large enough that if we start swinging from the chandeliers and acting like fools, you'll be far from it, he said with a wink. What's a bachelor party without a little craziness anyway? Added Michael, raising his martini glass. I say we make a toast right now. We all raised our drinks. What's the name of your boat? Michael asked. Home run, he replied. Big surprise there, right? Ridley chuckled. Because that's what life is all about, right? Going all the way and scoring big? Exactly, said Damien. Couldn't agree more. So, here's to what happens on the home run stays on the home run, said Michael. And here's to Mia making a home run on the home run, whispered Ridley. I kicked her foot. 5. Mia After finishing the glass of wine, my tongue loosened up, and I started to actually enjoy myself. I also found Damien's sense of humor and easygoing manner a relief. From what I could tell he wasn't a snob, even though the man was rich enough to buy an island. In fact, he mentioned at one point that he'd been considering doing just that. That sounds so exciting, said Ridley. Would you live there exclusively, or would it be more of a getaway? A getaway, he answered. For myself. My family. My closest friends. Ridley laughed and raised her martini glass. Here's to building long-lasting close friendships. Damien smiled and raised his beer. Especially with two gourmet chefs. Like I mentioned before, I'm not much of a cook and always need help in that department. Especially if I do end up acquiring some offshore property. I'd hate to have to stock my freezer with pizza and pot pies. I do that enough as it is. You certainly don't seem the type to indulge in too many frozen meals, I said, thinking out loud. Maybe not frozen, but when the employees at Chipotle see me walk through the door, they have my order finished before I make it to the counter, he replied. I eat out far too much. A busy man like you doesn't have a personal chef making your meals, asked Ridley. I have a housekeeper who stops in a couple times a week, and a full-time nanny for my son Jake. Thank goodness she can cook and feeds him most of his meals. As for me, I usually eat on the fly, he answered. Speaking of your son, do you have a picture of him? I asked. Damien reached into his back pocket and pulled out his wallet. When he showed us a picture of his son, my heart melted. He was a younger, softer version of Damien, with more dimples. He's adorable, I said, handing the photo to Ridley. He is, said Ridley, looking at it. She handed it back to him. He looks just like you. That's what everyone tells me. His eyes gazed lovingly at the photo, before he put it back into his wallet. Why don't you hire someone to cook for you and Jake full-time, asked Ridley. Or at the very least, have someone create your meals ahead of time? She's right. You could reheat them up in the microwave. That would have to be far better than fast food, said Michael. I've been considering it, especially now that Jake is living with me and I've retired, he replied. Speaking of retirement, said Ridley, how's that been going for you? Michael gave her a stern look. Damien shrugged. To tell you the truth, I've been so busy with my personal life that I haven't had time to really think about it. I'm sure you have. Anyway, back to what we were talking about, said Michael giving Ridley a warning look. 
I know a very good realtor who specializes in island property, so when you're ready to purchase, let me know. I'll find his number for you. He has excellent references and is very discreet. Thanks, replied Damien. I'd love to buy an island someday, said Ridley with a dreamy look in her eyes. Maybe even open up a resort of some kind. She looked at me. With our own restaurant. She'd mentioned it before. I knew it was well out of our reach, however. We'd need millions and could barely stay on top of the bills we had now. It sounds lovely, although, to be honest, the idea of being at the mercy of an island frightens me a bit, said Michael. What if there's a hurricane or some other kind of natural disaster? We'd have a helicopter to whisk us away from the island, she replied. Hell, let's just have a weatherman on speed dial. That way we'll have advance warning of impending doom, I said with a wry smile. Damien looked amused. Sounds like you both have it all figured out. I don't know about that, she said, staring at her glass. But I think everyone needs something to strive for. And why not shoot for the stars, right? I admire you for dreaming big. If it wasn't for dreams, I'd have never played professional baseball. In fact, my grandfather wanted me to go to Harvard so one day I could take over his shipping corporation. To his disappointment, running a business wasn't my dream. Just his. I imagine he got over it when you became a successful player, said Ridley. It's hard to say. He was a stubborn man just like his grandson, replied Damien, his lip curling up. You. Stubborn, said Michael, feigning disbelief. The hell, you say? Damien chuckled. Let me tell you something, said Michael, looking at me and Ridley. This guy puts the stub in stubborn. Or maybe it's the orn. I don't know, but once he sets his mind to something, it's all over but the crying. Damien sighed. You just won't let that go, will you? Let what go, asked Ridley. Oh, he's talking about this car I bought last year at an auction, said Damien. He didn't particularly even want it, but ended up in a bidding war, just so this young punk wouldn't get his hands on it, said Michael. What do you mean, asked Ridley. Have you ever heard of the junkyard jockey, asked Michael. Ridley snorted. No, I can't say that I have. He was the other bidder. Apparently, he has this YouTube channel. It's very popular, from what he told everyone at the auction, said Damien dryly. Anyway, this idiot records himself destroying expensive collectibles, just for the heck of it. Seriously? I asked, frowning. Why? for profit on the ads associated with his channel, and I'm sure he gets off on it too, said Damien. Anyway, we overheard how he wanted this 57 Porsche Speedster to be his next target. Apparently he'd been wanting one for a long time, mainly because his old man loves them. They must be very close, I said dryly. He snorted. No doubt. Talk about dysfunctionality. Anyway, I just couldn't let him have the car, knowing what he wanted to do with it. I bet Junkyard was angry, said Ridley. That's putting it mildly. He threw a childish tantrum, said Michael, and threatened Damien right there at the auction. Said he'd ruin him through social media. Smiling, I shook my head. You must have been trembling in your boots. Damien chuckled. I'm thinking that if I actually used social media, I'd have gained some new followers, considering what a little douchebag he is. You don't have a Twitter or Facebook account? asked Ridley. No. I understand why some people do it. It's just not my thing. We use it for our business, I said. Other than that, I try to stay away from social media and internet as much as possible. It's handy in many ways, 
but it's also poisoning our youth, said Damien. Kids aren't outside like they used to be. It's a shame. I agree, I said. And if they are outside, their faces are glued to their cell phones. Yeah, he said. It's pretty ridiculous. And guys like Junkyard are making a killing off of it. By the way, what happened after he threatened you at the auction? asked Ridley. He and his entourage were escorted out by security guards, Michael said. It was quite a scene. I can only imagine, I said, taking another sip of wine. Well, hopefully you'll never have to see that little shit again. I hope not, but if I ever do, I'll make sure to tell him how much I love my speedster and thank him for bringing the car to my attention, said Damien. We all laughed. 6. Mia As we were finishing up our meals, Damien asked if we had any other plans for the evening. My cousin's band is performing at this nightclub, just a few blocks away from the restaurant. I told her I'd stop by, he explained. I'd love it if you could join me. Kendall is the lead singer, and she has an incredible voice. She does indeed. I heard her sing before, said Michael setting his fork down. She reminds me a little of Adele. It sounds like fun. We don't have any plans, Ridley answered quickly. Do we, Mia? I was about to protest when I saw the pleading look in her eyes. Oh, uh, sure. Maybe for just one drink. Wonderful. What about you, Michael? Damien asked. Michael looked at his watch. I'm game. But just for one drink. I have to be up early in the morning for a meeting. Sounds great, said Damien. Parking is kind of crazy over there so why don't I have my limo drive all four of us to the club? When you're ready to leave, I'll have him pick you up in front and drive you back to your cars. Wonderful, said Ridley. Mia and I haven't been to a nightclub in ages together. Plus, I'd love to hear your cousin Kendall sing. She's incredible. By the way, if anyone is worried about drinking and driving, my driver can always drop you off at home instead and I'll arrange to have your vehicle delivered in the morning, Damien said. Thanks, Damien. We'll definitely keep that in mind. Ridley pulled out her cell phone and stood up. I'm going to call Adam and let him know that it's probably going to be a late night. I'll be right back. I groaned inwardly. Something told me that she was going to force me into staying until close, whether I wanted to or not. Actually, I think I should probably use the men's room before we go, said Michael, standing up. I'll be back. You might want to go, too. I'm sure the club will be packed and the lines long, said Damien. I sighed. Although I was intrigued with wanting to hear his cousin sing, nightclubs just weren't my thing anymore. Cheer up, said Damien in a low voice, staring at me. You're going to have a fun time tonight. I guarantee it. Was I that easy to read? I laughed nervously. Oh, I'm not worried. Thanks for inviting us, it's very kind of you. No problem, and to be honest, I wasn't really looking forward to going alone. I try and stay away from the club scene myself. I'm only doing it because of Kendall. I hear you. I'm not a big fan either, but I really am excited to hear your cousin sing. He smiled. Good. This will also give us some time to get to know each other a little better. There was something in his stare that made my stomach flutter. Was he coming on to me? Dismissing the ludicrous idea, I shrugged. Believe me, there isn't much to learn about my boring life. Not that I'm unhappy, I said quickly, noticing the sudden disapproval in his eyes. I'm just more of a homebody these days. He studied my face. That's unacceptable. 
You're a young, beautiful woman. You should be having the time of your life right now. I am. I mean, I smiled. I suppose it could always be better. In other words, you're bored, he said. I'm comfortable, I said, not wanting to admit that I wasn't exactly living the high life. Comfortable, huh? My grandfather always said that to live a complete and fulfilling life, you have to be willing to get out of your comfort zone. I didn't reply. He put his hand over mine. I think it's time for you to take that step. Tonight. 7. Damien. Mia pulled her hand away quickly, her cheeks turning red. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to embarrass you, I said, wondering what in the hell I'd been thinking anyway. Yeah, she was gorgeous, and there was no question that I wouldn't mind taking her home tonight. But after the mistake with my ex-wife, Marissa, I'd vowed to never mix business and pleasure again. In my early twenties, I'd hired Marissa as my interior decorator, and we'd hit it off right away. Love followed, as did marriage and our son Jake. Unfortunately, she changed dramatically over the next few years. She started partying hard, and then there'd been the one-night affairs. I'd even caught her cheating on me with one of my teammates, Pete White. Not only had it ended our marriage permanently, but my future in baseball. The night I confronted Pete, I injured my shoulder, destroying the only thing that really mattered to me besides my son, my pitching career. Even worse, Pete ended up recovering fully from a couple of broken ribs and recently moved into my old house with Marissa. My only consolation was that I was able to get full custody of Jake without a fight by agreeing to keep Pete's name out of the media. As much as I hated him, I'd started the fist fight and knew they'd use it against me in court anyway. My lawyer had advised me into agreeing to their demands, along with a healthy divorce settlement for Marissa. She walked away with the house and $10 million. In turn, I had my son, and she was only allowed monitored visits, at least until I agreed to give her more than that. It was a small price to pay, especially knowing that Jake would never have to walk in and see his mother snorting coke or in bed with the man who'd ruined his father's career. It's okay, she said, still looking flushed. It may sound weird, but I'm just not used to being touched. I had to bite my tongue from asking if she'd like me to help her get over it. Enough, I told myself, blaming it on the beer and the fact that I hadn't had been intimate with a woman for two months. Don't apologize. I should have warned you that I'm a toucher, I lied, feeling the tension in the air. It's just my way. You should have seen Michael when I grabbed his hand the first time. I chuckled. He looked at me like I was making a move. Relaxing, she smiled. I bet he almost wished you had been. Maybe, but he knows I'm into women only. Just then, Ridley made it back to the table. She sat down, an irritated look on her face. Did you get a hold of Adam? asked Mia. Yes. She sighed. He's actually jealous. Can you believe it? I suppose it's partly because we're hanging out with you, she replied, looking at me. He loves baseball. He can join us if he wants, I replied. The more the merrier, and I'd love to meet him. Oh, he would love that, but his friends are over. They're playing poker, she answered. He did ask if I could get your autograph. I laughed. Sure, if he really wants it. It's probably not worth anything these days. Nonsense, said Ridley. You're a legend. You may have retired, but you've had an impressive career, even I know that. Especially winning the World Series four years ago. That must have been so exciting. It was, I admitted, thinking back to that time. My life had been perfect. Marissa and I'd been happy. We'd had Jake. Winning the World Series had been icing on the cake. 
Ridley looked at Mia. You're very quiet. I think it's time to head out and get the party started before you change your mind. I'm not going to change my mind, she answered softly and then stood up. I should probably use the bathroom before we leave. Mia grabbed her purse. I'll be back. Ridley and I watched as she stepped away from the table. I could barely take my eyes off of her long legs. The woman was stunning in every way. So, said Ridley, turning to look at me. Are you dating anyone right now? Ridley no longer surprised me. I liked the fact that she was direct and to the point. That depends on what you mean by dating. As in seeing anyone seriously, she replied. No. What do you think of Mia? She's beautiful, I admitted. But... Not exactly what you're looking for, she said. I'm not looking for anything, to be honest. I somehow knew that you were going to say that. It's a pity, too, because you're obviously a good guy. Good guy. So I do have most women fooled, I joked. Apparently, she said, smiling. Anyway, I think I'm a pretty good judge of character, and I just thought that you and Mia. Well, you know. I chuckled. Don't get me wrong, any man would be lucky to have Mia, and I hope she finds herself a good one. I'm just not that guy. Too soon. No. I'm long over my divorce, I admitted. The truth is that I'm not looking to settle down, and I enjoy being a bachelor. Honestly, I couldn't offer a woman anything more than a one night stand. Right now, I think she'd even benefit from a quick roll in the hay, said Ridley dryly. She needs someone to bring her back. What do you mean, bring her back? Ridley explained that Mia had been screwed over by her ex and how she was still struggling with it. She's turned into a hermit, and I'm worried about her. I smiled. She did mention that she was a homebody. Ridley went on. I don't know. I guess I shouldn't be telling you all of this. It's just that I miss her laughter and that light that used to be in her eyes. I honestly think she's still in mourning. That jerk doesn't deserve her attention anymore, Ridley said angrily. It takes time, I said, now understanding Mia a little better. She and I actually had more in common than I'd thought. That's what she keeps saying but I don't see her getting any better. She needs some help, said Ridley. Right, but I don't know if she'd appreciate you trying to set up a booty call for her, though. Ridley laughed. What do you mean? That's what best friends are for. My friends had pretty much done the same thing for me, after Marissa and I split up. Introducing me to supermodels and actresses. For me, it had worked at least to a point, and shamelessly, I'd used one-night stands to self-medicate during my lowest time. But something told me that Mia needed much more, which really was the only thing I was capable of. Honestly, I'd like to help you out, but since we'll be working together, it can't happen anyway. I'm sure you understand. Help her out with what? asked Michael, sitting back down. Nothing, said Ridley, looking innocent. Oh. If I know my sister, she's up to something that could get one of us into trouble, he said with a half-smile. I'm sorry for leaving you alone with her. Ridley gave him a scalding look. Very funny. I chuckled. She means well and I do appreciate her tenacity, I said, as the waiter walked back toward us with the bill. Say that now, said Michael. Wait until the trip. You might want to toss her into the ocean. Just make sure you're deep enough out. She's a pretty good swimmer. Noted, I said, winking at Ridley. Ben set the bill down on the table, and I grabbed it before Michael could. He gave me a dirty look. You can pay next time, I told him. 
You said that last time. Did I? I replied, knowing that I had. I didn't mind paying. I enjoyed treating my friends. Can I get you anything else before you leave? The waiter asked. A muzzle, said Michael. For my sister. Something tells me her tongue is going to be the death of her in the next few days. Ridley slugged him in the shoulder playfully. You're so mean to me, she pouted as the waiter walked away, smiling. Now, now. You know I love you, Ridley. Even with that troublemaking mouth of yours, he answered, and then looked at me. I don't know how you do it. Women are such complicated creatures. Men are no nonsense and easy peasy. He's definitely no nonsense, joked Ridley, nodding toward me. Although, I have to admit that I respect you more because of it, Damien Stryker. Thank you. The feeling is mutual. She grinned. Michael rolled his eyes. I don't even want to know what you're talking about, do I? Probably not, I told him. Mia took that moment to return to the table. Staring at her again, I had to wonder what kind of fool would risk losing such beautiful woman for a one-night stand. 8. Mia You've got to be kidding me, muttered Ridley, staring over my shoulder as I took my first sip of the cocktail she'd handed me. We were at the club, in the VIP section, which thankfully was not as crowded as the rest of the place. The area by the bar, however, was busy, and Damien and Michael were still waiting for their drinks. Ridley, being Ridley, had gotten the bartender's attention the moment she'd approached. What's wrong? I asked loudly over the music as I took another sip of the fruity drink. It tasted like pineapple juice mixed with a hint of cherry. I licked my lips. Yum, this is so good. You can't even tell there's booze in it. You're going to need something much stronger when I tell you who's here, she said as I glanced toward Damien again. He discarded his jacket and tie in the limo and had rolled up his sleeves. I'd been surprised at how strong and muscular his arms appeared, especially for someone who'd injured his shoulder. What do you mean? Who's here? Looking me in the eye, she leaned closer and dropped the hammer. I just saw your ex. John. I stared at her in horror. What? Where? She grabbed a hold of my forearm before I could look for him. Don't you dare turn around. In fact, just pretend you're not even aware that the jerk is here, she ordered. Dang it. This is just my luck. I never get out, and now when I do, he shows up at the same place. I mean, what are the odds? She grunted. I know, right? I bit my lower lip. Is he alone? Do you really care? No. Yes. God, I don't know, I replied, hating myself for still feeling something toward him. With a look of disapproval, she glanced toward him again. He's definitely not alone. He has his arm around some trampy-looking Barbie doll. The thought of seeing John with another woman made me nauseous. I've got to get out of here, I said, my eyes darting toward the exit sign. Her smile fell. No way. You are not leaving. We both owe it to Damien to stick around. Just ignore him and try to have a good time. She was right. I knew it. Still, my heart was pounding in my chest at the thought of facing him. It had been several months since our last meeting, and it was obvious that he still had an enormous effect on me. Are you okay? asked Damien, walking toward us. Stopping, he stared down at me, concern in his blue eyes. You look upset. Me. Upset. No, I'm fine, I lied, forcing a smile. I just took a sip of my cocktail, and it went down the wrong hole. Can't take me anywhere, right? Damien didn't look like he totally believed me. 
Don't worry about Mia. She's fine, said Ridley, laughing nervously. It's just been so long since she's had a real cocktail that she's apparently forgotten how to use a straw. Exactly. So when is your cousin performing? I asked wide-eyed. He looked down at his watch. Any time, I guess. We should go and grab that table over there before someone else does, said Michael, now also standing next to us and holding a beer. It's overlooking the stage. We'll have a great view. Sounds good, said Damien, touching my elbow. He began leading me toward the table. Are you sure you're okay? he asked. Yes. I'm fine. Really? I replied with a reassuring smile as I sat down at the table. You had me worried there for a minute, he said, sitting next to me. The side of his leg touched mine, and it was as if a shock went through me. I nonchalantly moved my leg away. You're sweet but I'm fine. Good. I really want you to enjoy yourself tonight. Thank you. I am already. We all are, said Ridley sitting across from me. And that limo was gorgeous. Is it yours? It had been an unmarked black stretch limo stocked with champagne and other alcoholic beverages. No. To be honest, I only use them when I'm going out on the town and plan on drinking, which isn't very often. Normally I prefer driving myself. I imagine you have a lot of cars if you're visiting auctions, said Ridley. They are one of my many weaknesses, he admitted. But I collect mostly older model and classic cars that are hard to come by. I like to think of them as investments. That's what I tell myself anyway. How many do you own, she asked. If you don't mind me asking. Ten, he answered, taking a sip of his drink. Plus the two I drive frequently, which are my Beamer and Pickup. What kind of a BMW? she asked. It's a Series 7, he answered. Are they nice? she asked. I had my eye on a Series 6 convertible last year. Almost bought it but then things fell through. I enjoy it. I should, for the money. But to be honest, I enjoy my pickup even more. I guess I've always been more of a truck guy. I love trucks too, I told him. I own one myself. He looked surprised. You do? What kind? A Silverado regular cab. It's an older model but I love it, I told him. I'm impressed. I don't know why, but I pegged you as driving a little sporty car, he answered. I like them. I would just never own one myself, I replied, thinking about how safe my truck made me feel. High and off the ground. John, however, had loathed driving it. He was the one who preferred fast, expensive cars. Ones that got him noticed. The song ended, and another one began. I can't wait to hear Kendall sing. What's the name of her band? asked Michael, who was sitting next to Ridley. Before Damien could reply, Ridley pointed down toward the stage and said, Obviously it's called Final Call. I like that, said Michael, nodding in approval. Final Call. Which is how long I plan on staying and tell. Final Call, she replied with a little smile. Ridley winked at me. And you are too. We'll see, I answered, taking another sip of my drink. Ridley's face suddenly turned stormy. Her eyes met mine and she gave me a warning look. Before I could figure out exactly why, John was suddenly standing next to our table. Surprisingly, he was alone. Hey, you made it, said Damien, apparently knowing my ex. Ridley and I looked at each other in shock. Smiling, Damien held out his hand. Good to see you. John shook it. Good to see you too, Stryker. He looked at me. Hello, Mia. What a surprise. 
Hello, I said, noticing the longing in his eyes. It reminded me of the last time we'd spoken in person, when he'd once again begged me to forgive him. Trying to keep my hand from shaking, I lowered my eyes and began sipping my drink again. I could feel him still staring at me, and it made me even more uncomfortable. You two know each other? asked Damien. We do, he answered. Before John could elaborate, Ridley spoke up. Hello, John, she said icily. His smile was just as cool. Hello, Ridley. What a small world, said Damien. Apparently. John looked over at Michael. I didn't know you three knew Stryker here. He put his hand on his shoulder, as if staking claim on him. Interesting. And we didn't know that you knew him, Ridley replied. How do you guys know each other? He's my lawyer, said Damien. I could tell that Ridley was about to make a snide comment, and I kicked her under the table. She looked at me in surprise. I gave her a stern look. I didn't want her to start on him. I just wanted John to go away, and as quickly as possible. Where's your date? asked Ridley, not exactly ignoring my warning. Date? repeated John. Yeah. The blonde you were with a few minutes ago, she answered. I looked back up to see him answer. Oh, you must mean Tracy. She's in the bathroom, freshening up. And she's not my date, he said. She's my secretary. Just then, his secretary, who looked more like a porn star, was at his side, smiling widely at Damien. She had long platinum blonde hair and wore a gold shimmery dress that stopped just below her butt. It was obvious that if Tracy bent over, she'd be giving quite a show. And then there were her oversized implants that someone had bought and paid for. I wondered how long she'd been his secretary, and if he'd funded the project. Hello, Mr. Stryker, she said in a voice that sounded like Betty Boop. Thank you so much for inviting us tonight. And I've never been in the VIP area. She went on excitedly. I just can't wait to hear your wife sing. That would be my cousin, replied Damien, smiling at her in amusement. She's the one in the band. Tracy giggled. Oh. Sorry. That's right, your cousin. I can't wait to hear her sing. I've been looking forward to this all week. Stryker divorced his wife, said John, a pained expression on his face. That's why he came to us. Oh, now I remember. Lucky for you, right? He's free and clear, she said, giving me a conspiring wink. She slid her arm around John's waist and leaned into him. How long have you two been going out? Seeing her arms around my ex was bad enough, but then I suddenly recognized Tracy. She'd been the one in my bed. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks, and everything seemed to come back to me at once from that night. It was almost too much for me to handle. Trassa's smile fell as she stared at my face. Are you okay? she asked, looking genuinely concerned. I looked at John, hating him more than anything at that moment. It took every effort not to throw my drink at him. Mia, said Ridley, reaching for my hand. Honey. I took a deep breath and forced myself to smile. There was no way I'd show my real emotions. It wasn't worth it. I'm fine. She didn't look fine, said Tracy. I honestly thought she was going to pass out there for a minute. Ridley gave her a dirty look. I'm just tired, I said. I'm okay, though. Back to your question, we are actually on our third date, said Damien, putting his arm around me. Fortunately, she's not sick of me yet, and agreed to go out again. Date? Stunned, I didn't know what to say. But Ridley did, and wasted no time in supporting his story. Oh, Damien. I doubt she'd ever get sick of you. 
She looked at John. He is so sweet to Mia. In fact, he's bringing us both on a cruise very soon. I still can't believe he invited me to go along as well. That just shows what a kind and thoughtful guy he is. I looked over at Michael, who was quiet, but looking very amused. Really? John and I are taking a cruise in the winter. What cruise line are you going through? Tracy asked. We're actually taking my yacht, said Damien. Tracy stared at him, her mouth open. You have your own yacht? He does, and you should see it. The thing is massively huge, said Ridley, thoroughly enjoying herself. Just like his house. His limo. His truck. Hell, Mia, I bet there's nothing small about the man. If you know what I mean. By the way, what size shoe do you wear, Damien? I coughed. Leave it to my dirty-minded sister, said Michael dryly. I'm sorry, said Ridley, looking at me. I think we're embarrassing Mia. Mia? What about me, John and Michael? Joked Damien. Can't a man have any secrets? Oh, they most certainly can and do, said Ridley, smiling coldly at John. But they always come out in the end. I'm sure John would agree. 9. Damien. It hadn't taken me long to put two and two together, about John and Mia. He'd been the one who'd broken her heart, and now here he was, standing there with his ditzy secretary and lover. Seeing them together was obviously upsetting to Mia, which was why I decided to do what I did. Wrong or right, I didn't care. I just somehow knew that she was having a weak moment, and I hated seeing a beautiful woman like her feel unwanted. Yes, in my line of work, I see a lot of that, said John, glaring at Ridley. On both sides of the coin, however. I'm sure one side more than the other, she replied, her gaze unwavering. Probably. Anyway, he said tightly. I don't claim to be perfect myself. Hell, we all make mistakes and have to live with them. Yes, we do, said Ridley. Honey, we should go and find a place to sit, said Tracy, staring over the ledge and down below. I think the band is going to be starting any minute. Sure, he answered, his eyes moving back to Mia, who was desperately trying to ignore him. To be honest, it doesn't look like there are any decent seats left up here, I said, relieved that he'd have to go below. I'd invited him to the concert mainly because I wanted to thank him for his help during my divorce. I'd planned on paying his tab for the night as well. Now, I just wanted him as far away from Mia as possible. Every one of them appears to be taken. Sorry, John. It's okay, he answered, still staring at Mia like he wanted to pick her up and run off with her. I tightened my hold on her, feeling suddenly possessive. It was good seeing you, I said, noticing Mia stiffen up under my arm. You too, he replied. I raised my drink. Your tab is on me, by the way. Just give them my name when you order your cocktails. Thanks, said Tracy, emptying the rest of her glass. I could use a refill. It was nice meeting all of you. You too, said Ridley. I'm sorry. I didn't get your name. It's Tracy, she said smiling. Ridley looked from John to her. And you two are? I guess you could say that we're kind of dating, she replied. I mean, I work for him so we don't like to talk about it at the office. But none of you are employed by him, so I guess we're allowed to be open about it. Right, John? John looked like he wanted to shrivel up and die. I think we should get refills before the band starts playing. Yeah. Great idea, said Tracy. It was interesting meeting you, said Ridley. You too, she replied. Not noticing any animosity in the air, Tracy smiled and said her goodbyes again, before taking off toward the bar.
John looked at Mia. Mia, I'll call you. Why, she asked, looking at him coldly. He smiled. Just to catch up. You know, like old friends. Mia didn't say anything, although, something told me that if they'd been alone, she'd have told him off. The song playing in the club ended abruptly, and the crowd below began to clap and howl as Kendall and her band finally made the stage. Mia, said John. You really should go below and find a spot, Mia told him in a flat voice. Just like Damien said, there's absolutely nothing for you up here. Oh snap, said Ridley amused. John's eye twitched. Trying to keep his composure, he turned to me. Have a good one, Stryker. I grabbed Mia's hand and slid my fingers through hers. Thank you. I plan on it, I said with a meaningful grin. John's face turned red. He turned on his heel and stormed away. Michael chuckled. Now that's worth a few toasts if you ask me. Ridley held up her glass. I agree. That creep. I can't believe him. He's banging his secretary and yet, he's practically begging Mia to give him another chance? What an absolute tool. That's an insult to tools, I replied, removing my arm from Mia's shoulder. Anyway, that idiot doesn't deserve you. I hope you realize that. Oh, I do. Now more than ever, she said quietly. Here's to new beginnings, said Ridley, raising her glass. To new friends. And to new adventures. Cheers, we all replied, clinking our drinks together. 10. Mia. Kendall had an amazing voice and after Ridley and I finished our second round of drinks, she talked me into hitting the dance floor. Come with us, Ridley said loudly to both Damien and Michael. Sorry, I'm not much of a dancer, said Damien, who I noticed was still milking his second rum and coke. Nor am I plus, I really have to get going soon, hollered Michael. You do? I'll contact my driver, said Damien, pulling out his cell phone. Frowning, he stood up. I'll be right back. I need to find a quieter place. Michael, you're such a party pooper, exclaimed Ridley, swaying her hips to the music. Some of us have to work, he replied. You two get out there and have some fun. Yeah, let's do it. Ridley grabbed my hand and pulled me out of the chair. Feeling a little tipsy from the alcohol, I steadied myself, and then turned to Michael to give him a hug. It was nice seeing you again. You too, love. Have fun tonight. You deserve it more than anyone, he said. Thank you. I planted a kiss on his cheek. Say hello to Alex for me. I will. Ridley gave her brother a hug, and then we headed downstairs to the dance floor, which was very crowded. She pulled me through the swarm of people until we were close to the stage, and then we both started dancing. She's awesome, hollered Ridley as we stared at Damien's cousin on the stage. She was tall and beautiful, with long jet black hair and dark eyes. I hope we get to meet her afterward. Me too. I replied loudly, admiring her skin-tight purple leather outfit that reminded me of Catwoman. What a great singer. Kendall's voice was husky as she belted out the words to a song that I could almost relate to. It was a sexy ballad about leaving a man who'd done her wrong and how she was putting her life back together. The song hit so close to home that it brought tears to my eyes. Then, before I could make a fool out of myself by crying, it ended and another one began. Fortunately, this time she sang something upbeat and fun. Ridley, who was clearly enjoying herself, grabbed my hand and we began dancing together, catching the attention of two guys. Noticing their interest, Ridley smirked and danced sexier, as usual enjoying the effect she had on men. Eventually, the two sidled up closer and began moving to the music with us. Admittedly, I thought they were both good-looking, 
So when one of them wrapped his arms around my waist and began dancing with me, I didn't exactly protest. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed Ridley do the same thing until her partner tried kissing her. She pushed him away and began dancing on her own again. What's your name? asked the guy they first was with. Mia, I replied, aware that his hands were almost touching my butt. I'm Luke, he said, pulling me closer. You're a fantastic dancer. Thanks, I answered, smiling up at him goofily. I knew I was buzzed because when he ran his hand over my hips, I didn't stop him. What's up? Luke said suddenly, looking over my shoulder. I'm going to have to cut in, said a stern voice. I turned around and found Damien standing there. I smiled. Oh, hey. You changed your mind about dancing? It appears that way, he said, staring down Luke. My dance partner let go of me. So, is this your boyfriend? If I was, you'd be in some serious trouble, said Damien, grabbing my hand. Confused, Luke mumbled something and walked away. Damien relaxed and pulled me into his arms as a slow song began to play. I thought you didn't dance, I said, looking up at him. I don't, but I'm supposed to be your date, said Damien. Not the guy who had his hands all over you a second ago. I blushed. He didn't. The hell he didn't, said Damien, looking more amused than anything. That guy was irritating the hell out of me. I raised my eyebrow. He was? Yeah. Damien looked over my head. Speaking of idiots, John's watching us. I wish he'd just leave, I muttered. Me too. Something tells me he's not giving up on you anytime soon. I swore. Damien smirked. Such language. He brings it out in me. You know, I think we'd better remind him who you're here with tonight, he replied, pulling me so close that I could feel his breath on my neck. Why did you lie to him? I whispered, enjoying the way our bodies fit together. Remember how I thought we'd met before? Yes. I saw a picture of you on his desk a few months back, he replied, his lips brushing against my skin, giving me goosebumps. You must have a very good memory, I said breathlessly as he slowly kissed the side of my neck. I closed my eyes, enjoying the way it felt. It had been so long since anyone had touched me, and even though it was for show, I didn't want him to stop. Only when it comes to beauty, he said in a husky voice. 11. Damien. Mia stiffened up. I'm not trying to come on to you. I'm just stating a fact. I knew that what I'd said sounded like a line, but it was the truth. She was unforgettable. The first time I'd stepped into John's office, I'd noticed the young, beautiful woman in the photo right away. It just hadn't clicked until tonight. You've got to be the most beautiful woman in this club, I whispered, knowing that I shouldn't be flirting with her but unable to help myself. Mia was intriguing, and seeing her dance with another man had irritated the crap out of me. What am I supposed to say to that, she said, a smile in her voice. You don't have to say anything. Something caught my eye. I looked over and noticed John, dancing with his bimbo secretary. They moved closer to us. Looks like someone else was trying to move in on your date, said John, smirking. I can hardly blame him. She's the most beautiful woman in the club, I replied. John looked at Mia, and I knew he agreed. She looked up at me and smiled. He didn't have a chance, though. Not when I'm already with the best-looking guy in Florida. I knew she was saying it for John's benefit, but the game was fun. Knowing that a comment like that deserved a kiss, especially if we really were a couple, I played my part. Pulling her to me, 
I began kissing her. 12. Mia I don't know what surprised me more, the fact that he was kissing me, or the fact that he was so deliciously good at it, that I didn't want it to end. Just when I started really getting into it, however, Damien pulled away and began dancing me toward the other side of the stage, away from John. Sorry about that. He gave me a little smile. Thanks for not smacking me, by the way. No problem, I said, my head still spinning from the kiss. I probably took things a little too far, Damien looked over my head, but I really wanted to piss him off. Did we? His eyes met mine again. I imagined so. I was too busy to notice. Feeling a little awkward after what had just happened, I looked around the dance floor. Do you know where Ridley is? I asked him. I think she went upstairs again. Okay. I should probably check on her. Let's go, he said, grabbing my hand. He led me through the dance floor and back to the VIP section, where Ridley was seated. She had her phone out and was texting someone. Hey guys, she said, a funny smile on her face. Have fun dancing. We had more fun pissing off John, I said quickly. I'm sure you did, she replied. Can I get you a drink? asked Damien, looking at me. I think I could use one. Can you get me a water? I asked. Sure, he replied. Ridley. I'm good. Okay, he said, and then walked away. I sat down next to her. Let me guess, you saw us kissing? Saw you? I'm pretty sure the entire club noticed you two making out on the dance floor, she answered, looking amused. It was an act, I said. Obviously. Right. It was. Then you should get into acting, because you're very good. So is he. I glanced over toward the bar. Damien was already ordering. I admit it. He's better than good. Ridley laughed. Are you going to go home with him tonight? My head whipped around. What? No. Of course not. Why not? You both want each other. It's obvious. I knew I couldn't lie to Ridley. She knew me better than anyone. I was definitely attracted to the man. It doesn't matter. I'm not about to jeopardize our working relationship. Something tells me that if you sleep with him, you're going to secure it. Not jeopardize it. I'm not taking any chances, I murmured as Damien approached us. I hate to cut the evening short, but it looks like I need to leave, said Ridley, reading another text. I stared at her in shock. What? You're the one who said we were both staying until close. I know. Adam is being a buzzkill, though. He wants me home, she replied. Is he playing the jealous boyfriend again? I asked her. I knew Adam had gotten mad once about her attending a bachelorette party. They'd had a big argument about it. She'd ended up going, but he'd given her the silent treatment for a few days afterward. Yeah, said Ridley. Which is stupid especially since he's a big fan of yours, Damien. I think he's just angry that I didn't invite him before he planned his poker party. You certainly could have, said Damien. Hell, if he wants to join us now, I could send my driver to pick him up. Thank you for offering. Like I said, he had his poker buddies over, though. I didn't think he'd want to cut the game short. I guess I was wrong to assume anything about Adam, said Ridley dryly. Do you want me to talk to him? asked Damien. No. That's okay, replied Ridley. He's been drinking, and will probably be passed out by the time I get home. I'm sure he'll feel differently tomorrow. 
probably even foolish for getting jealous. Anyway, I should probably get going. I'll send a message to my driver, said Damien, typing on his phone. I'm sure he's back from dropping off Michael. Thank you, she said. I've had a lovely night. Thanks so much for inviting us. You're more than welcome. I was hoping you could stay and meet Kendall, he said. I know. I would have loved to. She has an amazing voice, said Ridley. She does, I agreed. You must be very proud of your cousin. I am. You'll stick around and meet her, won't you? He asked me. It was almost midnight. Actually, I should probably leave too, I replied. No. Stay, said Ridley quickly. You're having fun. I know, but... I'm really tired, I answered truthfully. The dinner. The cocktails. Running into John. And of course the steamy encounter on the dance floor. I was both physically and emotionally drained. Are you sure? asked Damien. I bet Kendall would like to meet the woman I was making out with on the dance floor. You should have seen the look she gave me from the stage. Blushing, I laughed. I could only imagine. Speaking of expressions, you should have seen John's face when you two were kissing. It was priceless, said Ridley. Damien smiled. I'm sure he regrets what he's lost. You're too good for the likes of him anyway. I smiled. I've been telling her that for months, said Ridley, as her cell phone began to vibrate again. Looking at it, she sighed. It's Adam again. Tell him you'll be on your way very soon, said Damien, looking down at his phone. My driver has informed me that he's just around the corner. Okay, she said, texting Adam. Damien turned to me. Are you sure you can't stay for just a little bit longer? I'll introduce you to Kendall, and then we can leave together. Leave together. That sounded like trouble. I hate to be rude, but I really can't. I'm just plain exhausted, I told him. You're not being rude and I totally understand, he said, still looking disappointed. Thank you for everything. It's certainly been an interesting night, I told him. Yes, it has, he replied with a little smile. Still looking at her phone, Ridley stood up. Are you ready, Mia? Yes. Damien got up. I'll walk you both out. Thanks, she answered. We made our way out of the VIP room and headed downstairs. Are you okay? I asked Ridley in a low voice, hating how her boyfriend had put such a damper on the night. She nodded and smiled. I'm fine. Adam is just being. Adam. Why is he so jealous? You've never given him cause to worry, I said. I know. It's frustrating. I can't seem to go anywhere lately without him questioning it, she replied. I had always liked her boyfriend, but this side of him was troubling. As we stepped out of the building, Damien's limo pulled up to the front door. The driver got out and started walking around toward us. It's okay, said Damien, motioning for him to get back inside. I've got this. The driver nodded and returned to the car. Ridley gave Damien a quick hug goodbye and then crawled into the vehicle. I'll call you when we have some ideas about the menu, she called out. Sounds good, he answered and then looked at me. Thanks for everything, I said, feeling suddenly anxious. Especially that thing with John. Damien smiled. Now that was my pleasure. I chuckled. Well, good night. I held out my hand. A handshake. Sorry, but I don't think that's going to fly, he said, looking past me. Especially with your ex in close proximity again.
He must have followed us out. Oh, I replied, lowering my hand quickly. Act two. Are you ready? Before his words sunk in, I was back in Damien's arms, and he was kissing me with an intensity that made me almost reconsider the rest of my night. Oh my, I said breathlessly after he released me. That act was even better than the first. Damien gave me a funny smile. I have a confession. What is that? John wasn't there. I stared at him in surprise. Mia! Called Ridley from inside of the limo. Are you going to keep making out with Damien, or are you going to get a move on? Good night, Mia, Damien said, still smiling. Good night, Damien. I said, and then crawled into the limo. He leaned down, wished us both good night again, and then shut the door. So what was that all about? She asked me as I settled in. I really don't know. Ridley smiled. Something tells me that next week is going to be very interesting. Especially for you. I doubt it. Tonight was not business. Next week is. Deny it all you want, but that man wants you. If Damien Stryker gets you alone on that big ship of his, you'll end up in his bed. I opened up my mouth to protest, but the thought gave me a secret thrill. Ridley smiled. You know it's true. I looked away. It wouldn't be right, I said, staring out the window as the limo pulled away from the curb. As much as I wanted the man, I knew it was still a bad idea. Right or wrong, who cares? You're both single and obviously attracted to each other. Then there's the fact that he's handsome and filthy rich. I don't care about that, I replied truthfully. John hadn't been rich, at least not compared to Damien, but he'd been well off and certainly handsome. He'd showered me with gifts and admittedly, it had been nice at the time. But as far as I was concerned, a good-looking man with boatloads of money was trouble. As attracted to Damien as I was, I wouldn't allow things to be taken further. Then at least care about hitting a home run with the guy. Would you stop already? I said, laughing. You have a one-track mind. Someone has to keep reminding you of what you're missing. I know what I'm missing. I answered, my smile fading. Believe me. It wasn't just that, either. It was the companionship. The laughter. The flirting. The dates. More than anything, however, it was the nights we'd spent cuddling on the sofa and watching movies together. John's cheating had felt more like a death to me. I'd lost all of him and part of me, and I didn't know if I'd ever be the same. One thing I did know was that having sex with Damien Stryker wasn't the answer. Even Michael had stated that he was now a womanizer. If anything, I'd just be another conquest to Damien, and once he had me, he'd move on. You know I only want what's best for you, said Ridley, her eyes softening. She moved next to me. I want to see you happy. I am happy, and I don't need a man for that especially when I have a friend like you. I love you, girl. Smiling, she held out her little finger. Let's make a pinky promise. I laughed. We hadn't made one since college, and back then we'd made plenty. I held mine out. Okay. She wrapped hers around mine. We'll always be there for each other. Through thick and thin. Always. And if we need each other, no matter the time or the place, we'll drop whatever we're doing so we can be the shoulder to cry on. Or, at the very least, the person to talk to on the other end of the phone. We'd already made that promise a long time ago, but it was a good reminder. Agreed. Ridley smiled and we squeezed our pinkies tightly together. To us. Screw that idiot John for what he did. Hell, screw Adam for being a jealous jerk. 
You will always come first. Friends before men's. I laughed. Friends before men's. We let go and hugged each other. Excuse me, said the limo driver, who'd rolled down the tinted glass separating us. I hate to interrupt, but where am I going? Ridley laughed. Sorry, she said, and then gave him her address. This was fun tonight, I admitted. Yeah, it was. We need to go out together more often. With or without guys. I aged. Ridley's cell phone began to vibrate. She looked down at it and sighed. Adam. I asked. Yes. You know, you can always crash at my place. As much as I'd like to right now, it would only make him angrier. I didn't realize that he had this bad of a temper, I said, worried again. He's all bark and no bite, she replied, reading the text he'd sent. Believe me, I don't have anything to fear from Adam. Just a headache. You're sure? She nodded and looked up at me from her phone. I know him, and he'd never hurt me. I remembered saying that about John once. I was about to tell her that, but then changed my mind. John and Adam were nothing alike. 13. Mia. My doorbell rang. Groaning, I opened my eyes and looked at the clock. It was 7.30 a.m. Damn it, I muttered as the doorbell rang again. I got out of bed, grabbed a robe, and hurried to the front door. When I opened it and saw Ridley standing there with a suitcase, I gasped. Hi, she said, trying to smile. Oh my God, did Adam hit you? I asked, staring at her face. Her left eye was black and blue and her lip was swollen. It had to hurt like hell. My own eyes filled with tears. She smiled weakly. You should see his face. That prick, I snapped, pulling her into my townhouse. Did you call the police? No, she replied, setting her suitcase down on the floor. I'm not going to. Why not? I asked, shocked. Like I said, you should see his face. I actually hit him first. I pulled her into my arms and hugged her. I'm sure he deserved it. You don't deserve this, though. What happened? My brave strong friend broke down. He accused me of sleeping with Damien and started calling me names. I slapped him and then he punched me in the face. Oh Ridley, I said, now crying with her. I'm so sorry this happened to you. I just can't believe he did this to me. I have never cheated on him or gave him reason to believe that I would. I suppose it was because he was drunk. Drunk or not, I said sternly, what he did was horrible and wrong. Don't make excuses for him. She nodded. I know. When did this happen? When I got home last night. Why didn't you call me right away? I was going to, but then he took my phone and started going through it, looking for who knows what. Anyway, I locked myself in the guest room and eventually we both fell asleep. How many times did he hit you? He punched me the one time and when I tried kicking him out, he slapped my face. I clenched my teeth. Where is he? Back at home. Probably still passed out in bed. She smiled grimly. He's going to be hurting. I also threw a paperweight at him. His cheekbone is going to be killing him today. Good. She let out a ragged sigh. What am I going to do? You're going to leave him, that's what you're going to do. He's never been violent before. I'm sure it was the alcohol. He's never been violent, but he's always been jealous, even without drinking. You can't stay with him, Ridley. Don't even think about it, I said firmly. I love him. 
I know you do. She didn't say anything else. Just stared at the wall, her thoughts miles away. Why don't you go and get some rest? You can stay in my guest room. Hell, you can move in with me permanently if you'd like. Thank you, she said, swiping at her tears. I'll go into the kitchen and get you some ice for your bruises. I looked at her eye. Are you sure you don't want to call the police? No. I just want everything to go away, she replied bitterly. I don't want to involve the cops. I touched her shoulder. That's fine, but remember, you don't owe Adam anything, and you certainly don't have to give him another chance, especially now that it's turned physical. I know. I started it, though. I groaned. You slapped him. It may have not been the right thing to do, but it didn't warrant a closed fist to the face. There's quite a difference, and he should have known better. I know. I sighed. You remember where the guest room is? I do, she said, picking up her suitcase. Thank you, Mia. Anytime. Remember, whenever you need me, I'm here for you. I love you, girl. Ridley blinked back more tears. I love you too. 14. Damien. For the next couple of days, I couldn't get Mia out of my head. Several times I thought about calling and asking her out, but then remembered the promise I'd made to myself about not mixing business with pleasure. Screw it, I said, grabbing my phone for the tenth time. Mia is nothing like my ex. Just as I was about to make the call, my cell began to ring. Striker, I said into the phone. Buddy, said a familiar voice. Long time no talk. How's it going? Ransom, I said, smiling. I didn't recognize the number. He sighed. I've had to change it again. More stalker fans hounding you? Just one psycho that is really irritating the crap out of me. Sorry to hear that, man. What's this person been doing? I'd rather not go into it right now. Taffy's around. Taffy, a.k.a. Tiffany, was his fiancé. Beautiful with a heart of gold and a stubbornness that matched his. How is she doing, by the way? I asked, picturing her long blonde hair and lovely smile. Great. She just completed her first album. Really? Good for her. I imagine it's incredible. Understatement. I wouldn't have thought her voice could get any better, but the singing lessons have raised everything up a notch. She totally blows my mind every time I hear her sing. It takes talent to know talent. Thanks, man. Ransom, the guy whose bachelor party we were celebrating, was a famous rock star and television sensation, thus all of the secrecy. We'd run into each other years ago at a Hollywood party and had become instant friends. He spent most of his time in California, but owned another house in the Keys. When I'd learned that he was getting married, I offered my yacht, and one of the best weekends of his life. He'd accepted, but with one condition. No prostitutes. What about strippers? I'd asked, knowing that some of his friends were already talking about hiring them. Strippers are fine. I can look but made a promise that I wouldn't touch. You can do what you want, though. What's wrong? Don't trust yourself around prostitutes? I'd ribbed. I trust myself, I just don't want them around. Besides, with my luck, the media would catch wind and tell everyone that I'm having an affair. Taffy doesn't need that kind of publicity. I hear you. One thing about Ransom was that he was passionate about protecting Tiffany. He'd even tried getting her thrown off of a national television singing contest once because he thought it would ruin her life. Fortunately, things worked out for the best, 
and Tiffany not only forgave Ransom, but agreed to marry the bullheaded watchdog. They were a great couple though, and had been engaged for the last year. If anyone could make a marriage work, it was those two. So we're all set for next week, I told him. You excited? Yeah, I've definitely been looking forward to it. When do we set sail? I'd like to leave Friday afternoon, but you can climb on board anytime you want. I'm going to be staying on the yacht for most of the week myself. So feel free to arrive early if you can. I'd also invited Mia and Ridley to board a couple days before we set sail, so they could familiarize themselves with the ship. That's what I'd told myself at least. Deep down, I knew the real reason was that I wanted to see more of Mia. I wish I could but I'm busy. I'll be there on Friday though, along with some of the guests, including my band members. They're excited about the trip. It should be a blast. For sure. I can't thank you enough. My pleasure. Anyway, I just wanted to check in with you quickly. I have to get off the phone now, he said, sounding amused. Taffy is waiting for me. She's giving me the evil eye. Then I'd better let you go. Give her my best. I will. See you next Friday. Looking forward to it. We both hung up. I stared down at my phone and then put it away. I decided to wait until next week to figure things out with Mia. The last thing I needed was for her to turn me down if I asked her out. Even worse, she might decide to cancel the catering job next week, then I'd be scrambling to find someone else. Patience wasn't always a strong point for me, but I knew that with a woman like Mia, I had to dig deep and find some. 15. Mia After the Adam episode, Ridley moved in with me and a couple days later, I drove her back to pick up more things while he was at work. She did speak to him several times on the phone, and just as expected, he begged for her forgiveness. He even tried talking her into returning home. I almost thought she was going to go back to him, until the green-eyed monster made another appearance. I've had it, she said, setting her purse down on the counter. He's being a jerk again about Damien. In fact, this time, he actually had the audacity to try and make me cancel our catering job. Ridley and Adam had met for lunch to try and work things out. I was almost relieved to hear that he was being difficult. I certainly didn't want her going back to him. Really? What did you say? Even I knew that wasn't an option, and if it was, I'd slap her silly. Especially after the way she hounded me about taking the job. I told him absolutely not, and that he needed psychiatric help for his jealousy problem. I relaxed. I bet he didn't like that. No, but I made sure he knew that there was no way I would take him back, unless he quit drinking and saw a therapist. Good for you. What was his response? She sighed. He told me that I was overreacting. You were overreacting. You? I know, right? She said, leaning back against the counter, looking suddenly very tired and miserable. I'm sorry, I said, moving next to her. What are you going to do? She grunted. What can I do? Stay here with me as long as you want, and in the meantime, don't let him coerce you back without meeting your demands, I said. Which, I know is going to be hard to do, considering you still love him. Ridley nodded. But you can't give in. I mean it, Ridley, I said. There was absolutely no reason for him to get jealous or violent. If he did it once, it will be easier for him to do it again. I know, she said softly. I grabbed her hand. As much as you love him, you'd be doing the both of you more harm than good if you take him back without him getting help. 
If he really really loves you, he'll give in. If he doesn't, then you're better off without him. Your future children will be better off without him. She let out a ragged sigh. I realize that. Let's just try and focus on next week. We'll be in Caribbean, on a luxurious yacht, having fun and making a ton of dough. Ridley smiled. It's kind of funny how our roles have reversed. The other day I was saying the same thing to you. I know. You made me see the light and just like you stated, it's going to change our lives. For the better. She nodded in agreement, but I knew Ridley was the one who was now second-guessing everything. I was still a little anxious about the catering job myself, but deep down, I knew that this was the best thing for her and me. She needed to get away from Adam to clear her head, and I needed to put John and the past behind me. 16. Mia Ridley and I kept ourselves busy, planning the meals, and ordering the supplies needed for the bachelor party. Damien was good on his word, and not only paid for all of it, but deposited twenty grand into our business account. I think that's it, she said, after getting off of the phone with the owner of a fresh seafood market. Everything is ordered, and now that we've arranged to have our supplies delivered directly to Damien's yacht, we can relax. For what seemed like the tenth time, I scanned the menus and the grocery listings to make sure we hadn't forgotten anything. As far as I could tell, we hadn't missed an item. I think you're right. The only thing left to do is pack. Speaking of which, she grinned. I think we should treat ourselves. Let's go shopping for some new clothing. Something we can wear when we're not stuck in the kitchen. As much as I would have liked to have gone on a shopping spree myself, I knew we had important bills to attend to first. Did you send a check to pay for the van? We're caught up. I also put aside money for taxes. In fact, she dug into her purse and then handed me a check. It was for just over $7,000. This includes what I said I'd help pay for rent. Wow, I said, staring at it with a smile on my face. I don't think I've ever received a check for anything this high before. I know, right? By the way, I spoke to Damien last night, and he hinted that the payment we've received doesn't include our tip. He'd give us that at the end of the cruise. I think you should be extra special to the man, considering he likes you. She smiled wickedly. Although, he might have another tip in mind for you. I rolled my eyes. She chuckled. Anyway, back to shopping. When was the last time you bought yourself a new bathing suit? It's been a while, I admitted, picturing my white bikini. I hadn't tried it on in over a year. She stood up and grabbed her purse. Let's deposit your check and get to it then. Knowing that shopping was something that gave her joy, and she truly needed it, I agreed. Three hours and five hundred dollars later, I had several new outfits, two bathing suits, and a new pair of flip-flops. I thought it was quite the haul, especially after watching Ridley spend twice the amount and had less to show for it. When I teased her about it, she blamed her extravagant spending on her mother. Why is it her fault? I asked dryly as we got into my vehicle. She was the one who introduced me to designer clothing. Anyway, Almost everything I purchased was a bargain, she said, holding up her bags. Maybe not by your standards, but by mine. If that's what you need to tell yourself, I teased. Her cell phone began to ring. Ridley frowned. It's him again. Adam. Yeah. He just won't give up, she replied, stuffing the phone back into her purse. I think you should throw your cell phone into the ocean as soon as we get on board the ship tomorrow. Believe me, the thought has already crossed my mind. We drove back to my place and then started packing. When we were finished, Ridley pulled out a bottle of champagne. 
When did you get that? I asked. I bought it yesterday. I wanted to have a toast before we set sail, she said, grabbing two wine glasses from the cupboard. Great idea. I think we both deserve it. Hell yeah we do. I opened the bottle and poured the champagne into our glasses. Ridley picked up hers and held it in the air. First of all, to Damien for giving us this fabulous opportunity. He could have gone with anyone else, but he's taking a chance on us and for that I'm grateful. Me too, I said. Also, let's not forget the man who's getting married. If not for him, we'd both be up shit creek right now. Cheers to the bachelor for getting married. May he and his bride live happily ever after, I said, clinking my glass against hers. We both took sips of the champagne. Oh wait. I have a personal toast that I'd like to make, I said, holding up my glass again. May this week be the start of a better life for both of us. Especially for my very best friend, whom I'd do anything in the world for. Ah, she said, smiling warmly at me. Thank you, Mia. I'm so lucky to have such a wonderful friend like you. Me too. I don't know what I'd do without you. Her eyes started misting up. Okay, I haven't even taken my third sip, and I'm already getting emotional. I hope I'm not getting my period soon. I will be so pissed off if I can't go swimming. I chuckled. Yeah. The last thing we need is for you to start drawing all of the sharks in the area. We'll have enough to deal with on the ship as it is. Exactly, she said right as the doorbell rang. We looked at each other. Are you expecting anyone? she asked. It was after eight, and I certainly wasn't. No, I replied, setting my glass down. Maybe it's Adam? I hope not. If it is, tell him that I'm not here right now. Okay. I walked out of the kitchen and answered the door. Fortunately, it was Michael. Oh good. It's just you, I said, standing back so that he could come in. You really make a guy feel special, he said in amusement. I'm sorry. I just thought that you were Adam. His smile fell. Has he been bothering her? He wants to get back with her, but refuses to see a therapist. Thankfully, she won't let him back into her life unless he does, I said in a low voice. Michael looked relieved. I'm glad she's sticking to her guns. Me too. Ridley. I called loudly. It's your brother. She stepped into the living room and gave him a funny smile. Okay, what are you doing here? I was in the neighborhood and wanted to check up on you, he replied. Is that so shocking? A little, she said, giving him a curious look. You must be getting soft in your old age. I must be because I can't seem to stop worrying about you, he said, opening up his briefcase. He pulled out small brown bag. What's in there? asked Ridley. Booze? He chuckled. No. I was thinking that after what happened with Adam, I think it might be a good idea for you to be carrying this around, he said, pulling out a canister of pepper spray. Just in case. She took it from him. I don't think I need to worry about Adam. He was inebriated when he hit me, and I'm not going to be around him when he's drinking anymore. It's not just Adam I'm worried about, he replied, reaching into the bag again. He pulled out another canister of pepper spray, and this time handed it to me. You two are young and beautiful, and should have some kind of protection. I know neither of you own handguns or take karate, so this should be better than nothing. Thanks, I replied, reading the directions. It looks easy enough to use. It is. I've started carrying one with me when I walk our dog, Marty, said Michael. 
The two pit bulls in our neighborhood see him as a chew toy. One of them got loose once and I used the stuff. Now that dog doesn't even look at us when we walk by his house. Marty was his toy poodle. I guess it's a good idea, she said. Although we don't own a dog or walk late at night. Maybe not, but you can bring it with you on the ship. I'm not sure who Damien's inviting, but if there's going to be a lot of drinking, I don't want you too vulnerable, he said. Ah. Now I get it. Is there something that you aren't telling us? Ridley asked. He frowned. What do you mean? Did he invite a bunch of Hellraisers? Ridley asked. Honestly, I still don't know who's been invited. All I know is that you're going to be stuck in the middle of the ocean with a group of men, and I want you safe. I appreciate your concern. I'll definitely bring mine, I said. And Ridley will have hers too. I'll make sure of it. He crumpled up the paper bag. Good. She looked at me. I guess they'll come in handy if the boat gets overtaken by pirates. If that happens, pepper spray isn't going to save us, I said dryly. If you get hijacked by pirates, said Michael, nothing is going to help you unless you're a strong swimmer and aren't afraid of sharks. Mia can't swim and I'm pretty sure we're both afraid of sharks, she replied. He looked at me. You live in Florida and you can't swim? I can a little, I said defensively. Dog paddle, that is. It doesn't matter, said Ridley. We don't have to worry about pirates. We don't have to worry about anything other than cooking, sunscreen, and having fun. Right, Mia? Yes. And staying out of Damien's bed, I mused inwardly. Although, the more I thought of it, the less I wanted to avoid it. 17. Mia. Later that evening, my phone rang. When I noticed who it was, I almost didn't answer it. But then curiosity got the best of me. Hello, John, I said into the phone coolly. What a surprise. Hello, Mia, he said softly. What's up? I asked, wanting him to get to the point. He sighed. I thought we could talk. There's not really anything to talk about. John was silent for a few seconds, and then asked me if it was true that I was going to be on Damien's yacht over the weekend. Yes. I heard from someone that he's having a bachelor party, and you and Ridley are catering it? We are, I admitted. It's a very bad idea. What do you mean by that? Look, don't say anything to Damien, but I've heard about the parties on his yacht. And what is it that you've heard? I asked dryly. They're crazy. Everyone gets high and rip-roaring drunk. Damien has the money to supply anything his guests want, and he gladly does it. I rolled my eyes. It sounded like a load of crap to me. John was obviously jealous. Forgive me if I don't believe you. I guess I didn't expect you to. Are you two really seeing each other? Yes, I lied. Mia, as much as I hate the thought of you seeing another man, I really do want what's best for you. I didn't say anything. I know that you and I will never get back together. And after what I did, I don't deserve a second chance. I know that now. But Damien Stryker is not the man you think he is. He certainly hadn't been, either. And what kind of man is that? I am not supposed to be sharing information like this, especially being his attorney, but I owe you this at the very least. I wasn't sure where he was going, but I was definitely intrigued. What are you talking about? John lowered his voice. 
His ex-wife left the marriage because of his excessive drinking and partying. Not to mention she was scared shitless of him. I heard it was the other way around, I said, wondering why she'd be frightened of him. That's because he gave her a big settlement and a warning to keep her mouth shut. He's a dangerous man and hangs out with some very bad people. Ones who would go after her if she said anything. But he has custody of their son, I replied, having a hard time believing John's story. Yes. That was part of the deal. The judge was paid off as well. I didn't say anything. Mia. You're lying, I said flatly. I wish I was. But I'm not as good of a liar as he is. Obviously, he already has you wrapped around his finger. This story of yours is insane. No. He's insane. Let me tell you something else. You must have heard that he's not pitching anymore, right? Yes. I bet you didn't hear how he hurt his shoulder. No, I admitted. He became drunk one night and damaged his entire career in a car accident. Of course, they kept it out of the news. But it happened. Believe me. I frowned. Mia, the man is out of control, and I noticed he was drinking again at the club. Alcohol and striker are a very bad combination. As much as I wanted to believe that John was lying, I was starting to have my doubts. Did you help him take his son away from his mother? I did what he paid me to do, and to tell you the truth, I was afraid not to. Now I was starting to get a little nervous. His story was compelling. John, I swear to God if you're lying to me. I'm not. As much as you hate me, Mia, I still care about you and don't want to see you get hurt. Why should I believe you? I know you don't have any reason to, but if you go on this trip, something tells me that you're going to regret it for the rest of your life. My mind was reeling. I really didn't know what to believe. I bet you have no idea of who all is going to be boarding the ship. Do you? He asked. Celebrities. Famous people. More likely infamous people. He hangs around criminals, Mia. Very rich ones who you don't want to cross paths with. Have you ever heard of Thomas Gumbini? No, I replied. He's mafia and a close associate of Damien's. My eyes widened. Mafia. They're still around. Oh hell yes. Look, I can't say anything more other than that you need to cut ties with Damien immediately. Both personal and business. I don't see how I can. Mia, you're making a mistake, he said, sounding frustrated. If what you're saying is true, I'd rather not have any dealings with him. But right now we have no choice. I then told him, that we'd already spent much of the money Damien had given us. He sighed heavily. How were we supposed to know? I asked defensively. You wouldn't have known. In fact, nobody knows about his private dealings except for those closest to him. And me, his lawyer. Shit, my other phone is ringing and I have to take this call. Mia? I don't know what else I can say to convince you not to board that ship this weekend. As I said before, I don't think we have any other choice. Just, promise me that you'll try to get out of it and whatever you do, don't tell anyone that I told you this. Not even Ridley. If Stryker ever found out, he'd probably send someone to kill me. No joke. My eyes widened in horror. What? Like I said, he's dangerous, and I know more than anyone that he will do anything to keep his private dealings private. After hanging up with John, I contemplated about keeping our conversation a secret, but knew there was no way that I could hold it from Ridley. 
If what he said was true, then it was possible we'd be at sea with some very seedy characters. I'm sorry, but that's got to be the stupidest thing I've ever heard, she said, staring at me in disbelief. I thought that at first, too, but John was very serious about the matter. Think about it, John is jealous of Damien. He's making all of this up. Look, I'll call my brother and ask him if any of this is true, she said, grabbing her phone. He said not to tell anyone, I replied quickly. Michael won't say anything if I ask him not to. I sighed. Okay. Ridley called him, and he agreed with her that John was making all of it up. I have never known Damien to be associated with criminals, he told me over the phone. And think of it this way, if he was involved with them, the media would have gotten wind of it a long time ago. That made sense. I sighed in relief. I imagined so. John just sounded so convincing, I told him. He's the one you need to watch out for, replied Michael. Ignore him and change your phone number. Good advice, I replied, wishing that John would just fall off the face of the earth. He was definitely not the man I thought I'd fallen in love with. Thankfully, he was out of my life, and I vowed to avoid him in the future at all costs. 18. Mia The following day, Damien sent his limo to pick us up and deliver us to his yacht. My God, said Ridley under her breath, as we headed down the dock toward the massive luxury boat. I can't even imagine the amount of the check used to pay for that thing. It's beautiful, I replied, stunned at the sheer size of the vessel. It had to be well over 300 feet long. Michael said it was one of the top 20 largest yachts in the world, said Ridley. I think he said it was around 120 meters and could hold up to 50 guests. That's not even including the crew. Isn't that insane? Yes. It's crazy. The driver, who was helping us with our bags, spoke up. They featured this ship on television about a year ago. It's definitely one of the largest yachts in the world. There's even a helipad on it. Yes, but is there a pool? asked Ridley. That's all I really need to know. There's both a pool and a spa, he replied. As we drew closer, I noticed Damien standing on board and watching us. He waved and we waved back. And you tried talking us out of this, murmured Ridley. Not just me. John. And Adam, too, I reminded her. She snorted. Another reason to leave them both in the past. I nodded. I swear if you don't snatch this guy up you're crazy, she whispered. Look at the way he's looking at you. My cheeks burned. Damien was indeed staring at me rather intently, but it didn't mean he was available to be snatched up. Stop. She laughed. Damien's crew took our bags and then helped us board the yacht. Welcome, ladies, he said, walking toward us. Unlike the other night, he was dressed very casually in cargo shorts and a light blue tank top that not only showed off his tan, but broad shoulders and sinewy biceps. Thank you for having us, I replied, my stomach full of butterflies. Damien, your boat is beyond words. It's simply gorgeous, said Ridley. Thank you, he answered, removing his sunglasses. I'll give you a tour after my staff shows you to your rooms. I need to make a few calls and then I'll come find you. Sounds great, I replied. Follow me, ladies, said Marshall, one of the crew members who'd met us on the dock. I'll show you where your cabins are. Lead the way, Ridley said. See you soon, said Damien before heading in the opposite direction. We followed Marshall to our rooms, which were across from each other. When I stepped inside my cabin, which was decorated in light beige and pale blue colors, I was instantly captivated by how elegant it was. 
From the beautifully handcrafted woodwork to the cream-colored plush carpeting, it was obviously more luxurious than some of the nicest five-star hotel rooms. Wow, I said, looking around. This is gorgeous. Where would you like me to set your bags? Asked one of the other crew members, Aaron. Anywhere is fine, thank you, I replied, still looking around in awe. The cabin had a mini bar, a large television, a walk-in closet, and a plush chaise lounge. Then there was the king-sized bed, which faced a large set of windows overlooking the ocean. So what do you think? asked Marshall, stepping into the room. It's wonderful, I told him. Good. Damien will be happy to hear that it has met your approval. By the way, the bathroom is stocked with towels, soap, shampoo, almost everything you might need, in case you've left something at home. But if there's something we've missed, don't hesitate to ask. I can't imagine needing anything more than this, I said, smiling at him. Thank you. No problem. Damien has very good taste, he said, glancing around the cabin. And just so you know, yours and Ms. Blake's are the nicest cabins on board, besides the master suite, of course. That was nice of him, I said as Ridley walked in. It sure was. She looked at Marshall. By the way, call me Ridley. We're all working for Damien. I think we can forego the formalities. Marshall grinned. No problem. And feel free to call me whatever you want. Hell, everyone else does, he joked and then winked at Ridley. Or whenever you want. I bit back a smile. Ridley smirked. Thanks. We'll keep that in mind. I'm really looking forward to tasting your cooking, Marshall said, walking toward the doorway. He looked back. I have a feeling it's going to be the best we've had on the ship so far. No pressure there, I said, chuckling. Has he hired a lot of chefs, she asked. There was one he was using quite frequently, he answered, turning around. He ended up firing her. Ridley's eyebrows shot up. Why? He took a few seconds to answer. Rumor has it that she stole from the ship. Wow. Did he have her arrested? I asked. Damien was going to press charges, but she overdosed on drugs, a week after he fired her. Ridley and I stared at him in shock. He went on. We found out later that she was heavily into narcotics. We had no idea. That's horrible, I said. Did she commit suicide, or was it by accident? I don't know, he said. I believe it was an accident, but who's to say? Marshall lowered his voice again. We think she was stealing from the ship to pay for her drug habit. She was paid very well, but apparently not enough. I can't believe we didn't see anything about it on the news, said Ridley. I guess overdoses aren't newsworthy, he answered. Anyway, enough about that. Damien should be arriving soon to show you around the ship. Thanks, Marshall, said Ridley. Yes. Thank you, I said. You're welcome and remember, I'm just a phone call away if you need anything, he said his eyes resting on Ridley again. Okay, she said. When he was gone, I started giving her crap about him just to pay her back about Damien. Wow, he really likes you. Did you hear him? I lowered my voice. Call me whenever you want. Talk about straightforward. Kind of sounds familiar. She chuckled. Maybe so but I can't even think about another man right now. I don't know what I'm going to do about Adam. I still have feelings for him. I can't just turn them off. I'm going to give you the same advice you've been giving me. Forget about the jerk. If he's not willing to change, then he's definitely not worth your time. At least forget him while we're here. I don't think that will be too difficult, she said admiring the view of the ocean from my room. 
How's your room? I asked. The same, basically. Come on. I'll show you. I followed Ridley into her cabin, and it was just as extravagant. We both had all the amenities imaginable, including a bidet and whirlpool tub in the bathroom. Have you ever used one of these? She asked, examining the bidet. No. They scare me, I joked. She chuckled. Oh my god, this one has its own air dryer. Wow. Even your lady parts get pampered on this ship, I said, smirking. We walked out of the bathroom, making jokes about the bidet, when someone began knocking on the door. It was Damien. So what do you think, he asked us, grinning. I think you're going to have a hard time getting us to leave when this trip is over, Ridley said. The rooms are stunning. I'm glad you approve. Wait until you see the rest of the ship, he replied. We're excited to see it, I said, as we stepped out of the cabin. How long have you owned the yacht? A little less than two years, he answered. Did you buy it new? Ridley asked. No. It's only six years old, though, Damien said. Has your son been on it much? I asked. Several times. He actually prefers our fishing boat, replied Damien, which is much smaller, and usually it's just the two of us on it. Oh, how sweet. Do you take your son fishing quite a bit? asked Ridley. As much as I can. It's been about a month since we've last gone, he replied. I plan on remedying that very soon, though. Where is he right now? I asked. At home. Kendall is staying with him, as is his nanny, Alice, he replied. Your cousin. The singer? Ridley replied. Yes. She is staying there over the weekend, and then on Monday, she's going to join us on the ship. After the guys are gone, of course, he replied. Oh, cool. Then we get to meet both of them, I said, smiling. Yes. It should be a good time. Like I said, you're both welcome to stay with us next week, too. I hope you're planning on it, he said over his shoulder as we left the cabin. We are, as long as it's not a bother, I replied. Heck no, he answered. And you don't have to cook, unless you feel compelled to. I figured next week we'll just mostly grill and take turns with the meals. You can cook, asked Ridley, smiling. He grinned. Don't get your hopes up too high. Yes, I can grill a mean steak, and I'm pretty good at flipping patties. That's about the extent of my culinary skills, however. We both laughed. Don't worry. Mia and I will take care of most of the cooking next week. It's the least we can do after everything you've done for us, replied Ridley. Don't feel obligated, he said. I really want you to enjoy yourselves. Then allow us to cook, I answered. Because, honestly, the kitchen is where I enjoy myself the most. 19. Damien I gave them a tour of the yacht, starting at the main salon, which was where most of the guests usually hung out in the evening. There were several sofas, including two sectionals, a grand piano, a fully stocked bar and three recently added poker tables. This is beautiful, said Mia, running her hand over the mahogany entertainment center. Thank you, I said, thinking the same thing about her. She had on a white and blue sundress, which showed off her slender figure and long legs. You seem to have very good taste, said Ridley, staring at me with a smirk. She nodded toward Mia, who wasn't paying attention. So she'd caught me checking out Mia. I smiled. You're very observant. Yes, I am, she replied. I chuckled. What was that? asked Mia, turning around. We were talking about the piano, Ridley said, touching the keys. 
I told him he had very good taste. Do you play, Damien? asked Mia. A little, I replied. Please. Play something for us, said Ridley. Yes, please. We'd love it. Play whatever you want, said Mia, her face brightening. Okay. It's been a while, but I'll give it a shot. I sat down and began playing one of my favorite pieces, Moonlight Sonata by Beethoven. 20. Mia. I didn't recognize the song, but was totally enthralled as he played it for us. It was such a beautifully haunting piece, it took my breath away. Ridley and I looked at each. Wow, she mouthed. I nodded. He definitely played more than a little. We watched in stunned silence as his fingers danced over the keys like it was second nature. He played with such passion and skill that it literally gave me the chills. After a few minutes, Damien stopped. Sorry, he said, turning to us with a crooked smile. I sometimes get a little caught up in that song. I cleared my throat. It was beautiful. I could listen to you play for hours. Thank you, he said softly. I used to play it for hours. I suppose that's why it all came back to me so easily. It gave me goosebumps, said Ridley, holding out her arm. It's obvious that besides being a great baseball player, you're musically talented. It must run in the family. That's very kind of you. To be honest, I'm better at playing other people's music. Unlike my cousin who creates her own, he said. Have you ever tried writing anything? I asked. Once, when I was first learning to play the piano, he admitted. Unfortunately, I don't know what happened to it. How old were you when you started playing? asked Ridley. Six. My grandfather used to play, and I wanted to be like him. He started giving me lessons, and then eventually, they hired a piano teacher for me, he said. I always wanted to learn how to play, I said. You should take lessons, he suggested. I laughed. No. I'm too old. His eyes widened. Too old. Nonsense. Anyone can learn how to play. You just have to have patience and a willingness to keep practicing. He's right. My mother learned how to play when she was 30, said Ridley. I don't have a piano, I said. And I'm certainly not going to buy one just to take lessons. You just need a keyboard, he said. Look, if you'd like. I can give you a few lessons while you're on the ship. I laughed nervously. Thank you. That's very kind, but you don't have to. It's not a problem at all, he said quickly. I can show you some basic things, and then you can decide if it's something you want to pursue on your own. You should do it, said Ridley. You know you want to. She was right. After listening to him play, it had brought back memories of when I was younger, and had begged my mother to let me take piano lessons. Unfortunately, back then she didn't have the extra money and so it never happened. I smiled. Okay. If you're up for it and don't mind. Of course I don't mind. We can start later this evening after dinner if you'd like, he said. Just a quick half-hour lesson. Sounds good, I replied, looking forward to it. I knew I'd probably never be as good as Damien, but the thought of being able to play a few simple songs was thrilling. Great. He stood up. In the meantime, let me show you the rest of the ship before the sun goes down. Afterward, you can relax at the pool before dinner if you'd like. Sounds wonderful. Count me in, said Ridley perking up. For the next hour, Damien showed us much more of the yacht, and both of us were thoroughly impressed. Not only did it have a theater and game room, but there was a gym, a sauna, and of course the pool. 
I could get used to this, said Ridley, taking her shoe off. She dipped her toes into the water. You'll know where to find me when I'm not in the kitchen. Do you swim much? I asked Damien. A little. Mostly to cool down, he replied. When I was in high school, I joined the swim team for a couple of years. I eventually had to quit because it interfered with baseball. That's too bad, I replied. He shrugged. Hey, to be honest, I'd rather relax in the water these days anyway. Maybe Damien would like to give you swimming lessons too, said Ridley with a smirk. He looked at me. Of course. I think one type of lesson will be enough, I said, giving her a warning look. I'd hate to monopolize all of Damien's time. Believe me, there will be plenty of time next week, he said, a twinkle in his eyes. So, if you'd like lessons on anything that I'm familiar with, just ask. That's very kind of you, I said. As I said, I think the piano lesson will be quite enough. Feel free to change your mind, he replied. I'm sure I'll be out here anyway once Jake arrives. He loves to swim. I bet he's a little fish, said Ridley. He loves the water, said Damien, smiling. I have a hard time getting him to leave the pool at home. Ridley and I can't wait to meet him, I said. Jake is a good kid. He's a little confused right now, with everything going on. But I'm hoping that with me not traveling so much, he'll come around. I'm sure he will, said Ridley, putting her shoe back on. It's just going to take a little time. Divorce can be hard on a kid, I said, thinking back to my parents again. But it's still better than living with people who are miserable and always fighting. He nodded. We certainly did enough of that. I survived. Jake will too, I said. Your parents divorced, he asked. Yes. I told him about my parents and their struggles. I understood that it was for the better, even though it took some time getting used to. I never stopped loving either of them, though. Damien smiled. It's too bad. I'm sure your father might have even still loved your mother. Alcoholism is a horrible disease. I've also seen what it does to people. I thought about John's warning, but brushed it aside. I'd lived with an alcoholic, and Damien didn't strike me as one. I'm sure he did too. Unfortunately, there was a long line of alcoholics on my dad's side of the family. Every last one of them were in denial. That's unfortunate, he said. What about you? Do you have any addictions? None that I'm aware of, I said, and then smiled. Maybe food. His eyes lowered. It doesn't seem to be hurting you. I chuckled. That's because I jog most mornings. Sorry, no places to jog on the ship. Just the treadmills, he said. That works too, I replied. Speaking of food, I should probably show you the galley next. Good idea, said Ridley, who'd been listening silently. We've had some of your orders delivered already. If there's anything else you think you'll need, let me know. I think we'll be good, I replied. We're setting sail pretty late tomorrow. So, if you do notice something missing, we should be able to remedy the situation, he said. I know we're supposed to be receiving a final delivery tomorrow said Ridley. The meat market promised to have our shipment here by 10 a.m. Damien nodded. Okay. I'll have my crew watch for them. In the meantime, we should probably verify everything that's been received so far, I said to Ridley. Definitely. She looked at him and smiled. And then afterward, I'm going for a swim. Good idea. You'll probably want to use it as much as you can before the guests arrive. Once they're here, 
I'd recommend that you avoid it until they're gone, said Damien. I understand. We'll be on the clock anyway, said Ridley. That's not it, he replied. He doesn't want us mingling with the guests, I thought. As if reading my mind, he told us that he thought it would just be safer, since we were the only two females on board. To be honest, I don't know much about these guests, other than they're friends with the guy getting married. I trust him. I just don't entirely trust his buddies. Your safety is my utmost concern. We appreciate it, said Ridley, smiling at him. He shrugged. I made a promise to you, and I intend to keep it. Thank you, I said, warming up to him more and more. He really was a thoughtful guy. Now that we're on the ship, can you at least tell us who's getting married? asked Ridley. You just can't stand the suspense, can you? Damien said with a wry smile. No. I can't, she admitted. He snorted. Fine. I imagine you've heard of Ransom. Ridley's eyes looked like they were about to pop out of her face. The singer? Yes. It's his bachelor party, said Damien. Oh my god, she squealed. We actually get to meet him. Not if you're going to act like that. I'll lock you in the galley if you freak out around him, I said, amused. She looked at me like I was an idiot. You do know who he is? Yes. Of course, I replied. Everyone had heard of Ransom, the famous bad boy singer. He'd been discovered on American Icon, a popular reality show, a few years ago. I didn't keep tabs on celebrities or read the tabloids, however, so I had no idea that he'd been dating anyone special, let alone getting married. Don't worry, said Damien. I had the same reaction myself when I found out. I even found myself shopping for bras just so I could throw one at him when I saw him in concert. He raised his voice. He's so dreamy. Ridley and I laughed. Talking about me behind my back again, said an amused voice. We all turned around to find Marshall standing there with a wide grin. We were talking dreamy, not dweeby, said Damien. Marshall put his hand on his heart. I'm deeply offended. Good. Paybacks are a bitch. Now what's up? asked Damien, becoming serious again. Ridley and I stole a glance at each other. It was obvious Damien and Marshall had a unique kind of employer-employee relationship. I believe this is yours, he said, holding out a cell phone. Damien appeared relieved. Thank you. I was wondering where I'd left it. Where'd you find it? The bridge. Jeff actually found it, he replied, handing it to him. Who's Jeff? The captain, asked Ridley. No, he's the officer on watch. Charles Phelan is the captain. He won't be arriving until tomorrow, said Damien, scrolling through his phone. So, how do you like the ship so far? Marshall asked. It's beautiful, said Ridley. And huge. Yes. Neither of us can get over the size, I said. Marshall smirked. Well, you know what they say about guys who feel the need to compensate for what they lack in. The only thing I'm lacking in is good help, said Damien. By the way, didn't I fire you last week? I believe it was the week before, Marshall replied with a satisfied grin. That's what I thought. He's like a bad penny that keeps showing back up, muttered Damien, looking up. I just can't seem to get rid of him. I bring you luck, though, said Marshall. If it wasn't for me, you wouldn't have met these two. Ridley and I looked at each other in surprise. We were at this party in Hollywood, or was it Beverly Hills? I can't remember, explained Marshall. Damien didn't want to go, but I insisted. 
True. Good thing I did. That's how we met Michael, said Damien as his phone began to vibrate. I don't know how he does it, but Michael always manages to rub elbows with some pretty famous people, said Ridley. He's charismatic, I said. People are drawn to him. Yes, and he knows a little about everything, so he's interesting to talk to. By the way, it appears that I have to step away and make a phone call, said Damien, frowning down at his cell. He looked up. Marshall, could you please show them the galley, and if I don't catch up with you, the bridge as well? I have a feeling I'm going to be tied up for a while. My pleasure, said Marshall. Sorry to keep getting pulled away. This time it's my ex, said Damien. She's in an uproar about something. Good luck with that, said Marshall. Just be thankful you don't have to deal with her on a daily basis anymore. Believe me, I thank my lucky stars every day. Anyway, I'll catch up with you in a little while. I apologize. No apology needed, I said. We totally understand, added Ridley. Thank you, he replied. So, how long have you worked for Damien, asked Ridley after Damien left. Long enough to know that he's going to be on the phone for a very long time, he said. So you're stuck with me for a while. There are worse things to be stuck with, said Ridley, smiling. His lip twitched. Thank you. I think. 21. Damien. What's up? I asked Marissa, after dialing her back. Why haven't you been answering me, she shrieked. As usual, she was freaking out. Calm down. Don't tell me what to do. I rolled my eyes. What's the problem? Is Jake with you? No. He's at home. Why? I'd like to see him this weekend, she replied. I promised I'd take him to Disney World. I frowned. You can do that next weekend. When you're actually scheduled to visit with him. What's the big deal? You're not going to be home anyway. You're hosting that bachelor party or something, aren't you? How do you know about that? You probably mentioned it. Or maybe it was Jake. I don't know. That's not the point, though. I'm his mother, and I'd like to see him this weekend. It's funny how when you had the opportunity to see him, at your convenience, you were always too busy. Especially on the weekends, I said dryly. I wouldn't talk. You were never around, either. I gritted my teeth. I was working. Not off-season, she snapped. Bull. I was there. You weren't. At least not mentally. She's starting going off on me. I tried to keep my cool, but she never made it easy. Look, I'm not going to fight with you and I'm sorry, but Jake is busy this weekend. Doing what? My cousin is visiting from California. They're spending the weekend together. Jake loved Kendall and she was so good with him. There was no way I'd allow Marissa to interfere with their time together. Kendall? I didn't know she was in town, she said, suddenly sounding distracted. And she's staying at your place? Yes, as usual. Now I have to go. Take him to Disney World next weekend. Fine, she huffed. Thankful that she was letting it go, I said goodbye and hung up. 22. Mia. Marshall showed us the galley, and as expected, it was expansive had everything we could possibly need. Good. It looks like we have everything, except for tomorrow's shipment. Let's just hope that nothing goes wrong with that one said Ridley, as we sorted through the boxes in the walk-in refrigerator. 
Don't jinx us, I said, standing up straight. Don't jinx us by saying don't jinx us, she countered. Ha ha, I replied dryly as we walked out of the refrigerator. Find what you needed? asked Marshall, who was leaning against the stainless steel counter and drinking a cup of coffee. Yes and more, I said, thinking about the fifty cases of beer stacked in the corner of the cooler next to a slew of other cold alcoholic beverages. Damien likes to be prepared for anything, said Marshall. Hopefully, he'll be prepared to deal with a lot of drunken guests, said Ridley. There's enough alcohol on board to last a year. Not the way some men drink, said Marshall. Believe me, we'll probably run out before the weekend is over. Lord, I hoped not. Damien mentioned there'd be security, right? I asked. I knew I was probably being overly paranoid, but I remembered seeing how my father had gotten when he was rip-roaring drunk. These men wouldn't have anyone babysitting them this weekend. That was trouble waiting to happen. Yes. There's us, the crew, and we've hired a couple of security guards to also keep an eye on things. I'm sure Ransom will also have a couple of his own as well. He never travels without bodyguards. I can't believe we get to meet him, said Ridley, getting that starry look in her eyes again. Just remember, he's the one getting married, I said. Of course. It's not like I'm going to hit on him or anything, she said. Do you have a boyfriend? asked Marshall nonchalantly. Or significant other? It's complicated, she said, frowning. It's not complicated, I said and turned to him. No. She does not. I didn't expect Ridley to jump back into the dating scene, but she had to know that her life would go on, and that there were a lot of other men attracted to her. And even I had to admit, Marshall was good-looking. With his blonde hair, light green eyes, and muscular frame, I could definitely see the two of them on a date. Ridley gave me a dirty look. But, I continued, she just got out of a sticky relationship. Which was complicated. Ah. Gotcha. Well, if any of the guys give you a hard time, let me know. I'll make sure they run into some of their own complications, said Marshall. She smiled at him. You're so sweet. Thank you. Great. You've got them hoodwinked already, don't you? said Damien, stepping into the galley. I stared in surprise as Marshall flipped him off. Instead of getting angry, Damien snorted. Just because we're cousins doesn't mean I can't fire your ass. Again. You wouldn't know what to do without me, said Marshall, crossing his arms under his chest and smirking. I'd spend a lot less on migraine medicine, he replied. You two are really cousins, said Ridley with an amused grin. Yes. He's Kendall's brother. He's also my right-hand guy, admitted Damien. Marshall nodded. Don't mind us. We give each other a lot of crap. It would be awkward if we didn't. He's right. It would be. So, I take it you didn't get to the bridge? asked Damien. No, replied Marshall. Not yet. We can wait until tomorrow, said Ridley. When the captain is here. Are you sure? asked Damien. Yes. I'd like to meet him, she said. Yeah, me too, I said. Okay. We'll plan on tomorrow then, said Damien. Sounds great. Ridley looked at me. So what do you say? Should we get our suits on and go out by the pool? Sure, I replied. I'll walk you back to your room, said Marshall. It's okay. We can find our way back, answered Ridley. Very well, he replied, looking disappointed. Enjoy yourselves and if there's anything you need, let me know, said Damien. We will, said Ridley. Thanks again for everything. 
No, thank you for catering this weekend, said Damien. I'm looking forward to tasting your wares. Ridley chuckled. You've already sampled some of Mia's. My face turned red. What was that? asked Marshall, his eyebrow cocked. Nothing, said Damien, smiling. Private joke. By the way, what about dinner this evening? I asked, changing the subject. Would you like us to prepare it? Actually, I'm having dinner brought in from Leonardo's, he replied. I hope you like Italian. Love it, said Ridley. Me too, I replied. Great. The owner owes me a favor, so he's promised to send over a great spread. Enough for everyone, including the crew, said Damien. You know the owner? asked Ridley, giving him a curious look. A little, he said. Why? Do you know Anthony? Not personally, she replied. He's an interesting character. Anyway, he looked at his watch. I should probably give him a call to check on things. Okay. We'll see you later, said Ridley, looping her arm through mine and dragging me away. Have fun, called Marshall. What's wrong? I asked, noticing that she was extremely quiet on the way back to our cabins. Probably nothing. What do you mean by that? She lowered her voice. He knows Anthony Baldacci. The guy who owns Leonardo's. Yeah. So what? Rumor has it that Anthony is connected to the mob. I stopped in my tracks. Are you serious? I asked, remembering Damien mentioned that Anthony owed him. For what? I'm sure it's not a big deal. I just thought it was interesting, considering our conversation yesterday. It is, I replied, biting my lower lip. You know what, though? Who cares? Who cares if he knows some sketchy people, you know? We're here to cater his party, and he's paying us very, very well. Besides, Damien Stryker is one of the nicest people I've ever met. I remembered saying that about Adam once. I'd been wrong. Instead of reminding her about it, however, I decided to let it go. We were here to do a job, and that was it. If I learned how to play a few chords on the piano in the meantime, even better. You're right. Let's just forget about what John said and enjoy ourselves, I told her. Exactly. And Adam, too. I agreed. 23. Mia. We went back to our cabins. I spent a few minutes unpacking, and then slipped my new white and purple bikini on. Grabbing my flip-flops, some sunscreen, and a towel, I headed over to Ridley's cabin. Nice, she said, staring down at my bathing suit. Damien is going to drool if he sees you in that. I wouldn't talk, I said, feeling a little self-conscious now. You're going to distract the crew if they see you in that tiny thing. Which was true. Ridley had on a red bikini, that left little to the imagination. She was much more voluptuous than I was, and I knew if Marshall saw her, he'd probably trip over his own tongue. She grabbed a cover-up and slipped it over her head. I'm not here to distract anyone. Let's go. We left her cabin and made our way to the pool, where we hung out for the next couple of hours, mostly by ourselves. Once in a while, a crew member would stop by and ask if we needed anything. Other than that, it was a very relaxing afternoon. I wonder where Marshall is, murmured Ridley, who'd just gotten out of the pool again. He's the only one who hasn't been over to offer us a refreshment or help applying sunscreen. I chuckled. Missing him already? No, she said firmly. I'm just surprised he hasn't popped up recently. What do you think of Marshall? 
I asked, watching as she began applying more sunscreen to her legs. She shrugged. He's nice. He's cute too. Ridley looked over at me. Yeah. So. I'm just saying. You're getting as bad as me, she said, smirking. I smiled. At around five o'clock, just as we were getting ready to go back to our cabins, Damien made an appearance. How was swimming, he asked, staring at us behind his sunglasses. Fabulous, said Ridley, pulling on her cover-up. We were just about to head back to our rooms. I'm glad you're enjoying the pool. By the way, dinner will be here around seven. I hope that's not too late, he said. Not at all, I replied. It's perfect, said Ridley. Great. I'll see you then, he said, and then left us. Ridley and I went back to our rooms. I took a shower and then changed into a pair of white shorts, a dressy black silk tank top and sandals. I put my hair up, applied a touch of makeup, and finished it off with a spritz of perfume. With a final glance in the mirror, I picked up my cell phone and left the cabin. I'm so hungry I'm not even going to care how many carbs he's feeding us tonight," said Ridley, who had on a pair of blue cut-off shorts and a paisley printed peasant blouse. At the mention of food, my stomach growled. I know what you mean, I said, as we headed toward the dining room. When we arrived, it was just turning seven, and the crew had set up the food buffet style. I hope you don't mind serving yourselves, said Damien, walking toward us. This way everyone can come and go as they please. Of course not, I said, thinking that he looked very handsome in a light blue polo shirt, which set off both his eyes and tan. I like it because we don't have to wait. I'm starving, said Ridley. There's a lot of food, he said as Marshall approached us. Damien noticed him coming and smirked. You'd better get some of it, however, before the bottomless pit makes it to the line. Let me tell you, he'll leave no crumb untouched. It's true, admitted Marshall. I've got a hearty appetite, but that's my only vice. Besides women, added Damien. How dare you give away my secrets, Marshall joked. Now they know all of my weaknesses. Oh, I don't think that's too hard to figure out. Damien said, his lip twitching. You too, said Ridley, sounding amused, are obviously related. Damien smiled. My stomach growled loud enough to make me blush. Excuse me, I said, embarrassed. I guess I'd better do something about that. We both should, said Ridley. The food smells wonderful. Thanks for ordering out. No problem. Like I said, Anthony owed me, and it looks like he's done a great job of returning the favor. Go and help yourselves, replied Damien. Gladly. Let's go, Mia, said Ridley, pulling me over toward the food. We got into the line, which was short, and filled our plates with pasta, salad, and fresh baked bread. We then went and sat down at one of the tables. A few minutes later, Marshall and Damien joined us. You don't mind if we sit with you? asked Damien, holding a heaping plate of food. Of course not, said Ridley. Your company is always welcome, I said between bites of food. Damien sat across from me. Oh, I bet you'll be sick of me before the week is over. I'm sure they are already but are too nice to say anything, said Marshall. They're probably sick of both of us, said Damien. No. Just you. Women love me, he said, and then looked behind us. In fact, here's one reason why. Aaron walked around and placed a bucket of ice containing two bottles of wine onto our table. I hope this is the type of wine you were looking for, he said to Marshall, handing him a bottle opener. Yes. Thank you, Marshall said, taking it. He pulled out a bottle of red wine. A good year, too. Excellent. 
I'll go and grab some wine glasses, said Aaron. Thank you, said Marshall. Wait a minute. Did you just insinuate that women like you because of wine? asked Ridley, looking amused. I think it was more along the lines of, he has to get them drunk to like him, said Damien. Very funny. No, what I meant was that I'm not one to forget the little things. Here, check this out, he said, showing her the bottle. A little birdie told me that you tried this once and loved it. Ridley's eyes widened and she smiled. Oh my God, yes. She looked at me. This is that wine I was telling you about. The one my brother gave to me on my birthday. It's heavenly. I remembered how she'd been raving about it, but because it was expensive, Ridley hadn't had it since. That was very kind of you, I said. I think you've won a friend for life. Darn right, she said. There is more of that in the wine cooler, by the way. Marshall pulled out the other bottle, which was a light pink. And Mia, I heard you really enjoy Moscato, so I did a little research and purchased a few different bottles. This one has actually won many awards. I hope you enjoy it. You are so sweet, I replied, smiling at him. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything for you too, he said. Oh, here we go, said Damien dryly. I can just see his head swelling by the second. We have to keep our chefs happy, Marshall said. After all, they are the ones feeding us this weekend. I couldn't agree more, which is why I hired each of them a personal masseuse. Jacques and Philippe. They'll be here on Monday to work out any stress you might acquire over the weekend, said Damien. Oh my God, really? gasped Ridley. Really, he replied. I grinned. Thank you. I haven't been to a masseuse in forever. No problem. I figured you'd need some pampering after this busy weekend, Damien said. You just had to outdo me, didn't you? said Marshall dryly. Of course not. I want them happy. Just like you do, he said, smiling. You are both so. I could just kiss you, Ridley said, standing up. She leaned over and gave both of them a kiss on the cheek. Wow, if I would have seen that coming, I'd have added chocolate and flowers, said Marshall, looking pleased. Add that next time, and I might even let you kiss me back, joked Ridley. Marshall pulled out a small notebook and a pen. I'm adding that to my bucket list. Chocolate and flowers equal a kiss from Ridley, he said out loud as he wrote it down. It was a joke but I could tell from the way Ridley was looking at Marshall, she was very flattered. Speaking of a bucket, can I get one over here? I feel like I'm going to throw up, joked Damien. You're just jealous because you've done almost everything on your bucket list, and now there aren't any challenges left for you to conquer, said Marshall. Damien suddenly looked serious. That's where you're wrong, he said. I find new ones every day. Our eyes met, and I instinctively knew that I might just be one of them. 24. Damien. As we were eating dinner, I could barely keep my eyes off of Mia. She looked so beautiful, especially when she began talking about photography. The way her face lit up was extraordinary and it made me wonder what kind of a moron I'd hired to handle my divorce. Anyone who let someone go like Mia was an idiot. Did you bring your camera? I asked. Yes. Don't worry, I promise not to take any pictures of your guests, she said. I wasn't worried, I replied. I'd keep it hidden until they're gone, however. Ransom security guards might possibly confiscate it. I know he wanted to keep this party a secret. Of course. I'd never invade his or your privacy, she said. So what kind of pictures do you usually take? asked Marshall. 
Nature mostly, she replied. Have you ever done weddings or parties? I asked her. She shook her head. No. It's more of a hobby. I should have you take some pictures of me and my son together, I told her. I don't have that many. At least not recent ones. I'd love to, she replied, smiling at me. I grinned back. Good. Ridley yawned. I don't know about you guys, but I'm tired. I think I'm going to head back to my cabin. It's only 8.30, said Marshall, looking disappointed. I know, but I'm exhausted. Probably from swimming and all the excitement, she said. And the wine, added Mia, smiling at her friend. She chuckled. Oh, definitely. Anyway, thank you again for dinner, and I guess I'll be seeing you all tomorrow morning. Sounds good. Let my crew know if you need anything, I said. I will. Thank you. I'll go with you, Mia said, standing up. No. You're supposed to get a piano lesson tonight, if I remember correctly, she said, glancing at me. That's right, I said, looking at my watch. In fact, let's go now before it gets too late. Are you sure you have time for this? Mia asked. The thought of getting her alone made me more than sure. Totally. Let's do it. Marshall stood up. I'll walk you to your cabin, Ridley. No, you don't have to, she replied. I can find my way. Hey, it's no problem, he said, and then turned to us. Have fun. Damien is a wonderful piano player and a good teacher. He even helped Kendall learn to play. Really? I said. Your sister has a wonderful voice. I heard her sing the other night. She certainly does, he agreed. Do you sing? asked Ridley. He nodded. Yes. Horribly. Unlike my sister, I'm usually paid to keep my mouth shut. We all laughed. 25. Mia. I thought that we were going to the salon for lessons, but instead he directed me to the other side of the ship. Where are we going? I asked, confused. My quarters. At the mention of his own personal cabin, my stomach did a flip-flop. Oh. I have a piano there as well, he explained, a smile in his voice. And we'll have less distractions. Okay. When we arrived, I was startled at how big the master cabin actually was. It had its own galley, office, and sitting room. Very nice, I said, looking around. It was very masculine compared to our rooms. Thank you, he replied. Would you like a drink? I'm okay, I replied. Are you sure? A glass of wine? I have some Moscato in my wine cabinet. I smirk. Really? In case you invite someone who enjoys it back to your room? You must really consider me a scoundrel, he said, laughing. Are you? No. To be honest, I'm not much of a wine drinker, but I do like a good Moscato, probably because it's sweeter, he replied which is the real reason that I have it stocked. Oh. Well then only if you're going to have a glass. I was thinking more in the lines of rum and coke, he said, heading toward the galley. I'll try one of those too, actually, I told him. Your wish is my command, he said over his shoulder. I walked over to the baby grand piano and sat down. I wasn't too familiar with them, but recognized the name Steinway. I could tell that it was an older model, but in beautiful condition. I tapped on a couple of the keys, imagining what kind of money it took to have not one, but two pianos on a yacht like Damien's. And then of course the yachts weren't cheap either. 
That was my grandfather's, he said, coming up behind me a few minutes later. Well, one of his. He used to keep this one in his office. It's beautiful, I replied. Do you use it a lot? Once in a while. My son likes to hear me play. Is he learning too? Unfortunately, no. He gave me rueful smile. He has no interest in playing. He's taking saxophone lessons instead. That's wonderful. I love listening to the saxophone. Do you ever play together? No. He actually just started the lessons. I would love to play alongside him one day, though. I bet. You must be very proud of your son. More than anything, Damien handed me my drink. He's my world. Thank you. I took a sip of it and shuddered. He grinned. Sorry. Too strong? A little. Are you trying to get me drunk? I joked. Never. I'm not sure what to believe, I said, smiling. After that kiss outside of the limo. His lip twitched. Sorry. I couldn't resist. It suddenly felt very awkward between us. I took another drink, and then set it down on a nearby coaster. Okay, so about this lesson. Smiling, he took a sip of his and set it down as well. Okay, the first thing anyone needs to know is how to sit properly at the piano. Okay, I replied, sitting up straight. Very good. Damien showed me how to hold my fingers and where to place them. Now think of each finger as having a number. He then appointed numbers to each and had me practice using them. Very good. I think you should try playing something very simple now. Let me go and see if I can find something, he said before walking away. A few seconds later, he returned with a folder containing several sheets of music. He pulled one out and set it in front of me. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, I said out loud, smiling. It's my son's. Anyway, we all have to start somewhere. I'm not complaining, I replied. For the next half hour, we practiced playing the song. You're doing great, he said. You're already playing very smoothly. Thanks. No problem, he said, our eyes meeting. I think this is going to come easy to you. You have very good dexterity in your fingers. I looked down at my hands. I hope so. Listening to you play earlier reminded me of how desperately I wanted to learn when I was growing up. You obviously still have that same passion. You know, it's never too late to do what makes you happy, he said softly. Hell, you're barely old enough to get into a bar. I laughed. Right. I bet you get carded all the time. No. The fact is, I really don't hang out at bars, I admitted. Last week was the first time I'd been out for a long time. I had a lot of fun that night, he replied. I thought again about our last kiss outside of the limo and what he'd said afterward. I don't know if it was the alcohol or just the memory of that moment, but I was suddenly warm all over. I quickly changed the subject. I really loved listening to you play earlier. Would you do another song for me? Sure, he answered. Do you have any preferences? Not really. Just something that you enjoy, I replied, getting up from the piano. He sat down on the bench. There is another song that I've always loved. It's by Liszt. Have you heard of him? Yes, I replied. Maybe you'll recognize it then, he said softly and then began to play. As before, I became swept away by the piece. It was a slow, melodic song that was both beautiful and mysterious. I stared at him as he played, 
captivated by the music, and even more fascinated by the man creating it. 26. Damien The song was called Dreams of Love. Although I'd probably played it hundreds of times, I'd never done it with as much rapture. Maybe it was the way she was staring at me, or the fact that I wanted to kiss her again. I don't know. Regardless of what it was, I played the hell out of the song, and from the expression on her face, she was caught up in it as much as I was. Recognize it? I asked, staring up at her as I continued playing. She shook her head and took another drink of her cocktail. Do you like the piece? I love it, she said softly. I smiled and continued playing, willing her to feel everything that I was trying to convey to her through the song. Unfortunately, even if Mia understood the message, I knew that she wasn't one to make the first move. Or so I'd thought. 27. Mia. I don't know what came over me, but I suddenly had to touch him. I put my drink down and then came up behind Damien. Taking a deep breath, I placed my hands on his shoulders. He froze. Keep playing, I murmured. Please. Closing his eyes, his fingers began to move again. I slowly ran my hands over his back and shoulders, enjoying the way his muscles contracted as he played. Do you know how hard it is to play right now? He murmured huskily. I'm sorry. Should I stop? Never. Feeling bold, I leaned down and nibbled on his earlobe. Groaning, Damien turned around and pulled me onto his lap. He kissed me deeply, and with such passion I lost my mind completely. Soon we were in his bed and he made love to me, bringing me to such heights of ecstasy, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Are you okay? he asked at one point, noticing the tears in my eyes. I told him that I was more than okay, and pulled him back to me. When I woke up, a few hours later, I found myself alone in his bed. I sat up and looked at the clock. It was just past 8 a.m. Not sure of how I should be feeling, I slid out of bed and started putting my clothes back on. As I was buttoning up my shorts, Damien stepped out of his office, his hair damp from a shower. Today he had on a dark blue Hawaiian shirt and beige cargo shorts. Ah, hi, I said, wondering what it would be like between us now. Grinning, he walked right over, pulled me into his arms, and kissed me. Good morning, he murmured, after pulling away. When did you wake up? I asked, feeling a little less awkward. About thirty minutes ago. Would you like some coffee? he asked. I was just about to make some. No. That's okay. I'm going to head back to my room. He studied my face. Are you okay? I smiled weakly. Yes. Maybe a little sore. Maybe I could help rub away the pain, he said, an evil glint in his eyes. I bet you could but no, I said amused. Somehow, I think I just need to soak in a tub for a while. Sounds great. I should join you. I chuckled. Maybe next time. His face became serious. He gently brushed a piece of hair away from my cheek. Last night was incredible. I hope you don't regret what happened. No. Not at all. He looked relieved. Good. I swallowed. However, I don't think we should tell anyone about it. Not yet, anyway. Especially Ridley. I knew she'd want details, and I wasn't ready to talk. I still wasn't even sure if what had happened was because we'd been drinking. I agree. In fact, I was going to mention the same to you, he said. I think we should keep it our little secret. I don't know why, but hearing him say it that way bothered me. 
our little secret. It sounded dirty. Sure. I won't say anything, I said, a little more coolly than planned. He frowned. What's wrong? Nothing, I lied. No. For some reason you're upset because I said we should keep it a secret, he said, studying my face. Weren't you just requesting the same thing? Yes, I said, forcing a smile. And I'm fine. Good. I mean, there's just so much going on, especially with the party this weekend. If anyone gets wind of the fact that we've been intimate, especially one of the guys, they'll make a big deal out of it. I just stared at him. He went on. Normally, I wouldn't care that much. But this was supposed to be a no-women weekend. What about Ridley and me? We're women. That's different. You're the caterers. Not anyone's girlfriend. Obviously, I muttered. Seeing my expression, he swore. That didn't come out right. You know what I mean, though, right? I understood what he was saying, but I was still a little chafed. Yes. I get it. Anyway, don't worry about it. So we hooked up? It happens. That doesn't mean we have to start dating or anything. He stared at me. I'm not trying to sound insensitive. Look, this thing that happened between us, it was special. Hell, you're special, Mia. I hope you know that I'm not just saying that. Okay. As far as dating goes, I never claimed that I didn't want to take you out. I just want to keep our night a secret, at least until the weekend is over. I get it, I said, relaxing. Good. He kissed me again. I tell you what, though, Damien whispered. It's going to take everything I have not to drag you back to my cabin this weekend. I'm sure you'll be so busy entertaining your friends that it will be easier than you think, I told him. I doubt it. I already want you again, and we haven't even made it out of my cabin yet. Smiling, I backed away from Damien toward his doorway. That sounds like a problem. One that I can't help you with right now, Mr. Stryker. Like I said, I'm sore, so I'm going back to my cabin where I'm going to get naked, climb into the tub, and turn on the spa. Hopefully, it will help soothe my lady parts. At the mention of my lady parts, his eyes began to smolder. Smiling, I waved goodbye and took off. 28. Mia. A half hour later, I was relaxing in the tub and daydreaming about Damien. I thought about the things he'd done to my body and couldn't help but smile. The man knew how to please a woman, unlike anyone I'd ever been with. I wasn't sure what would happen between us in the future, but knew that if we only had last night, I wouldn't regret it. After I was finished soaking, I left the tub and got into my uniform, which consisted of a black chef coat and a pair of gray cotton pants. I put my hair up, slipped on a pair of clogs, and then sent Ridley a message to let her know that I was ready to get started whenever she was. A few seconds later, she appeared at my door, also wearing her uniform. How was last night, she asked as we headed toward the galley. Good, I said, leaving it at that. So, are you a skilled piano player now, she asked, a smile in her voice. Hardly. I replied and then went over what I'd learned, leaving out the sex part. Ridley laughed. So you can play Twinkle, Twinkle now? Kind of. I need to practice. So enough about my night. How was yours? Fine. I went back to my cabin, read for a while, and then fell asleep. You didn't invite Marshall in for a nightcap? She looked at me like I was on drugs. No. Of course not. Okay. I was just asking, I replied, 
noticing she was on the defense more than usual. I know he's cute and everything, but I'm just not interested in hooking up with him. Mostly because we'll be on the ship for the next few days, and I don't want things to get awkward. Understandable. What about you? She smirked. Did Damien make a move on you? No, I replied, not exactly lying. I'd made the move on him. Seriously? You sound disappointed, I replied, amused. Of course I am. It's been months, and if anyone needs non-mechanical sex, it's you. I laughed. That's true. As we walked through the dining room, Ridley and I noticed several boxes of freshly made bagels and muffins. Good morning, said Marshall, who was seated at one of the tables and reading the newspaper. Good morning, I replied. How are you? Great, he replied. If either of you are hungry, help yourselves. Perfect. Thank you. Ridley grabbed a whole wheat muffin and began spreading cream cheese on it. So, when are the guests supposed to be arriving? Sometime this afternoon, he replied. I can't believe we get to meet Ransom, she said, her eyes sparkling. This is so exciting. I stole a glance at Marshall, who didn't look half as impressed as Ridley. In fact, he looked more irritated than anything. Not a big fan. I said. A. He's not bad, replied Marshall. Are you kidding? His voice is phenomenal, said Ridley. Just then, Damien entered the dining room. Marshall, there you are. I need you to go to a nearby airport and pick up Ransom. Me. Why? Isn't he arriving with his entourage? asked Marshall. No. He had a friend fly him in on a private jet. Apparently, the media caught wind that Ransom was coming out here, so they're going to be looking for him at the Orlando International Airport. What about the other guests? Marshall asked. They'll be arriving later, he explained. In Orlando, I'm sure. Marshall stood up. Okay. Which airport? Nelson's, he said. The one we usually use. Okay. Let him know I'm on my way, he replied. I already did, said Damien. Can I come with you? asked Ridley. Not a good idea. He probably doesn't want to be bombarded with a bunch of questions from a zealous fan, said Marshall. I am not zealous, she said, pouting. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with being excited about a rock and roll celebrity, said Marshall, noticing that he'd hurt her feelings. It's just that this weekend, Ransom is here to relax and forget about life on stage for a while. I understand, she said, looking irritated. I would never antagonize him. I'm not stupid. I never said you were, replied Marshall defensively. You'd better get going, said Damien, who'd been listening silently. He turned to us, all businesslike. I'm sure you two have a lot of work to do in the kitchen. His tone was almost condescending, and I gave him a dirty look. Let's go, Ridley. We've been banished, I said, touching her arm. Damien's eyes widened. I didn't mean it that way. Then you should work on your communication skills, because you're confusing the hell out of people today, I said as we headed toward the doorway. He didn't say anything. I can't believe you just said that to him, said Ridley, when we were out of his earshot. What if Damien fires us? Relax. He's not going to fire us, I muttered, still irritated with him. Wait a second. She grabbed my arm and I turned around. You two had sex, didn't you? I stared at her innocently. Why do you say that? Because it's pretty obvious that there's something going on between the two of you. 
I sighed. She wagged her finger at me. Don't even think about lying to me. I'm your best friend and your business partner. I deserve better, she said sternly. I sighed again. Okay. Fine. It happened. Her eyes widened. Sex. Yes. She grinned, looking proud of herself. I knew it. Why didn't you tell me earlier? Because we promised to keep it a secret. At least for now. Her eyebrows drew together. Why? It's not like either of you are in relationships. Damien said that it would be awkward if the guys at the bachelor party knew about us. We started walking toward the galley again. Why should it matter to them, she asked. Because it's a non-couples weekend. She snorted. What's the big deal? You had sex. Period. It's not like you two are dating or anything. I know, I said, ignoring how her words stung. I'd never slept with anyone so quickly, and I was beginning to feel a little sleazy. It's fine, though. As long as you're okay with it. I wouldn't let him touch you, until after he breaks his silence, however. I laughed dryly. Don't worry. I'm not going to. An hour later, as we were preparing some of the meals for later that evening, Damien stopped into the galley. Are you busy? he asked me. I'd just gotten done rolling pizza dough, and there was flour all over me. Yeah. I said, wiping my forehead with the back of my hand. Ridley cleared her throat. I can take over. If you two need to talk. I forgot to give her some sheet music, he explained, smiling brightly. To practice with, until our next music lesson. It can wait until later. Besides, I doubt I'll have time to practice, I said. Damien's smile fell. Sure you will. Anyway, I'd like to give it to you now. Before I get too busy with the guests. Ridley snorted. Oh hell. You may as well let him give it to you. I shot her a dirty look. She turned away, and I could tell she was trying not to laugh. I guess if it can't wait, I said, wondering what he really wanted. It didn't take me too long to find out, however. After I followed him out of the galley, he pulled me into one of the supply closets and began kissing me. I pushed him away. What are you doing? I can't stop thinking about you, he whispered, pulling me back into his arms. Caught up in the moment, I closed my eyes and gave in to his kisses. Eventually, one thing led to another, and before I knew it, we were having an all-out quickie in the supply room. Do you think anyone heard us? I whispered afterward. No. Yes. Probably. Screw it. I don't care, he said, kissing me hard again. I pulled away. Wait a second, I thought we were going to wait? He looked a little embarrassed. I meant that we should wait on telling anyone. Oh. I replied, thinking that he'd changed the story but really not caring. Soon we were going our separate ways, and I had to face Ridley again. The moment I walked back into the galley, she went into a fit of laughter. What? I asked, trying to keep a straight face. You look like you just got laid. Let me guess, the moment he had you alone, it was all over but the screwing? I don't know what you're talking about, I lied, smiling. She motioned toward her head. If I were you, I'd fix myself up. I touched my hair. That bad? Ah, uh, yeah. You should really look in a mirror. I found a nearby bathroom and found that my mascara had run, my hair was in disarray, and my lips were swollen from his kisses. I quickly did what I could to remedy the situation, and then returned to the galley. 
Better, she said when I walked back in. Thanks. Seriously, though, I thought you were going to keep him at bay? He took me by surprise. Ridley grunted. I bet he did. Where? In his office? I shook my head. No. The supply room. We didn't make it much further than that. It just goes to show all men, no matter rich or poor, will take it where they can get it. Even in the closet. By the way, did you happen to see if there were any paper towels in there? We're running low. I chuckled. No. Should I go back and look? No. I'll do it. With my luck, you'll meet Damien in the hallway again and end up screwing in the engine room. Stay here, she said, heading toward the doorway. Smiling, I went back to work on my pizza dough, wondering if anyone had actually ever done it in an engine room. 29. Damien. What in the hell is happening to me? Here I was, getting ready to host a wild weekend of drunkenness, debauchery, and sin, and all I could think about was Mia. She'd managed to get under my skin in less than a week, and I'd barely finalized my divorce with Marissa. As much as I wanted to believe that it was mostly about sex, I knew that we'd connected on a level that was much more than that. Everything about her fascinated me, and the truth was that I'd have much rather spent the next couple of days getting to know her better, instead of entertaining Ransom's bachelor party. At least there was next week. I only hoped that my son liked her. It was important to me that they got along. Sighing, I headed to the bridge to see if the captain had arrived. I found him going over the itinerary with Jeff. Mr. Stryker, he said, holding out his hand. I shook it. Welcome aboard, Charles. Great to see you again. You as well, he replied. Are you excited about the trip? Yes. Looking forward to it, I replied. So we're setting sail around midnight, correct? He asked, running a finger over his white mustache. Yes. After we kick the strippers off. You're welcome to stop by and see some of the entertainment before setting sail. Strippers? Hell, I'd love to, but I don't know if my heart can take it, he said, smiling. Charles was in his sixties and had lost his wife within the last year to cancer. I knew he was lonely and missed her dearly. At least you'll have a smile on your face if it gives out, I said. I most certainly would indeed, he replied. Haven't seen a stripper in many years. Neither had I, but after being with Mia, I didn't care one way or another. We talked more about the trip, and then I left the bridge to wait for Marshall and Ransom. Ransom, it's been too long. He shook my hand. No doubt. Thanks again for hosting this party. You didn't have to do that. It's my pleasure. And I know I didn't, but I wanted to. You're a good friend, he answered. And those are hard to come by these days. I hear you, I said. Speaking of friends, do you know when the rest of the party is set to arrive? Everyone should be here by five, he said, looking around. Man, I've forgotten how large your yacht is. He'd been on it once before with his fiancée. I purchased it when I was still with Marissa, about the time when I couldn't stand being around her. I needed something that would put some distance between us, I said, smiling. He chuckled. I don't blame you. Well, still, it's an amazing ship. Thank you. Marshall, who'd been talking to one of Ransom's security guards, walked over to us. Where are the girls? I figured they'd be throwing rose petals at his feet the moment he boarded. Girls? Ransom asked. Our caterers? Don't worry. They won't be bothering you, I said. 
They're fans but also professionals, and will be staying out of everyone's way. I'm not worried, he replied. Unless one of them is named Lola Flanagan. My eyebrows shot up. Who's Lola Flanagan? A psychotic, middle-aged loony who's been stalking me. I had her arrested last month for trespassing. She somehow got into our home and scared the hell out of Tiffany. The woman is crazy. She made it into your home? I asked, surprised. Actually, Tiffany let her in. She thought Lola was there to adopt one of the stray animals she'd found. It didn't take long before she realized that the woman was a nut job. Then when she tried kicking her out, Lola wouldn't budge. She claimed that I was supposed to meet her there. Tiffany had to call the police. I assume you're pressing charges against this Lola person, said Marshall. I was going to, but Tiffany talked me out of it. He ran a hand over his face. She feels sorry for her. Even after all of that? I asked. Yeah. Lola has mental problems, and Tiffany thinks it's wrong to punish her for something that she can't control. Your wife-to-be is a saint, I replied, already knowing Tiffany was a bleeding heart. Ransom had told me before that she was into taking in stray animals. Speaking of which, how big is your farm now? He sighed. Let's see, we've got eight stray animals we're trying to find homes for. Four dogs, two cats, a ferret, and a snake. Marshall grimaced. Snake? A boa. Don't ask me where she found it. All I know is that Tiffany promised to get rid of it before I returned home on Monday. I knew Ransom hated snakes, and the idea that he allowed Tiffany to care for one, even for just a little while, meant it really was true love. Well, you're safe here. No snakes, stray animals, or fanatics named Lola, Marshall replied. I'll see it when I believe it. The woman turns up in the craziest places, he replied. She shows up here and will toss her overboard, I said. He grunted. I'd feel sorry for the sharks. Chuckling, I patted him on the back. Sounds like you could use a beer. Let me show you to your cabin, and then we'll grab a couple. Sounds good, he replied. I'll watch for the other guests, said Marshall. I nodded. By the way, I also requested extra security. They should be here any minute. Extra security? Repeated Ransom. You just never know when you're going to need it, I replied. Besides, you're on board. If Lola finds out, she might really try hijacking the yacht. I wouldn't put it past her, he replied dryly. We'd better screen each and every stripper who boards the ship this weekend, said Marshall with a devilish grin. I'll let you do the honors, I told him. Strippers, said Ransom. He meant paint strippers, I said innocently. Right. As long as there aren't prostitutes, reminded Ransom. Relax. I heard you the first time. There will not be any hookers on board, I said. No stress, no worries, and no surprises this weekend. At least not the bad kind. Ransom smiled. Sounds like the perfect weekend. 30. Mia. Ridley and I worked all afternoon to create mouthwatering dishes for the stag party weekend. Besides prepping for the main courses, we made an array of appetizers, including several different types of wings, which Damien had insisted upon. We also planned on making jalapeno poppers, a couple of hearty dips, steak and chicken kebabs, and a cheesy beer bread that had been a hit at a previous party. For tonight's dinner, we're still serving walleye and crab, correct? asked Ridley, going through our list of menu items. Yes, I replied. And barbecue ribs for those who aren't fish or seafood fans. Also, Damien's recommendation. Gotcha. 
As we were discussing the side dishes, the door opened and in walked Damien and Mr. Rockstar himself, Ransom. When Ridley noticed, she looked like she was about ready to faint. Thankfully, she kept her cool and was very calm when Damien introduced us. It's very nice to meet you, I said, staring at him. He was definitely a good-looking man. Tall, broad shoulders, medium-length jet-black hair, and eyes that were a silvery color. You too, he replied, smiling, which made him even more handsome. I'm looking forward to eating this weekend. Damien's been raving about the two of you. Ridley laughed nervously. Did he also tell you that he hasn't tried any of our food yet? Hey, I'm not worried. I've heard nothing but good things about their cooking, Damien said to Ransom. And from the way everything smells in here, I think I've made an excellent choice. I think you're right, Ransom replied. I thought I died and went to heaven when we walked in. What are you making? A bunch of different things, I replied. By the way, we should probably ask right now if you have any food allergies. None at all. I'll usually eat whatever's in front of me as long as it's not made out of tofu, goat cheese, or squid, he replied. Darn it, there goes tonight's menu, I joked. Ridley played along. Way to go. Now we'll have to resort to Alaskan king crab and pecan-crusted walleye. I sighed. Ah, uh, yeah. I guess so. Ransom chuckled. You two are killing me. Now my stomach is making noises that I've never heard before. When do we eat, exactly? I looked at the kitchen timer. We're actually going to be putting out some appetizers very soon. Damien had mentioned that dinner should be served around 8, but to have snacks available beforehand. Yes, and if you're really hungry, we're also making a couple of flatbread pizzas, an Italian chopped salad, and portobello mushroom and steak sliders, added Ridley. Ransom looked impressed. And that's not even dinner? Wow, it sounds amazing. Just send all of it directly to my cabin. And give everyone else the tofu and squid crab. Believe me, once they start drinking, they won't care one way or another. Ridley and I laughed. Hey, you're the guest of honor, said Damien, amused. Whatever you want, you get. Ransom chuckled. Words I'll probably never hear again after this weekend. I might have to take advantage of it. You'd better, said Damien. It's your last hurrah before being tied down for the rest of your life. Take full advantage of it. No offense, ladies. None taken, said Ridley. You know, marriage goes both ways, I replied. Women are tied down too. Which can sometimes be a good thing, said Ransom, lightening the mood. Depending on what room you're in, and if you have a safe word. We laughed. So, when are you getting married, by the way? I asked him. In three weeks, he replied. How exciting. How long have you known each other? I asked. She was my sister's best friend growing up. I've known her for many years, he replied. It's Tiffany, right? asked Ridley. The one who was on American Icon a while back. With you as the judge? Yeah, he said with a sheepish grin. You watched those episodes, huh? Oh yeah. You were hard on her, said Ridley. Yeah, I was, he admitted. But I thought I was looking out for her best interests. Fortunately, it all worked out in the end. She's gorgeous, replied Ridley. And what a voice. I know, right? He grinned. I'm a lucky man. Damien's phone went off. He checked his messages. Marshall is wondering if the others have arrived at the airport yet? Actually, their plane just landed a few minutes ago, said Ransom, pulling out his phone. I received a text from my buddy Reed. 
They should be arriving within the hour. Damien started typing into his phone. Okay. I'll let my crew know so they can watch for them. Sounds great. It was nice meeting the both of you, Ransom said, before heading toward the doorway with Damien. You as well, I replied. Enjoy yourself this weekend, said Ridley. Damien put a hand on his shoulder and grinned. Oh, he will. I'm going to make sure of it. 31. Mia. It was just turning five when the servers helped us put out the last of the appetizers in the dining room. There were two tables filled with everything from artichoke dip to bacon-wrapped scallops. We'd also included the two flatbread pizzas, one a barbecue chicken, and the other a pineapple and Canadian bacon recipe we'd never tried before. Fortunately, it turned out great. Wow, this looks amazing, said Marshall, who'd stopped in to see how we were doing. He changed out of his uniform and was now wearing Bermuda shorts and a dressy black and cream-colored Tommy Bahama shirt. What's in the sliders? Portobello mushrooms and sirloin steak with horseradish and provolone cheese, said Ridley. How in the hell is it that you two aren't married? asked Marshall. Not only are you both beautiful, but you can create these fabulous meals. Maybe we just haven't found men that are worthy of our talents, Ridley replied in a faux haughty voice. And I don't know about Mia, but I have some hidden ones that some men just can't handle. Really? he asked, looking intrigued. Are we talking about what I think we're talking about? I don't know. What are you talking about? she asked, her eyes full of mischief. He smiled slowly. I'd better keep my mouth shut so I don't get sued for sexual harassment. Ridley opened her mouth to say something, but then changed her mind. I could tell by her expression that she liked the way he was flirting with her, but was struggling with inner emotions. Could you let everyone know that the food is ready? I said to Marshall. He nodded. Of course. Everyone is on board now, and I'm sure they're hungry. Good. We have some extra platters of food in the galley too, I said. Great. I bet you two are exhausted from working in the kitchen all day. I'm sure the servers can handle replenishing anything that runs out. Why don't you go and take a break, he suggested. I think we will, I said, knowing that in another couple of hours we'd be back in the galley preparing dinner. Thanks, Marshall, said Ridley. Just let us know if there's anything wrong with the food. Will do, but I highly doubt anyone will find fault with what you've made. If they do, I'll knock some sense into them, he replied. She grinned. As much as I'd like to see that, I hope it doesn't come down to it. Anything to protect the honor of our two lovely chefs, he said before leaving. Just think of me as your own personal bodyguard. Anyone does anything offensive, you let me know. Will do, said Ridley. When he was gone, she looked at me. He's kind of a ham, but even I have to admit, he grows on people. I laughed. Come on. Let's get out of here, she said, wiping her forehead. Before someone sees me looking like a sweaty pig. I felt the same way. Although the galley had air conditioning, the ovens had been on all day, making it warmer than we'd like. Good idea. I'm going to take a shower. Me too, she said as we stepped out of the dining room. Oh crap, she whispered, as Damien, Marshall and Ransom approached, followed by a group of men. They were all holding beers and talking amongst themselves. And so it begins, I said under my breath, remembering again that we were catering a three-day bachelor party. Talk about a hot-looking group of men, she murmured quickly. Ridley had a point. Most of them were pretty handsome. For me, Damien still stood out the most, though. Especially when our eyes met, and he gave me one of his dazzling smiles. 
Ah, here they are, said Damien as they approached. My new best kept secrets. A couple of the guys laughed wickedly. Pull your heads out of the gutter, said Ransom, smirking back at his friends. These women are gourmet chefs. They deserve the utmost respect, and you'll soon find out why when you taste their cooking. Pasting a smile to my face, I greeted them warmly, as did Ridley. Are you joining us? asked one of the guys, staring at Ridley with interest. He was tall, with long blonde hair tied back into a ponytail. She laughed nervously. Ah, no. We're going to take a break, and then head back to the kitchen to prepare dinner. He held out his hand. I look forward to trying your food. My name is Simon, he said, his accent British. She shook it. It's very nice to meet you. Simon brought her hand to his lips and kissed Ridley's knuckles. And very nice to meet you. Ridley blushed. Most of the others walked around us and into the dining room, including Damien. Not Marshall, however. He stayed back, and I could tell that he wasn't thrilled with the way that Simon was flirting with Ridley. Okay, Romeo. Don't go making things awkward between us and the chefs, said Ransom, also still standing with us and looking amused. Simon let her hand go. Are you feeling awkward? No. Not at all, she said, staring at him with a dreamy expression. He grinned. See. No harm done, Simon said to Ransom. Not yet, anyway, he replied, and then looked at Ridley. Watch out for this guy. When he's not playing the drums, he doesn't know how to control his hands. It was then that I recognized Simon. He was the drummer for Ransom's band. On the contrary. I'm very good with my hands, said Simon, smiling wickedly. That's what they tell me, at least. The food is going to go quickly, so if you're hungry, I'd grab a plate, said Marshall. These two spent all day cooking, and you don't want to miss out on the goodies they've created. Ah, the goodies, said Simon, smiling at Ridley again. I'd definitely hate to miss out on your goodies. Her cheeks turned bright red. Ransom patted him on the back. Okay, now it's getting awkward even for me, he joked. Let's go eat. Simon chuckled. Fine. Nice meeting the two of you. I'm sure we'll run into each other again. I'm sure, said Ridley. See you, I said as Ransom pulled him away. Sorry about him, said Marshall in a low voice. He wasn't feeling good when he arrived. Really, said Ridley. I wouldn't have known. Marshall continued. Ransom already warned us about Simon. He's a horn dog, and will probably continue to flirt with you every chance he gets. So you should probably just try to stay out of his path. There's nothing wrong with a little innocent flirting, she replied. And I'm a grown woman. I can handle it. Fine, he said tightly. Just don't say I didn't warn you. I do appreciate your concern, she said. He gave her a curt nod, and then walked into the dining room. Man, what's wrong with him, she said, as we turned and headed back toward our cabins. I snorted. Really? You seriously don't know? What? Are you saying that he's jealous? Of course. Marshall has the hots for you. You should have seen his face when Simon was flirting with you. Her eyes widened. Really? He was actually angry? Yeah. I'd say. Well, that's his problem. He's not my boyfriend, and I'm tired of jealous men trying to interfere with my life. So what if Simon flirts with me? It's all in fun anyway. You're only saying that because you're starstruck, I said. Don't even deny it. She didn't reply. If you want my opinion, 
I think Marshall beats Simon in looks, hands down, I added. They're both cute. But again, I'm not here to hook up with anyone. If either of them wants to flirt with me, I'm fine with that. Heck, if any of the others want to, besides Damien, of course, I don't see anything wrong with it. I agreed. Speaking of which, she said, lowering her voice. How is it with Damien? Are billionaires different in the sack? I smiled but didn't say anything. Come on, she pouted. Tell me something. We joked around a little, and then Ridley commented about how rebound sex might not be such a bad thing. Especially, if she ended up in bed with Simon. I grimaced. Yuck. You heard Marshall, he's a player. He's probably been with hundreds of women. We don't know that for sure. I snorted. Ridley, really? He's a rock star. A very famous one. She sighed. Okay, whatever. I'm just kidding about rebound sex anyway. The last thing I need is to go down that road with anyone this weekend. I definitely don't need that. What I do need is to clear my head and figure things out with Adam. What's there to figure out? He doesn't deserve you. I know. She sighed and avoided eye contact. It's just not that easy to walk away. It was easy enough for him to hit you. Her cheeks turned red. I know. I know, she said in a tired voice. Hey, would you want me going back to John? Her eyes widened in alarm. God, no. He's a creep. So is Adam. We need to stick together when it comes to saying no to our exes. Friends before men's, right? She grinned. Yes, friends before men's. Admittedly, I was already thinking about the next time Damien and I would get some alone time together. I didn't know if anything serious was going to happen in our relationship, but right now, I was enjoying myself. And there was nothing wrong with that, right? 32. Damien. The food Mia and Ridley had made was incredible, and it went quickly. After only 15 minutes, everything was gone, including the backup in the galley. Wow, those two know what they're doing, said Ransom, shoving another jalapeno popper into his mouth. He chewed it and then said, I wish I would have known about them earlier. Taffy and Ike could have hired them for the wedding. I just found them myself, I admitted. Through Ridley's brother. Ridley. That chick looks good enough to eat, said Simon, who just stepped out of the bathroom. His nose was red, and it was obvious he hadn't been in there to take a piss. He sniffed a couple of times and then rubbed his nose. You don't care if I have a go at her, do you? She's here to work, Ransom murmured. And not on your wanker. We all laughed. Simon grinned wickedly. She wouldn't have to do any work. Just lay there and let me run the show. Ridley and Mia are off limits, said Marshall, looking a little peeved. But don't worry. We'll have some entertainment joining us later this evening. Ransom looked at him. What kind of entertainment? The kind that welcomes all of our attention, said Marshall. Especially if you have a fistful of dollars, I added. Strippers. Excellent, said Todd, another guest. What time are they showing up? I told them. We decided to bring the strippers in around ten. Two hours before we set sail. That would give the guests some play time. Whether or not any one of them got laid was up to them. The women we'd hired were supposed to be discreet, which I why I'd paid a lot more than one might normally for exotic dancers. In the meantime, help yourselves to whatever you want, and if you need anything, let me or one of my crew know, I said. 
What if what I want is in the galley, said Simon. Sorry, man, Ransom said, noticing Marshall's darkening expression. Once he sets his mind on something, he won't stop. This time he has no choice, said Marshall, smiling coolly at Simon. Nobody is touching Ridley. Nobody but Marshall, I thought in amusement. I wasn't blind to the fact that he had the hots for her. But I knew he respected boundaries, and Ridley had been very adamant about where hers were. I didn't blame her either. Her last boyfriend was obviously a loser, and she wasn't ready to jump into bed with anyone. Simon's eyes widened and then he chuckled. Oh, now I get it. You've got the hots for her, too. I'm sorry. I'll back off. She's all yours. I don't have the hots for her, Marshall sputtered. I mean, obviously she's a beautiful woman. But she's here on business, and I'm just trying to make sure nobody harasses her or Mia. They were both a little anxious about doing this party, I said, adding to the fact. Obviously, Simon was a character who was used to getting his way. And we don't want to antagonize them. Exactly, so keep your distance, Simon, said Ransom, who was also beginning to look irritated. Chill out, said Simon, smiling. I'm messing. You know me, right, Ransom? Yeah. I do, he said, staring hard at him. Okay, it's getting too serious in here, said another of Ransom's friends, Thane. I say we break out the cards and play some poker. Ransom relaxed and grinned. Let's do it. We left the dining room and headed to the salon, where the poker tables were set up. There we spent the next couple of hours playing cards and gambling. 33. Mia. I took a short nap and then jumped into the shower. Afterward, I put on a clean uniform and texted Ridley. We met in the hallway and headed back toward the galley, passing the salon on the way. The smell of cigars drifted through the doorway, and from the noise inside, it was obvious that the guys were having good time. Sounds like they're having quite a blast in there, said Ridley as we walked away. Yeah. And it's still early. I have a feeling tonight is going to be just nuts, she said. I overheard one of the servers mention that the strippers are boarding around ten. Good to know, I said dryly. We can make ourselves scarce. I agree. It wasn't as if we hadn't known what we were getting ourselves into. We knew. But what I hadn't expected was the spark of jealousy I felt when I thought about Damien being surrounded by strippers. We spent the next couple of hours preparing dinner. Every once in a while, Damien or Marshall would check in with us to see how we were doing. Stop worrying about us, I told Damien, the second time he stopped in. Ridley was in the bathroom, and it was just the two of us. And go have some fun. I am having fun, he said, reaching over and grabbing my butt. See. Laughing, I slapped his hand away. Stop, I whispered. Someone is going to notice. I don't care, he said, pulling me closer. Let them see. I raised my eyebrow. I thought you were concerned about the guests finding out about us. I'm more concerned that one of them will try and touch something that doesn't belong to them. What do you mean? He leaned down and began nibbling on my ear. You. You're mine. Nobody else can have you. I chuckled. Is that right? Hell yeah, he whispered against my skin, making me shiver. Can I visit your cabin later? Will that be before or after the strippers arrive? I asked, trying not to sound catty but knowing that's exactly how I was acting. Damien didn't seem to notice. After. Only because I need to keep an eye on things. I bet, I said dryly. He tilted my chin up and stared into my eyes. 
I am not at all interested in the strippers. Honestly, if I could send everyone home right now, I would. Even Ransom. I smiled in pleasure. Really? Yes, he said, dropping his hand and placing it on my hip. In fact, I don't think I can wait until tonight. Do you have time to steal away for a few minutes? No, I whispered, eyeing the doorway. I knew Ridley would be back any second. We're about ready to get things out to the dining room. Okay. We made plans to meet at my cabin around 8.30. I'll be there, I replied, looking forward to it. Damien gave me another kiss and then took off. A few seconds later, Ridley walked back into the galley, looking irritated. What's wrong? I asked. Nothing, she said, not meeting my eyes. Are you sure? She let out a ragged sigh. I ran into Simon. Or rather, I should say, he was waiting for me outside of the galley. Noticing that she didn't look very happy to have bumped into him, I asked what had happened. He came on to me. I was a more surprised at the fact that she looked irritated. I thought you liked him? Not anymore. He's a jackass. What did he do? He backed me into a corner and started telling me how gorgeous I was and how he couldn't get me out of his mind. Then he asked if he could just have one little kiss. That doesn't sound so bad, I said, although I would have told him where to go. Ridley, on the other hand, thought more of Simon than I did. She smirked. That's what I thought. At first I was like, okay, why not? He's hot and famous. Who's to say that I'd ever get the chance again? But then I heard your voice in the back of my head, and immediately felt guilty. So you do listen to me sometimes, I teased. Ridley grinned. Yeah. Of course I do. Anyway, after he started kissing me, I tried breaking free but he wasn't having any of it. Then his hands were everywhere and, she scowled, that's when I got really angry. I would have too. What a prick. Exactly. Anyway, I had enough so I need him in the balls, she said. Hard. I raised my eyebrows. And he let you go. Oh yeah. He called me a couple of names at first, but then left. We should tell Damien, I said angrily. No. I just want to let it go. Anyway, it was my fault. I let him kiss me. I groaned. Would you quit blaming yourself? Every time someone assaults you, you make it your fault. It's not. The guy is a scumbag and should be dealt with. I know he is, but nothing else happened. I took care of the problem myself. But what if he... She interrupted me. Look, I didn't even want to tell you because I knew you'd react this way, Ridley said loudly. I'm fine, okay? I'm fine, and I don't want to ruin Ransom's party because of that jerk. I let out a ragged sigh. Okay. Fine. Just promise me that if he tries touching you again, you'll speak up. If he tries touching me again, I'll scream so everyone knows about it. Okay. I picked up a cleaver. Actually, just carry one of these around so that you're not the one screaming. She laughed. 34. Damien. Dinner was served buffet style again. There were huge platters of Alaskan king crab legs, walleye, butterfly shrimp, and barbecue ribs. For the sides, the girls had made an assortment of hearty selections including lobster mac and cheese, au gratin potatoes, and green beans with bacon. If we keep eating this way, I'm going to be too tired to party, said Thane, filling his plate. No shit, said Reed, who stood between us. I can't remember the last time I ate this well. 
Sinclair isn't much of a cook? Thane asked. She's an excellent cook. It's just that she doesn't like doing it. So we eat out a lot, Reed answered. Sarah's a great cook and enjoys it, said Thane. I'm a lucky man. Sounds like you're both pretty lucky. How did you meet your wives? I asked them. Listening to the two of them talk about their wives reminded me that it was possible to have a successful marriage. It's a long story, said Reed, smiling. But one that's very interesting, said Thane. Sinclair was dating his brother. My eyebrow shot up. They weren't really dating. Jess is gay, explained Reed. For some reason, he decided that he needed a date for my parents' anniversary party. A female one. Anyway, through a series of unfortunate events, we hooked up and eventually fell in love. Unfortunate events? I repeated, wanting to hear more. Exactly what he said. Unfortunate events, said Thane. The kind that ends up on the news. Now that sounds fascinating, I said, thoroughly intrigued now. What in the hell happened? It's a long story. If you're interested, I'll tell you about it. I just have to be sitting down, he joked. That bad, huh? I said, chuckling. He chuckled. Yeah. You can't write this shit type of bad. Okay then. What about you, Thane? I met my wife at work. Coincidentally, she also had a lot of baggage before moving to California. Baggage that almost got her killed too, said Reed. I looked at both of them in disbelief. This is getting more interesting by the minute. How do you two know Ransom? Our wives used to work with Tiffany. His fiance, said Reed. Actually, so did Thane. Until he married Sarah. You were a hairstylist? I asked, not picturing it. Thane was rugged, muscular, and hard looking. I couldn't imagine him standing behind someone and asking if they wanted high or low lights. No. I just own the place, he replied. Sarah runs it now, since I'm too busy with my gym. Oh, you own a gym? I said, thinking that made more sense. Yeah, he replied. Thane used to be a fighter, said Reed. What kind? I asked. MMA, Thane replied. That was a few years ago. Now I just train others interested in the sport. Good to know. We might need your help if Simon gets out of hand later, I joked. Yeah, he gets worse when he drinks too, said Reed. Great, I said, noticing that Simon was barely eating anything. The fact that he was snorting coke also meant that he probably wouldn't be passing out anytime soon either. We took our food to a table, and I got to know Ransom's friends a little better. By the time I was finished clearing my plate, I had a lot of respect for Thane and Reed. I'd love to meet your wives someday, I said, getting ready to leave. They're obviously fascinating women. We'll have to get together the next time you're in California, said Reed. Most definitely, said Thane. I'm looking forward to it. I looked at my watch. It was time to check in with Mia. I've got to go and take care of a few things. Help yourselves to more food or beer. I'll be back in an hour or so. They both thanked me. I checked in with Ransom to let him know I had some things to take care of. No problem. If you run into Mia or Ridley, tell them we're thoroughly impressed with the food, he said, sitting back in his chair. I'm stuffed but I can't seem to stop eating. I have a feeling I'll be bumping into one of them. Help yourselves to anything you want. I'll be back. Will do. Thanks again, he said raising his bottle of beer. You're an awesome host. Only when I want to be, and you're worth it, I said. 
I appreciate it, bro, he said and took a drink of beer. On my way out, I pulled Marshall aside and told him that I was going to be unavailable for the next hour. Why, he asked bluntly. I've got some business to take care of. If you need anything, send me a text, I said. Sure. Running a hand through my hair, I left the dining room and hurried to Mia's cabin. I knocked on the door rapidly and waited for her to answer. It seemed like it took forever for Mia to open it. When she did, I found it was worth the wait. Hello there, I murmured, staring at her lustfully. She changed out of her uniform and was wearing nothing but a small white robe. Hello, she said, smiling at me. I wasn't sure you were coming. I stepped inside and closed the door behind me. Oh, I will be. Right after you. Mia smiled. 35. Mia. After making love, we somehow got into the subjects of pregnancy and kids. I know you're not looking to have kids right now and Lord knows I'm not. I've already got one who thinks I'm a jerk. I'm sure he doesn't think you're a jerk, I said, watching as Damien began to dress. He hates me for leaving his mother. I don't exactly blame him. What is that supposed to mean? I said, wondering if he still loved her. The thought made my stomach sour. He's just a kid. He doesn't understand. All he knows is that his parents were together and now they're not, Damien replied. I'm sure he must have known that you two fought a lot. We tried keeping it from him, but I'm sure he was aware that we weren't getting along. Kids were always aware. Their parents were the most important people in their lives, I thought, thinking of my own. You don't regret leaving Marissa, do you? He looked at me like I'd said the most absurd thing in the world. No. Not at all. I only regret not being a better father for him. I should have been around more. You were busy earning a living, I said, thinking about his baseball career. It's not like you were screwing around. Yes, but... I didn't try hard enough to keep him close. Hell, maybe I should have hired a traveling nanny. You did your best under the circumstances, I said, not knowing what else to say. Maybe he could have tried harder. I had no idea. Just think, though, you have a second chance to make things up to him. Don't wreck it. He smiled at me. Mia, I can tell you're the type of person who's always trying to build others up, but without sugarcoating things. I have the utmost respect for you. And I have the utmost respect for you, I said, feeling suddenly as if he was about to break it off with me. I don't know what's going to happen after this weekend, but I want you to know that I haven't felt this way in a long time. Seriously. I relaxed. And how is that? His face lit up. Like I'm a teenager again. All I want to do is stay here and mess around with you all night. I smiled back. I wish you could too. His phone began to vibrate. It's Marshall. He read the text and grunted. Looks like the entertainment has arrived. I rolled my eyes. How thrilling. He looked amused. You're not jealous, are you? No. Of course not. Good. I don't know what any of them look like, but nobody is as beautiful or as sexy as you are, Mia. Not to mention classy, intelligent, with amazing culinary skills. Face it, you're every guy's dream. I couldn't help but smile. I am, huh? Mine at least. And that's all that matters. Flattery will get you everywhere. He smiled wickedly and crawled back over to me. You know, I think Marshall can handle things for a little while longer without me. I grinned.
36. Damien. Where have you been? asked Marshall as I met him in the salon. In my office, I lied. Sorry, I lost track of time. I heard the strippers are here, said Simon, looking delighted as he and the others entered the room. I heard that too. So where are they? I asked Marshall. They're getting ready, he said, and then nodded toward the entrance. That's Big Al over there. One of the three bodyguards they arrived with. I looked over and noticed the thick-necked Neanderthal silently watching everyone. He stood a head taller than most of us and had to wait four bills. We nodded to each other. How many girls did they send over? I asked Marshall. Six, he replied. Good. That's what I ordered, I said, and then walked over to where Ransom was seated. How's is everything going? Fantastic, he replied, looking relaxed. Where's your beer? I asked, noticing that his hands were empty. He nodded toward the bar, where Simon was now talking to the bartender I'd hired. He's ordering me a drink. Good. Just let me know when you're ready for that cigar, I said. Maybe as we're pulling out of the harbor, he said. Sounds like a plan. I've got a special one with your name on it. One from Cuba. I think you'll like it. I'm sure I will, he said as music began to play. I grinned. Looks like the entertainment is about to start. Yeah. Thanks a lot for that, he said dryly. Chuckling, I patted him on the back. Don't be afraid. They are only women. What kind of damage could they possibly do? Thirty minutes later we found out just how much. Ransom was seated in the middle of the room with his hands behind his back, while a heavily endowed woman slapped him silly with her breasts. It was more comical than anything. I think he's going to cry, said Simon, who was laughing hysterically at the display. You're next, growled Ransom, not appearing to be enjoying himself. Gladly. Bring those cannons over here, said Simon, holding up a hundred-dollar bill. I could use a good beating. I agree, said Ransom, turning the stripper around gently. Go get him, doll, and don't hold back. Giggling. The young woman began dancing her way over to Simon. You okay? I asked Ransom as he ran a hand over his face. That hurt like hell, he said, chuckling. It was like getting hit with sandbags. I laughed. Poor baby. Seriously, I think she was punishing me for my last album or something. You try it. No. I'll take your word on it, I said, watching as another stripper made her entrance, this one dressed like a nurse. Oh good lord, said Ransom, as the stripper scanned the room holding a big fake needle, one that looked more like a penis than a syringe. She tries pricking me with that thing and I'm done. I laughed. I sat back, watching in satisfaction as our guests enjoyed themselves. When the show was finally over, and the strippers were safely off of the ship, some of the guys began playing poker again. The ship is about ready to set sail. You ready for that cigar? I asked Ransom. Yeah. Sounds good. We told the others where we'd be, and then Ransom and I walked out onto the deck with cocktails. Well, that was interesting, he said as we sat down. It was definitely entertaining. I think Simon might have gotten lucky with the stripper with the sandbags. Those two disappeared for a while. I noticed. Maybe he'll lay off of Ridley now. Sorry about that, said Ransom, lowering his voice. He can be a real douchebag at times. If he wasn't such a good drummer, I'd replace him. It's fine, I said, and then handed him a cigar. Here you go. This one's a genuine Cuban. Best there is, I hear. 
He took it out of the plastic and smelled it. Thanks, Damien. This thing is going to keep me up all night. It's your weekend. Why waste it on sleeping? He laughed. We lit the cigars up as the ship's engine was started. Soon, we were pulling away from the marina and heading out to sea. So how's your son doing, he asked me. Okay. He'll be here on Monday. How are things with Marissa? We started talking about my ex and all the crap she'd pulled. Ransom had met her once, and although he'd been nothing but cordial, told me later that she'd tried hitting on him. Not a surprise, I replied, disgusted with her. She'd always been a flirt, and I'd thought it to be innocent. I'd been so wrong about her. You seeing anyone now? He asked. I thought about Mia and smiled. Maybe. What does that mean? I shrugged. It's complicated. I wasn't sure what was going to happen between us. I certainly wasn't ready to give her up anytime soon. It can't be as complicated as Marissa. You've got that right. We talked and smoked our cigars until about 2 a.m. Afterward, Ransom headed to his cabin, and I checked in with the captain and crew. How was your little party? Charles asked when first arrived on the bridge. It was crazy but manageable, I replied. You didn't pop in for a lap dance. I was hoping to see you. He chuckled. No. That would have worn me out. I need all my wits about me if I'm to be responsible for this ship. I understand. I'm grateful to have you aboard, I said as my cell phone began to ring. Curious as to who was calling me so late, I pulled it out but didn't recognize the number. I'll be right back, I said, leaving the bridge to take the call. No problem, said the captain. I stepped outside and answered the phone, Hello? Mr. Stryker. Listen carefully. I have something that belongs to you. Your son, said a synthesized voice. My stomach twisted. Who is this? I asked angrily. Say hello to your father, instructed the stranger. The next voice that I heard stopped my heart. Hello. Dad, is that you? Jake? I replied, horrified. Are you okay? Where are you? I don't know, he said, his voice breaking. I'm scared. The stranger got back onto the phone. If you want to see your boy alive again, do not contact the police. Do not tell anyone on your ship that we have him, believe me, we'll know. You must keep this to yourself. I could not believe this was happening. If you hurt one hair on his head, I'll kill you. I growled angrily. You are in no position to make threats. I'll be calling you back in thirty minutes. Keep this to yourself or you'll regret it, the stranger said before hanging up. 37. Damien. The call left me nauseated and frightened beyond belief. Who had my child? What in the world was going on? I tried calling the nanny's cell phone, but she didn't answer. I left a voicemail, telling her to call me back. What's going on? I turned around to face Marshall, who was standing behind me, a questioning look on his face. Don't tell anyone on your ship. I trusted Marshall. He was my cousin, and always had my back. Did you happen to hear any of my conversation? I asked, trying to clear my head. I wasn't drunk, but not completely sober either. No. Why? He frowned. You look upset. Someone has Jake. They've kidnapped him. His face went white. What? I went over the conversation. 
I don't know what to do, I said, my voice husky. They said to not tell anyone. I don't know if I should call the police or the FBI. Did they ask for a ransom? No, but I'm sure that's next. He is supposed to call me back in 30 minutes. Are you sure it was Jake? It sounded like him, I replied, although how hard would it be to find someone that could imitate his voice? It was always possible. But you're not sure? I guess I'm not 100% sure, I admitted, running a hand over my face. I did call my nanny, Alice, but she didn't answer her phone. I suppose she could be sleeping. We need more proof that it's him, said Marshall. Have them send you a photo of Jake with today's date and time. Good idea, I said, trying to stay calm. Do you think I should call the police? If these guys really have him, and they're ordering you not to, I wouldn't make any calls to them. Not yet, anyway. If I were you, I'd wait for more proof and find out what they want. We'll go from there. I let out a ragged sigh. Okay. In the meantime, give me the phone number. I have someone who can trace it. Chances are, if these guys know what they're doing, we won't get anything useful out of it, but it's worth a shot. I gave him the number. I'll call my friend. It's late, but hopefully he's near his phone. Thanks, Marshall. He stood up straighter. Hey, what about Kendall? Isn't she supposed to be staying at your house? Yes, I replied, pissed at myself for forgetting. I dialed her number. She didn't answer, either. I just sent her a text, said Marshall. Hopefully one of us will get a hold of her. Thirty minutes later, we'd made no progress in trying to figure out who'd called, or whether or not they really had Jake. Neither Kendall nor Alice returned our calls either. Maybe we should turn the ship around? I said, pacing back and forth. No. This might be a hoax. Don't do anything rash. I nodded. Hopefully, this was nothing but someone trying to scam me out of money again. When the alleged kidnapper called back the second time, it was from a different phone number. Mr. Stryker, are you ready for your instructions? said the voice, still using some kind of synthesizer. First of all, I need proof that you really have my son, I said coldly. I want a picture of him, with today's date written on a sheet of paper. Otherwise this call is over. Very well. We'll give you what you want. Then you will give us what we want. The person hung up. Now that worried me. The alleged kidnapper hadn't even hesitated. He was definitely going to provide me with something. Please don't let it be Jake. Did your friend get back to you yet? I asked Marshall, still pacing back and forth in my office. No, he replied. I'm still waiting. I stopped and rubbed the bridge of my nose, trying not to lose it. There were so many emotions running through me. Not only was I angry and frustrated, but I felt utterly helpless. I can't believe this is happening. Remember, this could just be someone screwing around. They might not have anyone, reminded Marshall. Whether it is or isn't, I'm going to make their lives a living hell, I said angrily. My phone went off, notifying me that there was an attachment received. My hands shook as I opened it up. No, I moaned, my worst nightmare coming to life right before my eyes. In the photo was my son, wearing his favorite Iron Man pajamas, and holding a sign with today's date and time. There was a look of terror on his face as he stared at the camera, and it broke me. Someone had my son. His life was on the line. Marshall put his hand on my shoulder and squeezed. Don't worry. We'll get him back, he said, his own voice breaking. 38. Damien.
It wasn't long after the kidnapper sent me the photo, proving he had my son, that he called me back. Was that enough proof for you? He asked me. Yes, I said, trying not to lose it. What about Kendall and his nanny? They're unharmed. Where are they? I asked angrily. Back at your house, sleeping comfortably. You really should tighten your security. Snatching him up wasn't very difficult. My eye twitched. I had a security system in place, but it was obviously fallible. What exactly is it that you want? To board your ship. I am going to give your captain some coordinates, and then you're going to allow our helicopter to land without incident. Do you have a pen and paper? Wait, what? You want to board my yacht? I said, looking at Marshall. He frowned. That is what I said. Are you ready for the coordinates? I sat down at my desk and grabbed a pen and paper. The person on the other end of the phone told me the numbers, and then reminded me that if we didn't do what they asked, my son would die. That also means not causing any trouble when my men land. If there is any retaliation, Jake will be the one suffering for it. Do you understand? If it's money that you want, we can turn the boat around, and I'll work on collecting it. I don't see why you need to board the ship. Everything can be done electronically. You have some very precious cargo on board, Mr. Stryker. Yes, we want your money. But you're not the only person on board with access to the kind of cash we require. I realized that this nightmare was just getting started. His plan was to overtake the ship and hold all of us for ransom. I'll give you whatever you want. You don't need to do this, I argued. He ignored me. You'd better get those coordinates to your captain. Oh, and Mr. Stryker, we already have eyes and ears on the ship, so if you try anything, we'll know. My stomach burned with rage. There was a traitor on my ship. Someone who probably knew where my son was right now. I wanted to find the person and torture it out of them. For all future communication, we'll be calling your satellite phone, so have it with you at all times. How did you get that number? I asked. Same way we know everything else about you and your ship. You have exactly two hours to get to our meeting place, and if anyone is missing on the ship, we'll know, he said and then hung up. What does he want? asked Marshall as I stood up. I told him. Marshall's face turned red with anger. Someone on this ship is feeding them information. I nodded. Now it was his turn to pace. My God, it could be anyone. A crew member. One of Ransom's friends. I know. We have to get these coordinates to Charles, first mumbled, heading toward the door. You're not going to let them land, are you? He asked. I turned back around. What other choice do I have, Marshall? He has my son. There's got to be a better way, he replied before following me out. If there is, let me know because I'm out of ideas. 39. Jake. The bad guy, wearing the scary clown mask, hung up the phone and stood up to stretch his arms. Is he going to cooperate? asked Dan, one of the other men holding me prisoner. He, like the two others, had taken off their masks earlier. I didn't recognize them, but there was something about the guy who'd called my dad that sounded familiar. Of course. We have his brat. The clown guy looked at me, and I shuddered. I wanted to run and hide, the mask was so scary looking. It was white, with black rimmed eyes and a toothy, evil smile. Lock him in the bedroom, so I can take this stupid thing off. I didn't even notice you were still wearing your mask, said one of the other kidnappers, chuckling. 
Clown guy flipped him off. Come on, said Dan, motioning for me to get up. Let's go. Trembling, I got up from the couch and he brought me to a bedroom down the hallway. Inside there was a small bed, a nightstand, and a television with a Wii console connected to it. Dan turned around and looked at me. See, this isn't so bad. I want to go home, I said. I was less afraid of Dan than the others. Not only had he been nice to me, but I could tell that he was different. I'd heard one of the other guys call him a retard behind his back, which I thought was really mean. Ignoring my request, Dan leaned down and opened up the cabinet under the television. Look, there's even some games to play if you get bored, he said, pulling out several plastic boxes. Do you like playing Wii, bud? I nodded. Good. I would play with you but my brother won't let me, he said, looking a little upset. I love Mario Kart. It's my favorite. Do you like that game? I nodded. Me too. I can make first place now on all the levels. Can you? I shook my head. He grinned. Don't worry. It just takes practice. That's what my brother always says. With practice and patience, you can do anything. Where is your brother? I asked him. Is he out there? Dan's face darkened. He pursed his lips. I'm not supposed to talk about him or anyone with you. Sorry, I just want to go home, I answered, trying not to cry again. They told me to stop being a baby, or I'd really have something to cry about. I had a feeling they meant they'd kill me. He started biting his nails a nervous look on his face. You can't right now. But your dad will pay us the money, and then you can go home. Okay. All I could do was nod. Good, he said, relaxing. Dan picked up the television remote. Now why don't you play some Wii? I don't want to right now. Okay. You don't have to if you don't want to. Are you hungry, bud? I shook my head. You will be. We'll get something to eat real soon. I'll try talking them into getting you a happy meal, he said with a big smile. Would you like that? I nodded. Good. Where are Alice and Kendall? I asked, frightened of the answer. Quit talking to him, snapped one of the other men, now standing in the doorway. He doesn't need to know all of that, dummy. Dan glared at him. I'm not dumb. Your actions prove otherwise. Now come on. Get out of here before the kid knows all of our names and social security numbers, he said, motioning to Dan. How would he find that out, asked Dan. The other man sighed in irritation. Just forget it. Dan looked at me one more time and then left the room. Do what you're told and keep your mouth shut, kid, said the other guy. Then he closed the door and locked it from the outside. 40. Damien Marshall and I headed up to the bridge. There, we explained what was happening to Charles and Jeff. Like us, they were both shocked and horrified. Did you contact the police? asked the captain. No. They made it very clear not to, said Marshall. So what? They don't have to know, said Jeff. You have to call them. They'll find out. The asshole on the phone told me that they have both eyes and ears on the ship, I said angrily. I can't take any chances. Do you have an idea of who it could be? asked Charles. No. It could be anyone. One of Ransom's friends. A crew member. Hell, I have no idea, I muttered, my mind spinning with the many faces on the ship. It's certainly not me, said Charles. Me neither, said Jeff. 
The idea that someone is watching our every move is frightening. You two never crossed my mind. I trust you, I said. I'd known both of them now for almost two years. I couldn't imagine them being involved in something like this. As far as the other crew members, I hired them through a reputable company, but that didn't mean anything. Then there were Ransom's friends, along with Ridley and Mia. I dismissed the idea right away that the girls were involved. Not only had I approached them about catering the party, but I trusted Ridley's brother, Michael, without a doubt. So, are you going to let them on board? asked Charles. I don't think I have any other choice, I replied. They have my son. By letting them on board, you're risking much more than your son's life, Charles replied sternly. Everyone else is on this ship. I realize that, but what in the hell am I supposed to do? I said, running a hand through my hair in frustration. Why don't you try making some demands of your own? I mean, you know when the passengers and crew find out that you allowed this, they're going to flip out. You might see some lawsuits in the future, said the captain. And that's if they survive. My head was spinning. He was right, I knew he was. The thought of losing my son was terrifying, however. I'd rather lose my fortune. He was very firm on boarding the ship. He mentioned that it wasn't just my money that he was after, I replied. Okay. I have an idea. We allow them on board and try to take them, said Jeff, lowering his voice. That's what we do. With the security, and... We can't do that, I snapped. Jake will die if we mess this up. He's right, said Marshall. And it's not like they're going to risk bringing Jake on board. If you take the guys that land, you're going to anger the man in charge, and who knows what kind of a lunatic he is. This is all about money. Do what they ask. Pay them the money they're going to ask for. And then we get Jake back. You hope that's what happens, said Jeff. We might all die after they get paid. So could the boy. Yes, I understand that, I said tightly. But what other choice do I have? What would you do? Jeff didn't have any children, so he couldn't really relate. Anyone who loved their kids would do whatever it took to get them back in a life or death situation. How much do they want? Did they say? asked Jeff. Not yet. I'm sure it's an outlandish amount, though. The problem is that I don't have large sums of cash on hand, I said. The majority of my money is tied up in securities, investments, and property. You don't have any cash to wire right now? asked Marshall, looking concerned. I do, but who knows what these guys will be asking for, I said, terrified of the possibilities. I still think you need to tell the others what is happening, said Jeff. Actually, I don't know if that's a good idea, said Marshall. They're bound to panic. Jake means everything to us. But to guys like Simon and maybe even Ransom, your son's life isn't worth more than theirs. You're asking for trouble if you don't prepare them, argued Jeff. I knew he was right. I just didn't think it would benefit my son's life, to inform them. My satellite phone began to ring. I stiffened up. It had to be them. Hello. It appears that you have a real dilemma on your hands, Mr. Stryker, said the synthesized voice. If you want my advice, I'd keep our arrival a secret. You know as well as I do that once the other guests find out about this, they're going to demand that you not let us land. If that happens, I guarantee you'll never see your son alive again. Enraged that he'd somehow been listening in, I stared around the bridge, wondering where they'd planted the bug. What about their lives? I growled into the phone. I have no interest in killing anyone, as long as my demands are met. You have my word. Right. The word of someone who uses children to extort money from people. 
What are your demands, exactly? How much do you want? I asked. You'll find out soon enough. By the way, you were right. We wouldn't be foolish enough to bring your son on board, and if you trying taking us, Jake will die. And it will be a very, very painful death. Screw this up and I'll send you the video of him paying for your stupidity, he said, and then hung up. I shuddered at the idea of my son being tortured and filmed. Did he give you an amount? asked Marshall. No, I said. But he's listening to every word we're saying. Someone's planted a bug here on the bridge. Jeff's face turned white. I didn't think that was possible. Aren't we too far out to see? I'm sure that whatever they're using to record our conversation is being relayed via satellite, I replied. Or they'll be losing reception very soon. What exactly did he say? asked Marshall. I relayed the conversation. They will kill him if we don't do what they ask. Then they'll send me a video of it. Unable to look at them, I turned toward the ocean waves. I have to let them on board. Jeff sighed. I guess we don't have any other choice. I don't want to be responsible for your son being murdered. None of us do, said the captain. If there's no other choice, there's no other choice. I felt sick to my stomach. I turned around. Charles, how long will it take for us to get to the coordinates I gave you? About 90 minutes, said Charles. I nodded. Let's do it. 41. Mia. It was around 3.30 in the morning when I heard someone enter my cabin. I sat up quickly and breathed a sigh of relief when I found that it was only Damien. Don't tell me, I said, yawning as he turned on the light. You're feeling frisky again? No. Mia, something has happened, he said, sounding upset. The look on his face frightened me. What is it? Someone has kidnapped Jake, and they're going to be landing on the ship very soon. My heart stopped. What? Are you serious? He began to pace. Dead serious. Damien then went into what had happened and showed me the picture of his son. My eyes filled with tears as I stared at Jake. He looked so frightened. What are you going to do? I asked, horrified. We're going to let them land. There's no other option for me, obviously. I understand, I said, willing to put aside my own fears if it meant that his son wouldn't be killed. What can I do to help? Nothing really, he said, but then pulled out a piece of paper and held it out to me. We've come up with a plan. Jeff is going to take you and Ridley out of here, using the speedboat. Get dressed quickly and then get her up. Don't speak out loud about any of this. They've bugged the ship. Meet me in ten minutes down below in the garage. My eyes widened. Garage. I grabbed a pen and asked him about it. That was one part of the tour we'd obviously missed. He wrote down that it was near the engine room and explained how to get there. So just stay in your cabin, he said, for the benefit of the kidnappers who might be listening in. And hopefully all of this will blow over easily. I can't believe that this is happening. I threw my arms around him. Are you going to be okay? I whispered into his ear. Don't worry about me, he said, his voice shaky. I'll be fine. I kissed him, and we hugged tightly for several seconds. I have to go, he said, kissing me again. Okay. Damien released me and left the cabin. My stomach in knots, I quickly put on a pair of blue jeans and a white boat neck top. I then checked my phone for a signal. There was a slight one, so I sent Ridley a text. He hadn't said anything about texting, 
and I couldn't imagine that the kidnappers were sophisticated enough to read messages on my phone, if that was even possible. Me, are you awake? After a minute, she sent me a text back. Ridley, I am now. What's up? Me, Jake's been kidnapped. Damien wants you and I off the ship, because they're letting the kidnappers aboard. Ridley, what? Me, get dressed quickly. Grab what you can. Meet me out in the hallway in five minutes. Also, the yacht has been bugged. We can't talk out loud about this. Ridley, OMG. Okay. I grabbed my carry-on and shoved my purse, along with a few other items inside, including the pepper spray that Michael had given me. I didn't think I'd need it, especially if we were leaving. But one never knew. I zipped the bag up and then headed out into the hallway. A few seconds later, Ridley stepped outside of her cabin. I can't believe this, she whispered, looking frightened. I put my finger to my lips. She cringed and nodded. We hurried down to the garage and found Damien and Jeff preparing the speedboat. The captain had stopped the ship and it looked like water was being pumped in from the ocean to make the vessel float. It seemed very James Bondish. As impressed as I was, my excitement was overshadowed by the fact that Jake's life was in serious danger. I still wasn't sure whether or not I wanted to leave or stay. Be careful, I mouthed to Damien as he helped me get into the boat. Nodding, he brushed his lips against mine and held me for a couple of seconds. I was suddenly struck with the horrific realization that it was possible that I'd never see him again. Maybe I should stay, I whispered. Absolutely not, he whispered back. But? Don't argue with me. Please. There's no time. Sorry. He nodded. I sat down, my heart heavy for him and Jake. I said a silent prayer, hoping that if there was a god, he'd take care of them both for me. Ridley got in next to me and sat down. Jeff shook Damien's hand and then jumped inside with us. He started the engine, and then both men quickly untied the boat. Afterward, we watched as Damien opened up the garage door. I waved goodbye, and he gave me a reassuring smile. I could see the fear in his blue eyes, however, and wanted to jump out of the boat. He needed comfort, but was a very stubborn man. He definitely wouldn't accept it right now especially from me. I also knew that having three less people to worry about would be somewhat of a comfort by itself. He was risking quite a bit to make sure that we'd be safe. Jeff maneuvered the boat out of the floating garage. I turned around and watched as the door closed behind us, a feeling of dread in the pit of my stomach. Please keep him safe. 42. Damien. After closing the garage door, I pumped out the water and then called Charles, giving him the go-ahead. We began moving again, and I made my way back to the bridge. Did you get something to eat? asked Marshall, who I noticed was now wearing a brown leather bomber jacket. I nodded. It was code for, did the girls get off safely? We're going to be cutting it close, Getting to the coordinates on time, said Charles. Then kick it down, I told him. Okay, he replied, and then powered the engines to full throttle. I looked at Marshall. Everything good on your end? He nodded. I'd asked him to wake the security guards we'd hired to let them know what was happening. Their orders were to give up their weapons unless we signaled them otherwise. Hey, said Marshall. I looked at him. He nodded toward the exit, and I followed him outside. Marshall leaned toward me. You carrying? Nodding, I pulled up my pant leg where my Glock was holstered to my ankle. Good. 
Me too, he said, opening his jacket. Marshall had always been a gun fanatic. He had an entire safe full of them, and had gotten his carry and conceal license a few years back. I'd goaded him about it, but would never again. You just never knew what life would throw at you, and this was definitely an eye-opener. What are you two doing up so early? Called a gravelly voice. We both turned around and saw Ransom heading toward us. He was wearing sweats and a t-shirt promoting the Goo Goo Dolls. I forced a smile to my face. We can't sleep. Too much nicotine, I'm thinking. Yeah, I think that's my problem too, said Ransom, stopping next to us. He yawned. Those Cuban cigars are strong. Did you get a chance to have one of those bad boys, Marshall? Ah, uh, no. I'm just one of those people who never sleeps. That's too bad. I usually sleep like a log, Ransom said, as the wind whipped his hair around. He motioned toward the waves. So, I noticed that we're moving pretty quickly. Are we in a rush to get somewhere? I thought, this was supposed to be a slow ride this weekend. Marshall and I looked at each other. I gotta tell him, I said, feeling guilty. My cousin frowned. Tell me what, asked Ransom. I quickly went over everything, and after I was finished, his ears were steaming he was so pissed off. Those bastards. Do you have any idea of who they are? He asked, after I showed him the picture of Jake they'd sent. No. I replied, and then an image of the YouTuber punk kid came to my mind. I brushed him aside, however. He had money, and I really couldn't see him as a kidnapper. Just another sociopath who thrived on attention and was getting paid well to be destructive. I think it's someone who's been planning this for a while, said Marshall. And they obviously knew about this weekend. I didn't tell anyone, who was going to be on board. Except for you, I said, looking at Marshall. And obviously, I know you're not behind this. A crew member, asked Ransom. That's what we were thinking, I replied. Or someone in your group, said Marshall. Not that I want to point fingers. These guys are my friends, but that doesn't mean that they kept their mouths shut about this weekend, replied Ransom, frowning. I'm still thinking it's a crew member, I said. Because the place is obviously bugged, and someone would have needed to get on board before we set sail. What about the two caterers? You don't think they were involved at all, do you? asked Ransom. No. They didn't know anything, I replied. And I trust them. Ransom ran a hand over his face. What's the game plan? Are you just going to let them board? I don't know what else to do, I replied, not sure of his reaction. They have my son. Soon they'll have all of us, he replied, staring out at the water. And there's no guarantee that Jake, or any one of us, will get out of this mess alive. Yes. I know, I said grimly. Ransom sighed. I leaned over next to his ear. If you want to bail, I understand. You and your friends can all get off of the ship. We have inflatable life rafts. I'll have the captain stop the ship. And where will that leave you? He asked dryly. Thinking about it, I couldn't imagine that letting Ransom and his buddies go would change much. And who was I to play around with their lives? I had to believe that they wouldn't kill Jake if there was still a chance to get funds from me. And with a few hours and a couple of phone calls, I could get them enough to flee the country and live the rest of their lives very comfortably. We'll be fine, I said. Marshall frowned. Are you sure about this? My son means the world to me, I said. But who am I to gamble with the lives on board this ship? If anything happened to you, Ransom, I know it would kill Tiffany. I can't do that to her. It wouldn't be right. Every life matters on this ship. 
Ransom stared pensively toward the ocean again without saying anything. We need to wake the others. I looked at my watch. We're running out of time. If we're going to do this, it has to be now. Okay. Get my friends off of the ship. I have to believe that none of them are in on this. I've known most of them for years, he replied. Some of them are wankers, but none of them would stoop this low. I nodded. Sure. I'll let the captain know. I'm going to stay on board, he added. I stared at him in surprise. Why? Because if I leave, there's a chance they'll kill your boy. If that happens, I'll never be able to live with myself, he said. Are you sure? I asked, feeling relieved and yet angry at myself for being selfish. His life was worth just as much as Jake's. Especially, to Tiffany. I know you'd do the same thing for me, he said, putting his hand on my shoulder. I would, I replied, meaning it. What about the person who's helping the kidnappers? asked Marshall, after Ransom left us to go wake the others. What if Ransom's wrong, and it really is one of his buddies? I guess we'll find out soon enough, I said. My gut, however, was telling me that it was a crew member. Not only had they known who was boarding my yacht, but when we'd planned on setting sail. In record time, Ransom woke his friends and brought them to the lower deck. Shouldn't you be letting the cops handle this? Reed asked me as we prepared the life rafts. Normally I'd agree but they threatened my son, I said. I can't take any chances. Why in the hell are you staying on the ship? Simon asked Ransom. Because the kidnappers are expecting me here, he replied. So, Simon said with an incredulous look. You could die. I realize that, he replied coolly. Thanks for reminding me. Don't be foolish. Get off with us, said Simon. He nodded toward me. This isn't your battle. It's his. I told him the same thing, I said. As much as I wanted to tell Simon where to go, he was completely right. I'm pretty sure these bastards knew that I'd be on board, and that's why they kidnapped Jake this weekend. As far as I'm concerned, this is my battle too. I'm not leaving Damien to deal with this on his own. We'll get through this together, he said, turning to me. At that moment, I had more respect for Ransom than I'd had for my own grandfather. It wasn't just that the man was trying to help me with my son, it was the fact that he would have done it for anyone. Simon shook his head. I think you're making a terrible mistake. But that's just me. I appreciate your concern, said Ransom with a rueful smile. He patted Simon on the back. Just get your butt on the life raft. What about Tiffany, he said. How do you think she's going to feel about this? She knows me and will understand, Ransom said, although the mention of her name brought a pained look to his face. Simon shook his head in disgust. Heroes don't always win, you know. That only happens in the movies. I'm not trying to be anyone's hero, replied Ransom. Just a friend. The satellite phone began to ring. I answered it. If any of them leave the ship, your son dies, said Jake's captor. My stomach dipped. What are you talking about? Don't play stupid. I told you before, we have eyes and ears on the ship, he replied. You don't need them, I argued. But you do. Listen to me. If any of Ransom's friends leave, you know one of them will go to the police. That's going to screw everything up. They simply cannot leave. They've given me their word that they'll not call the authorities. The man snorted. And you're naive enough to believe them? I looked at Ransom's friends. They understand the seriousness of this situation, I replied, staring toward the group getting ready to leave. 
Just remember that your son's life is in their hands. They leave and the police get involved. I'm going to give you your son back. Starting with his pinky. He hung up. He knows, said Marshall. I nodded. He's not happy about it, either. I looked around at the others. He's threatened to give me back Jake, piece by piece, if the police find out about this. Ransom growled in the back of his throat. The Coast Guard is going to ask questions if they see these life rafts, said Marshall, frowning. That's it. I'm staying, said Reed. I'd rather take the chance of dealing with these douchebags than fleeing like a coward and finding out that Jake paid for it later. Me too, said Thane. Fortunately, most of Ransom's friends were willing to stay on the ship. The only one who argued about leaving was Simon. It didn't exactly surprise me. You're not seriously leaving, are you? said another of Ransom's bandmates, Mark. You do realize that Damien's son might die? Simon rolled his eyes. Don't be so dramatic. Anyway, they're not going to kill his son if a couple of us leave. They've got too much invested in this, obviously. They're just trying to scare everyone. Then leave, I said angrily. Go ahead. Get on the life raft and save yourself. Simon frowned. I can't go by myself. You're going to have to, said Ransom, also looking frustrated. Because it's pretty clear now that the rest of us are staying. He turned to look at the others. Unless I'm mistaken. If you want to leave, now's the chance. Nobody said anything. See. You're on your own, said Ransom, turning back around. I can't operate the life raft by myself, Simon said, looking anxious. To be honest, I have this phobia about the water and sharks. I won't be able to leave on my own. That's your problem, said Ransom. Deal with it. And quickly, I added. We don't have all day. Simon clenched his jaw. This is ridiculous. I never signed up for this. Nobody did, Ransom replied, a look of disappointment on his face. But a little boy's life is on the line, and there is no way in hell that I'm risking that. It amazes me that you are, though. I guess you're not the man I thought you were. Simon let out exasperated sigh. Fine. I'll stay. Ransom patted him on the back roughly. Good. There might just be hope for you yet. For everyone's safety, we sent the guests back to their cabins and told them to stay put until we had more information. Most of them went back to Mark's cabin to offer each other moral support. Meanwhile, Thane and Reed volunteered their help in dealing with the kidnappers. I know a cop who might be able to trace the phone numbers that the calls were placed from, said Reed, when we were back outside on deck. I'm sure the calls were placed using disposable phones, I said. But, if you can find out anything, I'd appreciate it. I'll give him a call, he replied. I have a satellite phone in my suitcase. For emergencies. This would definitely constitute as one. I gave him the numbers I'd received the calls from. I'll see what my friend can come up with, he said. Look, said Thane, as Reed went to call his contact. I don't have any CIA or FBI friends. I'm technically challenged, hell I have never even used an iPad. But I'm good with my fists, and I know how to use a gun. If things get ugly and you need a fighter or sharpshooter, I'm your man. I appreciate it, I said. The guy was definitely in good shape, and from what I'd remembered, an ex-MMA fighter. Ah, that's why Sarah calls you Sniper now, said Ransom. He smiled. We've been spending a lot of time at the shooting range lately. My aim isn't too bad if I do say so myself. That's good. It might come in handy, I said. Just let me know if things are going south and we need to take these guys out, 
said Thane, lowering his voice. I don't want to have to kill anyone, but I'm willing to do what it takes to keep us alive. I appreciate it, I replied, hoping it didn't come to that. I just want to make it home to my wife, he said, his smile fading. We all do, said Ransom. Hell, I want to make it home to make my girl my wife. I sighed. As much as they'd volunteered to stay, the guilt was still eating me up inside. Do you want to call Tiffany before this goes down? No. I thought about it, but she'd get upset and worry. It won't do either of us any good. I nodded and looked at Thane. What about you? You want to check in with your wife? No. I feel the same way. If anything, talking to the girls might cloud our judgment and raise some alarms. Besides, even if I don't tell Sarah the truth, she'll know something is up, said Thane, yawning. She sometimes has this way of knowing things that she shouldn't. Women's intuition? I asked. More like a real psychic ability. It's eerie, he replied. Not to mention that if Sarah and Taffy talk, they're going to wonder why we both called them at this hour, added Ransom. That's true too, I replied. So now what, asked Ransom. I'm going to grab a cup of coffee, said Thane. Anyone else want me to bring one back? I'd like one, I replied. Thanks. No problem, he said before taking off. Marshall reached into his pocket and pulled out a revolver. I think we'd better arm ourselves. Do you know how to use one of these? he asked him. Ransom nodded. Marshall handed him the gun. Good. Hopefully you won't need to, but you just never know. So, what are we going to do about the crew and security team? Ransom asked me. They'll be ordered to give up their guns when the kidnappers show up, I replied in a low voice. I'm sure that we'll all be searched for weapons, said Ransom, staring at his gun. Probably, said Marshall. Still, until that time comes, I'm packing heat. An idea popped into my head. I have an idea. Ransom is right. They're going to frisk us and take away our weapons. I think we shouldn't give them the opportunity. Let's hide the guns strategically around the ship. At least some of them. Then, if we need to arm ourselves, we'll have some options. Excellent idea, said Marshall, his eyes lighting up. We'll get the security team involved, too. Right. And have them put on their civilian clothes. We'll make them appear like regular guests, I replied. Good plan, said Marshall. We rounded them up and relayed our plans. Although they weren't excited about giving up their weapons, they agreed that hiding them was the most sensible idea. Not all of them, I added. It would definitely cause suspicion. Everyone agreed. The eight of us walked the ship together and hid them in different spots. Afterward, we held a meeting with the rest of crew and updated them on what was happening. Most had already heard the news. I'm sorry to put you in this position, I told them, looking around. Besides the captain and the security team, there were ten crew members on board. The only thing that I can say is we'll do everything in our power to keep you safe. Don't worry, Mr. Stryker, said Jennifer, one of the housekeepers. We have faith in you and are all praying that you'll get your son back. I appreciate it, I said, wishing that I had as much faith in my abilities as she did. After the dismal meeting, I went back up to the bridge, still wondering if allowing the kidnappers to board the ship was going to be a tragic mistake on my part. Everything good? asked the captain. I let out a ragged sigh. As good as it can be, under the circumstances. How are we doing on time? We should arrive at our destination on schedule, he replied. Okay, 
I said, staring off into the distance. Damien, how are you doing? I wanted to tell him that I was scared as hell. That I didn't know if I was doing the right thing by putting all of these people's lives in danger. But the image of my son flitted through my mind again. The terror on his face as he stared at the camera. He needed me, and I had to be strong for him, as well as everyone else on board. Confident that we're going to get my son back and all make it through this ordeal, I replied. At least, that's what I need to believe if I'm going to keep my sanity. He gave me a sad smile. You'll get him back. We're all betting on you. I appreciate your support on this, I replied. I'm asking so much of you. Too much. When it comes to keeping Jake alive, there's nothing you couldn't ask me that I wouldn't be willing to do. He's a good kid and is meant for great things. Someday he's going to learn just how much of a hero his father was, both on and off the baseball field. Too choked up to answer, I nodded and smiled at the older man. 43. Mia. It was a chilly ride. Ridley and I hadn't dressed properly for the trip back to the mainland, so both of us were shivering. Eventually, we wrapped our arms around each other, and kept our heads down. After about 30 minutes, we noticed our boat begin to slow. What's going on? I asked in a low voice. Look, there's another boat heading our way, said Ridley, standing up. Who is it? I asked as I tried rubbing some heat into my arms. Probably the Coast Guard, said Jeff. What do you think they want? asked Ridley. I'm sure they just want to see what we're up to, he said, cutting the engine. Are you sure it's the Coast Guard? I said, as their light quickly blinded us. Who else could it be? Jeff replied. Good morning, called a voice through a megaphone. Jeff waved. We're responding to an SOS signal. Did you make that call? the man asked. Not us, hollered Jeff. Maybe Damien did, said Ridley, turning to look at me. My heart skipped a beat. If he had, what exactly did it mean? Do you have any weapons on board? the man asked us. No, hollered Ridley. We're unarmed. Are you the Coast Guard? Yes. Even I know that's not a Coast Guard ship, I said, frowning. It was a carver and not labeled as a rescue boat. It's probably unmarked, said Jeff as if reading my mind. Maybe, I replied. The ship drifted next to ours, and I watched as man wearing a black hoodie threw us a rope. Jeff caught it and began tying our boats together. This doesn't feel right to me, I said to Ridley, feeling suddenly very anxious. Nothing feels right to me tonight, she said. Relax, said Jeff. They're just checking things out. If they received an SOS call, they'll want to come on board and search for weapons. Ridley and I looked at each other. After the boats were tied together, the man in the black hoodie went back inside of his boat. What's he doing? I stood back up. Hello. Three other men stepped out of the carver's salon each wearing a terrifying clown mask. My heart stopped. What in God's name is going on? Gasped Ridley as we stared at the men in horror. The three masked guys climbed on board our boat. One of them shook Jeff's hand. Good work and very quick thinking. Jeff smiled. Thanks. I stared at him in shock. He knew these people. I don't understand. What's happening, Jeff? Who are these guys? asked Ridley. Jeff grunted. You still don't get it? She's a blonde. What do you expect? said the clown standing next to him. Recognizing the man's voice, I gasped in shock. No. You've got to be kidding me. 
The clown stared at me, his eyes glittering with amusement. Shaking with rage, I reached over and pulled off the mask angrily. Boo, said John with a sardonic grin. 44. Damien. We arrived at our destination with a couple of minutes to spare. While Charles anchored the boat first stepped outside where Marshall and Ransom were standing. You see anything? I asked Marshall. He had his binoculars out and was scanning the horizon for a chopper. Not yet, he replied. I'm sure they're on their way, I said, zipping up my leather jacket. Have you gotten any other calls from them? asked Ransom. No, I replied. Hopefully, that's a good sign. Hopefully, said Marshall. Does Jake's mother know what's happening? Ransom asked out of the blue. I shook my head. No. She doesn't handle stress well. I'm keeping her out of this for as long as I can. Ransom scratched his stubbly chin. You don't think she's involved? No, I said, although admittedly the thought had crossed my mind once. But I'd brushed it off quickly. I knew Marissa loved Jake and would never put his life in danger. Even for money, which she'd already gotten enough from me through the divorce. I see something, said Marshall. He pointed his finger toward the sky. I grabbed the binoculars and looked. It was definitely a chopper. Let's get up to the helipad, I said, my heart beginning to race. The helicopter circled our boat a couple times and then landed. Four men got out. They were each dressed in black wearing clown masks and holding automatic rifles. What in the hell is this, muttered Ransom. Early Halloween? Apparently, I said in a low voice. Marshall grunted. Hold your hands up in the air, hollered one of the men as they rushed over to us. We raised them. Two of the clowns began patting us down. Not finding anything, they stepped back. My eyes met with Marshall's. Getting rid of the guns had been a wise choice. He winked. What was that about? asked one of the clowns, cocking his gun. Marshall stared at him wide-eyed. What was what? That wink, replied the gunman. I had something in my eye, he answered dryly. You're going to have a bullet in that peeper if you try anything, wise guy, he replied angrily. Marshall raised both of his hands in the air. Do I look like I'm in the position to try anything? No, and that's why you'd better watch yourself, he answered. Where is my son? I asked, getting irritated. Something told me that none of these guys were in charge. Not here, said the gunman who threatened Marshall. Obviously. Where is he? I replied. You'll find out soon, he said. I didn't like that answer, but it didn't surprise me. So what happens now? We wait, said one of the other clowns. For what? I asked, trying not to lose my cool. You'll see, he replied, pulling out a satellite phone. He called someone and informed the person that everything was clear. Where is your security team? asked another of the clowns. We didn't bring one this time around, I lied. Right, he replied. He walked over and held his gun up to my head. I hope they're smart enough not to pull any funny business. I thought that was your job. You're the one dressed like a clown, I replied dryly. He stared at me coldly. Friend, keep talking and I'll blow that tongue of yours out of the back of your skull. Knowing that he had to keep me alive to get paid, I ignored the man. Who's in charge here? Right now I am, he said. And who are you? I muttered. The name is Chuckles. I laughed coldly. How quaint. Tell me what it is you want, Chuckles. 
Have some patience and you'll soon find out. My phone began to ring. You'd better get that, said Chuckles, still holding the gun at my head. I pulled the phone out of my jacket and answered it. Mr. Stryker. You've been a bad boy, said the familiar synthesized voice I'd been dealing with. What are you talking about? I replied, stiffening up. Allowing some of your guests to leave, he said. Tisk. Tisk. Did you really not think I'd find out about the caterers? Shit. This has nothing to do with them, I answered. Maybe not, but you disobeyed my orders. Bullshit. You never said anything about women leaving the ship, I argued. You specifically requested ransom and my guests. They're not guests. He laughed coldly. You know, thinking back, I do believe you're right. Tell you what, I'm going to let it slide, considering that Ransom still appears to be with you along with his buddies. Do you have my son? I asked. You'll find out soon enough, he replied before hanging up. 45. Mia. John, why are you doing this? I asked, still trying to wrap my mind around the fact that the man I once loved could be so heartless. Why do you think, he sneered. The money, of course. Ridley and I had been taken to the carver and placed in the master stateroom. You're risking all of this for money? I said in disbelief. You know that you're going to be caught. Not if there aren't any witnesses, he replied. So you're going to have us killed? I answered, shocked. To be honest, I really hadn't planned on it, but you did take off my mask, he said. My eyes filled with tears. Was he really going to murder us? Who are you? He let out a ragged sigh. Look, Mia, I tried warning you but you wouldn't listen. I begged you not to get on the ship. You mean you lied to me about Damien? I said that if you boarded his yacht, he went on ignoring me, you'd regret it. I was trying to save you because, believe it or not, I still have feelings for you. And yet, you're willing to kill me? I countered, feeling sick to my stomach. John was a madman. He didn't know what love was. This thing is bigger than you or me, he said. I don't want to hurt you, Mia, but there are too many people involved and no room for mistakes. You're such a lying jerk. You don't have feelings for Mia, said Ridley, staring at him with hatred. Mind your own business, he snapped, glaring back at her. This is my business, she said. We're talking about both of our lives. You're dead no matter what, he replied. And to be honest, I'm going to feel good about ending your miserable life, you stupid pathetic bimbo. Ridley's face turned red. I watched in horror as she spit at John, hitting him on the chin. Scowling, he wiped it off with his sleeve and then slapped her hard across the face. She fell down onto the bed and started to cry. John, no. I screamed as he grabbed her by the hair and raised his hand to do it again. Please. She's frightened and upset. You're only going to make matters worse. A vein in his temple throbbed, he was in such a rage. Thankfully, he regained control of himself and let her go. You're lucky I don't kill you right now, he growled, spitting on her cheek. She closed her eyes and continued crying. I quickly grabbed a tissue and moved to her side. As I cleaned her face and tried comforting her, I vowed that whatever else happened, I'd do anything in my power to strike back at John for hurting my best friend. Do you really have Jake's son? I asked, glancing at him. He was staring at both of us, his expression unreadable. Yes, he replied. Is he alive? His lip twitched. For now. I narrowed my eyes at him. If Damien pays you the money, 
are you going to kill the boy? I'm not discussing any more of this with you. You shouldn't even be here, he replied gruffly. But I am, I replied, watching as he moved toward the doorway. John turned around and looked at me. Yes, and now I have to deal with it. 46. Damien. Knowing now that we were waiting on the guy on the phone, I assessed the ones holding us at gunpoint. One of them was anxious and couldn't seem to stop pacing, the other three seemed to keep one eye on us, and the other toward the ocean. When is your boss arriving? I asked, scanning the horizon. It was early morning, and the sun was just beginning to rise. Soon, replied one of them. Go and check the bridge, said Chuckles. See what's going on in there. Make sure the captain isn't radioing for help. He won't, I said. You have my son. Nobody wants to risk his life. Good, he replied, and then turned to his men. Check it out anyway. Two of them left and headed for the bridge. I let out a ragged sigh and looked at Ransom. He'd been quiet the entire time and was surprisingly calm. I sat down next to him. We didn't say anything, but I knew from the look in his eyes that he wasn't very impressed with the morons on the ship. About forty-five minutes later, another yacht approached. A newer carver. It was around forty feet with a command bridge. Other than that, nothing distinguishable. As they drifted closer, I noticed the people standing outside of the salon were also wearing clown masks and black coveralls. I stood up. Looks like it's showtime, I said under my breath. What's with the clown masks? murmured Marshall dryly. Was it buy one get ten free? No shit, I replied. Clowns acting like clowns, said Ransom, shaking his head in disgust. My sentiments exactly, I said. One of the gunmen on the yacht helped tie the ships together. Then I watched as four of them climbed over to our side. The one in front, who I presumed to be the leader, had the most gruesome of all the masks. I had to admit, it was so bad that it almost made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. Only because I knew how terrified Jake would have been in his company. Where's my son? I said to the group. Somewhere safe, replied the leader. I noticed that he was no longer using a synthesizer, but his voice was still muffled from the mask and unrecognizable. I somehow had a feeling that I knew him. What is it that you want? I asked. Money, he replied. Like I said before. How much? Aren't you going to ask me about the other guests that I have? He asked, sounding more amused than anything. I looked over toward the carver. Where are they? I asked, hoping that they were alive. The leader waved his hand toward the boat. A few seconds later, Mia and Ridley were escorted out of the salon. They were alive. I sighed in relief. Where's Jeff? I asked, watching as two gunmen brought the women to my yacht. He chuckled. He's doing just fine. Aren't you, Jeff? One of the clowns removed their mask. It was Jeff. My blood began to boil. You. Why? I snapped angrily. Because I'm sick of rich bastards like you who think they own the world, said my officer on watch with a vehemence that surprised me. Throwing your money around like it's nothing, while the rest of us struggle with bills. You don't seem to be doing too badly, I said, glaring at him. You drive a BMW, and I've heard you talk about your home. If you're struggling financially, maybe you should reevaluate your spending habits instead of committing a felony. Easy for you to say, said Jeff, staring at me with hatred. You were handed your fortune on a silver platter. As far as your baseball career, that's not real work. That's getting highly overpaid to run some bases 
and throw around a ball. At least in football and basketball guys are actually breaking a sweat. At least it was done honestly, said Ransom. Jeff grunted. Don't even let me get started on you, Mr. Hollywood. The only struggles you've ever faced had to do with figuring out which chick to bang, or being sober enough to remember the words to your songs during a concert. Says the man who's involved with kidnapping a little boy, Ransom said, not looking at all bothered by Jeff's words. By the way, I cleaned up my act. You, on the other hand, will have to live with this for the rest of your life, especially if someone gets hurt. Okay, enough of the bullshit, interrupted the clown in charge. We don't have all day. Let's get down to business. I agree, I replied, my head ready to explode. Now who are you and what in the hell do you want? You really haven't figured it out yet, said the leader. The only thing I've figured out is that you're a bunch of clowns and nothing about this is funny, I replied. Humor is definitely not our intent. He pulled off his mask and it was like taking a sledgehammer to the gut. I knew that he was an asshole, but this blew me away. John, what in the hell are you doing? I'm getting paid. That's what I'm doing. Only, I'm going to need a much bigger paycheck to heal my broken heart, since you moved in on my girl. You know him? exclaimed Marshall. I glared at John. Your girl. If I remember correctly, you traded her in for a cheap, trashy bimbo. That's your girl now and very fitting for a scumbag like you. He ignored my dig. You wanted Mia ever since you noticed the picture on my desk. Just like a vulture, you swooped in and played Prince Charming. Looks like you're just as much of a player off of the field as you were on it. I didn't steal anything, I said angrily. You stole my son, and you lost Mia all by yourself because you're a stupid loser who can't handle a woman with more brains than you. The look on John's face gave his next move away. He tried taking a swing at me, but I averted it. Marshall chuckled. Ransom grunted. Humiliated, John tried attacking me. This time I blocked his punch and then put him in a headlock. 47. Damien. Chuckles cocked his gun and screamed for me to let John go. I did what he ordered and then backed away. John turned around. I should kill you, he said, his face red. Then you won't get paid, reminded Marshall. John growled in the back of his throat. She's not worth it anyway, he said, staring at me with hatred. You can have my leftovers. By the way, did I tell you that I also had your ex, Marissa? My eye twitched. He grinned evilly. We still keep in touch. How do you think I found out where to find your son this weekend? Enraged, I launched toward him, but Ransom quickly got between us. Get a hold of yourself, Damien, he said angrily, pushing me backward. This isn't helping anyone. Especially not Jake. Shaking with rage, I dug my nails into the palms of my hands to keep from pounding the smirk off of John's face. Listen to him, warned Chuckles. And calm your shit down or your son will pay for your little temper tantrum. I let out a ragged breath, promising myself that if Jake and I got out of this alive, I'd scour the ends of the earth to find John. I'd make him pay for crossing me. How much money do you want? asked Ransom, turning to John. John reached into the pocket of his coveralls and pulled out two envelopes. He handed one to Ransom and the other to me. I opened mine, and there was a dollar amount, along with the instructions on where to have it wired. Fifty million dollars. You've got to be kidding me, I muttered angrily. I was going to ask for more, but then I knew it would take a lot longer to gather. So I went with what I knew you had on hand, he replied. Are you kidding me? 
I don't have this kind of money on hand. I said angrily. Yes, you do. By the way, did I mention that my associates and I met with your personal accountant last night? Unfortunately, after our meeting, his car went over a cliff. I'm thinking that it had something to do with the brakes, said John, biting his lower lip. He grinned. On a happier note, he did verify that you have enough funds available before his untimely death. You just need to do a little transferring. I stared at him in horror. They'd murdered my accountant? Is this really true? He nodded. Yes, I'm afraid so. If you don't believe me, you might be able to Google it. From what I hear, the media has already gotten wind of it. You're a madman, said Mia, approaching us. Her eyes were red and puffy from crying. That's a little harsh. After all, I was just following orders, said John. In other words, he wasn't the one at the top of the chain. That was even more troubling. That doesn't make you any less crazy, she mumbled. From your perspective, I imagine not. John sighed and looked at me. You have until 6 p.m. to get your funds wired. Don't miss the deadline or your son will die. Before I do anything, I want proof that Jake is still alive. I need to speak with him, I demanded. I figured as much, he replied, reaching into his coveralls. John swore. I'll be right back. I left my phone on the boat. As he walked away from us, Ransom showed me his note. The demand was for ten million dollars. I'll pay you back, I told him. He didn't reply. Damien, said Mia, touching my wrist. I looked at her. Are you okay? I asked, studying her face for bruises. I'd noticed that Ridley had some on hers. I'm fine, she said, her eyes searching mine. I'm so sorry that this has happened. It's all my fault. It's not, I said firmly. Don't blame yourself for any of this. This plan was obviously in the works long before you and I met. He's always been a prick, muttered Ridley. Are you okay? asked Marshall, staring at her face with concern. She nodded. Which one of the bastards did that to you? John, he asked in a low voice. Ridley touched her bruises and winced. Yes. Who else? Is it that bad? It looks painful, replied Mia. I wanted to kill him when he hit you. You and me both, she said, glaring at John who was returning. As far as I'm concerned, he is a dead man, mumbled Marshall. Are we having a powwow over here, or what? Snapped John, frowning at the five of us. We were discussing cowards. You know, the kind who resort to slapping around women to feel powerful, said Ransom. John ignored him. Put the boy on, he muttered into the phone. After a few seconds, he handed it to me. You have twenty seconds. Hello. I said. Dad, is that you? exclaimed Jake. My emotions hit so hard, I had to turn my back on everyone. Just hearing his voice made me want to break down and cry. Yes. Are you okay? Yeah. I just want to go home. I know. Has anyone hurt you? No. When can I go home? He whined. Soon, I said, my voice husky. I love you, Jake. I love you too, Dad. The line went dead before I could say anything more. Letting out a ragged sigh, I handed the phone back to John. He stuck it into his pocket. Now here is the deal, I'm leaving you with my men. You have until 6 p.m. to wire the funds, and no later. How do I know that you're going to release my son? I asked. Because Mia and I are going to go and get him. Aren't we Mia, he said. 
Mia's eyes widened. What? John reached out and grabbed her arm. Let's go. No. Let her stay. Hollered Ridley, coming to life. Mia, don't go with him. He'll kill you. I'm not going to kill her, he said. Unless she gives me reason to. Ridley glared at him. Bullshit. You said there would be no witnesses. She looked at me. I'm sure that means he's going to kill your son, too. You know nothing about my plan, so save your breath, John said angrily. Actually, I heard him say the same thing, said Mia quietly. It was a scare tactic to keep you both quiet, snapped John, looking like he was ready to explode again. Of course we'll let the boy go. That's what this is all about, right? Why isn't he with you now? asked Ridley. It really makes no sense that John left Jake behind in the first place. Unless he's never giving him back. I had to agree. It seemed like a huge waste of time. John turned to Chuckles. Give me your gun. I've had it with this one. She's too much of a troublemaker. No. Please, John, begged Mia, looking panicked. Don't hurt her. I'll go anywhere you want. He stared at Ridley with loathing. Please, Mia repeated, her eyes brimming with tears. I swear to God, I will do anything you ask, just don't kill her. She's like a sister to me. Please. You kill her and you're not getting any money from me, I said, glaring at John. He let out frustrated growl. Fine, but if she says one more word to me, I'm going to make sure it's her last. Come on, Mia. Let's go and get Jake. No. Mia stays, I replied, stepping between them. Two of John's men stepped closer to me, their rifles raised. He gave me a smug smile. See, you seem to keep forgetting that you're not the one calling the shots. I have your son, and trying to play hero to Mia isn't going to benefit him. If anything, it's going to make things much worse. Now before you get him yourself, or Mia for that matter, killed, I'd back up. I stared at her helplessly. Something told me that if I let Mia go with him, it would be the last time I'd see her alive. It's okay, she said, giving me a reassuring smile. I'll be fine. I glared at him. If you hurt her, I'll kill you. John gave me a cold smile. Come on, Mia, he said, pulling her away. Let's go and catch up on things. 48. Jake. There were two of them with me, Dan and another guy they first hadn't seen before. He wore one of the spooky clown masks, and Dan kept calling him Peter. After they let me talk to my dad, I was taken back into the bedroom. You didn't eat all of your food, bud, said Dan, looking into my Happy Meal box. I'd wrapped the half-eaten cheeseburger back up and had only touched a few of the fries. I'm not very hungry. I sat down on the bed and brought my knees to my chest. When can I go home? When your dad sends us the money, he replied. I frowned. How much? One hundred thousand dollars, he said. Do you get some of it? He nodded. Yes. We're splitting it. I'm getting ten thousand dollars. Hey, what did I tell you, idiot? said Peter angrily as he walked into the bedroom. Quit talking to him. Dan's head slunk down. I'm sorry. I keep forgetting. Peter cuffed the back of his head. He gasped. Ouch. That hurt. I swear to God, if you weren't family, you'd be in much more pain than that. Now get out of here. Dan's eyes filled with tears. Silently, he left the room. Peter looked at me. I quickly lowered my eyes. He walked out and shut the door behind him. Relaxing, 
I lay back down on the bed, wishing that my dad would hurry and pay the men the money so that I could go home. After a few minutes, I closed my eyes and eventually drifted off. Sometime later, a loud noise woke me. No, we can't do that, hollered Dan from the other room. Keep your voice down, ordered Peter loudly. You'll wake him. But he's just a... Shut up, growled Peter. But... There was a loud slapping noise, and then I heard Dan crying. I'd never heard a man cry, and it scared me. I'm sorry, said Peter, lowering his voice. But you have to keep yourself together. Feeling anxious for Dan, I got out of the bed and listened at the doorway. I thought we were going to bring him to his dad? Dan asked after several seconds. No. We're not doing anything. In fact, John is on his way for the kid, he murmured. Will he kill him? Whispered Dan loudly. I sucked in my breath. Kill me. Quit worrying about the boy. You'll never see the little turd again anyway. I began to tremble. Were they really going to kill me, after all of this? You said that nobody was going to get hurt, Dan said, sounding upset again. Look, I don't know what's going to happen to him. He'll probably go home. But then again, I don't know for sure. Now, Stop worrying about this kid and think about the money we'll be getting. Think about that new bicycle you wanted. You know, the one that we couldn't afford before. After this week, we could buy you as many as you wanted. One of their phones began to ring. Hey, what's up? asked Peter, his voice much friendlier. I couldn't tell who he was talking to, but he told the person on the phone that he loved them before hanging up. Was that her? asked Dan. Yeah. I don't like her. She's not very nice, pouted Dan. Soon you won't have to worry about her or the kid. By the way, she's heading on over. What if she lets him out? She won't. She just wants to know that he's okay. I frowned. Who was she? Can't you just tell her over the phone, said Dan, so that she doesn't have to come out here? I hate that woman. Peter grunted. Obviously. She's coming over, so deal with it. Just stay out of her way. Dan sighed. Peter let out a long sigh. I'm going outside to have a smoke. Okay. I heard him leave the house so I walked back over to the bed. I still wasn't sure who they were talking about, but she sounded nice. At least about me. The bedroom door opened and Dan walked in. Hey, little guy. You sleep okay? he asked, staring at me with concern. I nodded. I miss my dad. Please don't let them kill me. Dan's face fell. Nobody is going to kill you. My eyes filled with tears. I could tell from the way he was looking at me that he was only trying to make me feel better. Just like my dad had when he told me about divorcing my mother. That's a lie, I said, staring up at him. You're not taking me to my dad. That John guy is going to kill me. Dan looked horrified. He shook his head quickly. No, Jake. Nobody is going to hurt you. In fact, John is going to take you to your dad. Why can't you? I asked him. He was the only person that I trusted. I could tell by the way he acted that he didn't want to hurt me. I just can't. But John will. That's what my brother said. What if John doesn't? Don't worry, bud. He has to. Your dad isn't going to give up the money if John doesn't deliver you to him. That made sense. Okay. Dan looked relieved. See. Nothing to worry about. 
I nodded. Is there anything you need right now? I bit my lower lip. Can I go to the bathroom? Sure. Come on. I got out of bed and followed him to the bathroom. Leave the door open, he said as I walked in. I looked back at Dan. But I have to go number two, and I can't do it if someone's watching. His eyebrows knitted together, and he got that nervous look on his face again. I'll try and hurry up, I promised. Fine, he said and turned on the television. Okay. Thank you. I shut the door and used the toilet. As I was sitting there, I heard him laughing at something that was on the television. When I was done doing my business, I turned on the faucet and washed my hands, thinking about the kidnapper's conversation. I wanted to believe what Dan had said, but I didn't like John or Pete. They were mean and scary. Deep down, I knew that if I didn't find a way to escape, I would never see my dad or mom again. Trying not to cry, I dried my hands with the towel and glanced out the window, surprised that they hadn't boarded it up like the one in my bedroom. All that I could see were the woods surrounding the house. I was a little scared of what might be hiding in them, but more so of the kidnappers. I've got to get out of here, I told myself. I knew that I could fit through the window, and decided that if I was going to escape, I needed to do it before John arrived. I stepped out of the bathroom and noticed that Dan was watching some game show. You all done? he asked, getting up, his eyes still on the screen. I scrunched up my face and bent over. I thought so. My stomach hurts. I think I have diarrhea. He looked over at me and frowned. I think it was something I ate, I said, and turned back around toward the bathroom. I have to go again. Okay, he said. Turn on the fan. I will, I said, closing and locking the door. I turned on the fan and hurried over to the window, knowing that I didn't have much time. I slid it open and stared at the metal screen. Figuring out how to remove it, I did it carefully and as quietly as I could. My heart pounded in my chest as I pulled the screen out and set it on the ground. Trembling, I took a deep breath and was about to hoist myself up, when I heard Peter outside talking to someone that I couldn't see. Frightened, I ducked down quickly. Yeah, we fed him but he didn't eat much, he was saying. Then I heard the sound of the front door opening, as he returned to the house with the visitor. With my heart pounding in my chest, I got back up, looked outside to make sure there wasn't anyone else around, and then pulled myself up to the window ledge. As I was about to crawl through it, someone began pounding on the bathroom door. Hey, you okay in there? asked Peter loudly. Yeah, I said. I just have diarrhea. Great, he said dryly. Well, hurry it up. I'm trying. He didn't reply. Taking a deep breath, I pulled myself out of the window and landed in the grass. Shaking, I stood up and began running toward the woods. 49. Mia. John and I got into the carver while two of his men began untying the boat. When they were finished, one of them jumped into ours. What are you doing? John asked the masked man. Don't you want help? With what? he asked curtly. I'm just going back to base. What about her? he said, nodding toward me. John, who'd gotten his hands on a pistol, held it up in the air. What about her? She's not going to give me any trouble. She knows better. Stay here and make sure those fools get the money sent and that nobody interferes. Okay, he said, and then got out of the carver. Mumbling to himself, John climbed up to the command bridge and started the engine. I stared at Damien as the distance between us grew wider, wondering if we'd ever see each other again. From the look on his face, 
he may have been wondering the same thing. Where are we going? I asked John a few minutes later. Exactly where I said we were going, he replied, staring ahead. He had on a pair of dark sunglasses, and his expression was difficult to read. Back to the mainland to check on Damien's kid. And why am I here? So I can keep an eye on you. I grunted. You really think that I'm a threat? He smirked. No. So then why? Because I know that taking you with me would irritate the hell out of Stryker. I folded my arms under my chest. You must really hate the man, I said, staring out at the ocean. I'm certainly not fond of him, he said dryly. When did you start plotting against him? From the very beginning. Again, I couldn't believe how little I knew of my ex and what he was capable of. Which drew me to my next question. John, are you seriously planning on killing me? He let out a ragged sigh. It's certainly not something that I want to do, Mia. Sorry, but that's not a real answer. Do you really want to know? I let out a harsh laugh. I really can't believe that I'm having this conversation with you. A man who I once trusted with my life. Mia, you've put me in a bind here, he replied. If I were to let you go, the others involved with this would be pissed enough to kill the both of us. Why? Because I could identify you? I asked sarcastically. More or less. What about Damien, Ransom, and Marshall? They know who you are, too. So does Ridley. Pity for them. A chill went down my spine. What does that mean? Are you planning on killing all of us? He didn't reply. So that's it, I said angrily. You're going to take the money and leave no witnesses. What about Jake? Are you going to kill him too? John still didn't answer me. To think that I actually loved you. You have no heart or soul, I said, staring at him with disgust. Believe what you will, but I've never stopped loving you, he said firmly. It's why I tried warning you about this weekend. I didn't want you on this ship. I may have lied about why, but I didn't want things to go down like this. Hell, Mia, I still wanted you back. Not according to Tracy. You two were going on a cruise very soon, if I remember correctly. He sighed. She was a mistake, and then a necessity. What do you mean by that? You'll find out soon enough. I narrowed my eyes. Fine. What about Damien's wife? I asked. You told Damien that you slept with her. Was she a necessity, too? She was business. I didn't sleep with her until after you and I split up, by the way. I frowned. What do you mean? What kind of business would you have with her? I thought that you were Damien's lawyer. I've said enough. No more questions. Why? It's not like I'm going to be around to tell anyone about it, I said dryly. He didn't say anything. Damn it, John, I said frustrated. Say something. I mean, hell, if you're planning on killing me, why wait? Why prolong the inevitable? I'm still trying to mull things over, he muttered. What does that mean? It means that you should quit nagging me and let me try to figure out another way to get you out of this mess. Now that was a surprise. You do that? I asked, not sure whether or not to believe him. You obviously haven't been listening. I love you, Mia. I've never stopped. His words didn't do anything for me. I felt only coldness toward him. But, they certainly gave me an idea. 
I'm not in love with Damien, I said, the words not exactly true. I knew that I was falling for him. Hard. It was even easier now that I'd found out what kind of a monster John really was. He looked at me. I was only trying to hurt you the way that you hurt me. I even knew that you were going to be at the concert that night, I lied. When you saw us together, I wanted you to think that I'd gotten over you. What are you saying? he asked. I swallowed. I'm saying that I still have feelings for you. Even now. Even after everything that's happened. He raised his sunglasses and put them on his head. You know, I'm a lawyer. I can usually see right through people, John said, studying my face. I know you can, I said, grabbing his hand. I stared at him as I brought it to my cheek. So you must know the truth when it's right in front of your face. From the look in his eyes, I knew he still didn't trust me. I let his hand go. We both have a lot to think about. Just remember one thing, you know how much I loved you. We'd still be together if not for... Tracy. I know, he said. And like I said, she was a mistake. One I will always regret. I'm sure you do. I sighed. Getting caught was what he regretted. You know, to be honest. I can almost understand why you're doing all of this, I said, forcing another smile to my face. He's worth a lot of money. Hell, I'm broke. I could use a little of it myself. Play your cards right and maybe you can. I knew that he'd never believe that I'd switch sides so easily. Especially with Ridley's life on the line. What about Ridley? What about her? She's not getting anything from me. The woman is a threat. What if I can convince her to keep her mouth shut? I asked. He grunted. The only way you could pull that off is by sewing it shut. I'm sorry. I love you, but I can't stand her and the feeling is mutual. Right now, there's nothing she wouldn't do to put my ass in jail. I suppose you're right. Are you sure there isn't any other way? I asked my mind reeling on how I could save her. Save Damien. Save Jake. No, there isn't. Just be thankful that I'm sparing your life, he said. Believe me, that's not going to be an easy task. Everyone saw you. I'm going to have to try and convince my men that I killed you. You're going back without me? He nodded. That's the only way to keep you alive. And where are you going to leave me? I'm not sure yet. I could tell by the look on his face that he'd had enough of my questions. I can see that you have a lot to think about, and I could use some rest. Would you mind if I went down below and took a nap? I think that's a very good idea, he said. Thank you, John, I said, turning away. Wait. Come here. I stepped over to him. Staring at me, he pulled me into his arms and crushed his lips against mine. It took everything I had to not recoil in disgust, especially after he slid his tongue between my lips. Trembling, I let him kiss me, knowing that my reaction could be the difference between life and death. When it was over, he released me. Are you okay? he asked, searching my eyes. Of course. I leaned up and kissed him on the lips again. I missed you. He pulled back and stared at me dead in the eye. I hope I can trust you. If you're screwing with me, I'll kill you. A shudder went through me. Maybe I should say the same thing to you. His face relaxed and he laughed. Touché. I forced myself to smile. I'm going to lie down. He nodded. I climbed down from the command bridge to the salon and walked over to the galley. 
I quietly opened up a couple of drawers and cupboards, hoping to find a knife or something to defend myself. One thing I was beginning to learn about John was that he was a great actor, which explained why he was also an excellent attorney. There was a chance that he was playing me right now, just like I was playing him. Disappointed that there wasn't even so much as a spoon in the galley, I headed into the master stateroom and noticed my carry-on bag sitting in the corner. My heart began to race as I remembered the pepper spray. I unzipped the bag and pulled it out, surprised that it was still inside. Apparently, the bag had been forgotten. I stared at the can with hope. I knew that I could get close enough to John to use it. I could blind him and take his gun. Or somehow find the strength and push his ass into the ocean. As much as I wanted to, however, I knew that I had to play nice with him. At least until I knew where Jake was, and if there was any chance that I could help rescue him. I shoved it into my front pocket, thankful for Michael's gift and the fact that I'd been smart enough to keep it. 50. Jake. I ran toward the woods as fast as I could, waiting for someone to holler my name or grab me. But nobody did. Not even Dan. By the time I reached the tall pine trees, my bare feet hurt from all of the rocks and twigs and I was out of breath. But I didn't care. I was free. I have to call my dad, I thought with excitement. I knew he'd be proud that I'd escaped on my own. Plus, I didn't want him to give them any money. They didn't deserve it, and probably wouldn't have given me back to him anyway. I slowed down a little as I ran deeper into the forest, not exactly sure where to go. As I looked over to my right, I noticed a twisting stream that led to a swamp. I thought about the alligators that would most certainly be close by, and headed the opposite direction. That last thing I needed was to escape, only to be eaten by an alligator. I'd encountered one once, when my dad had taken us camping near the Alafia River. We'd hiked through one of the trails, and had seen one at the edge of a small lake. We stayed far enough away from it, but it had growled and then made some kind of funny hissing noise. It had been scary and cool at the same time. Shuddering at the memory, I kept moving, hoping that I wasn't going to get lost in the woods. Jake hollered Peter somewhere behind me. Frightened that he'd catch up to me, I ran faster through the woods, my heart pounding in my chest. He called my name a few more times, but his voice became more distant as I headed in the opposite direction. After a few minutes, I heard traffic sounds. I followed the noise, and it led me out of the woods. I stopped and stared at the road which was now empty, wondering what to do. I knew that the kidnappers might see me, but there were cars coming my way. I wanted to catch their attention. Jake yelled Peter. Panicking, I ran toward the road, deciding that I'd rather take my chances hitchhiking than let them take me back. It was then that I noticed a white car heading toward me. I blinked once and then twice. Was it an apparition? It looked exactly like my mother's car. It slowed, and my heart leapt out of my chest when I saw that it was really her, sitting in the driver's seat. I waved my hands and jumped up and down. She stopped the car and rolled down the window. What are you doing out here? Relief washed over me. I got into the front seat and threw my arms around her. How did you find me? We'll talk about that later. Are you okay? She asked, kissing the top of my head. I've been so worried about you. I'm okay. We've got to get out of here, I said, pulling away from her to look outside. The kidnappers are out there somewhere, looking for me. Put your seatbelt on and we will. Okay, I answered, doing what she asked. We need to call Dad and let him know that I escaped. We'll do that after we get you someplace safe, she replied, pulling back onto the road. Okay. I looked outside and shrank down into my seat when I noticed Peter stepping out of the woods. 
He wasn't wearing his mask anymore, but I recognized his clothing. Mom, that's one of them. We've got to get out of here. Instead of answering, she slammed on the brakes and beeped the horn. What are you doing? I asked, staring in horror as Peter looked in our direction and ran toward us. Relax, Jake, she said, grabbing my hand. Everything is going to be okay. No. We've got to get out of here. I cried, my eyes filling with tears. He's one of the guys who kidnapped me. I know exactly who he is. I stared at her in disbelief as she unlocked the door and Peter got into the back seat. Thank God. You found him, Peter said. No thanks to you. You're lucky I spotted him, she replied angrily. It wasn't me who lost the kid. It was Dan. Your brother is an idiot. He sighed. Yeah. I know. He can't help it, though. You should have left him out of this, my mother said. Too late for that now, he muttered. Mom? What's going on? I asked, crying. I recognized Peter's face now that he was in the car and without the mask. He was a friend of my mother's and used to visit her when we still lived with my dad. Quit your crying, she said, as we began moving again. You're too old to be acting like a baby. I stared in out the window both frightened and confused as she began driving us back to the house. I want my dad, I sobbed, feeling betrayed. How could she do this to me? Shush now, she said, reaching over and patting my knee. You'll see him soon enough. When we got back to the house, she made me take a bath and then gave me some clean clothes to wear. Get dressed, she said, lighting a cigarette in the bathroom. Mom, I'm scared, I said, watching as she inhaled and then blew a cloud of smoke out the window. You have no reason to be scared, she replied, turning toward me. I lowered my voice. I heard Peter and Dan talking. They're going to kill me. Her eyes hardened. That's not true. I'm here. Nothing bad is going to happen to you. I wanted to believe her, but my stomach was in knots. What if she started drinking, like she always did, and passed out? I knew that they could kill me, and she wouldn't even know. But? You have nothing to worry about, she said in an agitated voice. Get dressed. Okay. Afterwards, she brought me into the bedroom and tucked me into the bed. Mom sat down on the mattress. You should get some sleep. You look very tired, she said, brushing my bangs to the side. Why are you helping them? I asked, still in disbelief that she was involved. They're the ones helping us, she said. This way, we can be together, Jake. You want that too, don't you? Yes. But can't you just move in with me and Dad? Then we can all be together. I told you before, Jake. It's over between me and your father. He's a selfish jerk. I flinched at the way she spoke of him. In my heart, I knew that my mother was wrong about my dad. He certainly wasn't selfish. He was always donating things to people. He even loaned money to his friends when they needed it. I'd heard him talking about it with Uncle Marshall once. My mother stood up. Now quit your worrying, and for God's sake don't leave the house again. Are you staying here? I asked as she walked over and pulled the shade down on the window, making the room darker. Yes, she replied, moving back toward me. I relaxed. Okay. She leaned down and kissed me. I love you, Jake. I love you too, I replied. Sweet dreams, she murmured and then left the room. I stared up at the ceiling, wondering what would happen. I still didn't understand why my mother was with these men, or what she meant by us being together.
More than anything in the world, I wanted both of my parents to get along. I wanted both of them in my life. If only they'd fall in love again. Then we could be a happy family. I closed my eyes and said a silent prayer, hoping that it would come true. When I was finished, however, the door opened up and Peter stepped into the room. Wondering what he was doing, I pulled the covers up to my chin. He walked over to the bed and pulled out a switchblade from his front pocket. I just want you to know that if you try leaving again, it won't be your mother that you'll be dealing with. It will be me. I won't, I said, frightened beyond belief. You're lucky that she showed up when she did. I'd have hurt you real bad, kid. I know who you are, I whispered. His eyes narrowed. Oh yeah. Who am I? I didn't answer. What are you doing in here? snapped my mother from the doorway. I looked over and noticed that she was holding a drink in her hands. It made me even more anxious. Just making sure he knows the rules, Peter said, putting the switchblade back into his pocket. My mother sighed. He does. He's just scared. He should be, said Peter with a chilling smile. That's not helping, she said sternly. Peter laughed. He knows the score now, don't you? I nodded quickly. Peter nodded. Good. Now get some sleep and in a few hours, you'll be reunited with your dad. As long as you behave. I swallowed. Okay. Peter left and I let out a sigh of relief. My mother walked over. Don't worry about him. He's all bark and no bite. I just stared at her. Frowning, she told me to sit up. I did what she asked. Here, she said, holding out a pill that was cut in half. My eyes widened. What is that for? It will help you sleep. Don't worry. I take them all the time. I don't want to, I replied, looking away from the pill. Just do what I ask and don't cause any more problems, she said sternly. I felt like crying again. She was making me do things that I knew I shouldn't be doing. Jake. Take this. Now. I took the pill from her hand. Good. Now drink this. She handed me her glass. Inside of it was a light brown liquid over ice. What is that? I asked, smelling it. I knew there was alcohol in it. It was strong and tickled my nostrils. It's just rum and coke. It will help you swallow the pill. I held the glass back out to her. But I'm not supposed to drink this stuff. Just take the stupid pill, she ordered. Trembling, I put the pill in my mouth and drank from the glass. The liquid burned my throat as I swallowed the pill. I began to cough. She patted my back. I know, it's probably a little strong for you. You'll be okay, though. Did the pill go down? My eyes were watering. I didn't like the taste in my mouth, but I felt warm inside. I cleared my throat. Yes. Good. She took the glass back from me, and tucked me into bed again. Now close your eyes and get some rest. When are we going to leave here? I asked. Soon. When you wake up, probably. My eyelids were already getting heavy. Okay. I love you. I love you too, Mom. She kissed my forehead and left the room. It didn't take long before everything went black. 51. Mia. Sitting in the cabin alone, I desperately tried thinking of a plan that could help the situation we were all in. I imagined several different scenarios, and in the end, 
They all seem to lead to nothing but disaster for Damien, Ridley and the others. Even in the event that I was able to free Jake, it was unlikely that the gunman on the ship would pick up and leave peacefully. I couldn't let it dissuade me from trying to rescue Damien's son, however. If I could do that, and somehow get a message to him, I knew that there might still be a chance. Sighing, I lay down and decided that there wasn't anything I could do until we reached Jake. In the meantime, I'd continue to warm up to my ex and wait for the right moment to save Damien's son. I closed my eyes and tried to get some rest. Sometime later I felt the boat slow. I got out of bed and headed outside. As I stepped out of the salon, I noticed that we'd reached the mainland and were in a residential area, heading through a canal. I watched in silence as John steered the boat toward one of the slips, where a man was waiting. He cut the engine, and the man on the dock helped him tie our boat to the slip. Sleep well? John asked when he noticed me. A little, I replied, staring at the large yellow ranch-style home we were docked in front of. It was a nice-looking place with colorful shrubs and a well-manicured backyard. I wondered if Jake was hidden somewhere inside. Where are we? Naples, he replied. Oh. So what's next? I asked when he moved past me to grab his cell phone. I'll tell you in a minute, he answered, and then got off the boat. He walked over to where the stranger was just finishing up with the ropes. I watched as they spoke quietly to each other, and then both looked at me. I forced a smile to my face and nodded at the stranger. He nodded back and then they both shook hands. So does he know what's going on? I asked when the stranger went into the house. He knows what he needs to, said John, looking at the home, a pensive look on his face. What did you tell him about me? I told him that you were a friend. Oh. I looked at the house again. So is this his place? No. I should probably tell you. Before he could finish, the back door opened up and Tracy stepped outside. Wonderful, I said dryly. You couldn't tell me this earlier? Don't worry about her, he said quietly. Hi. I wasn't expecting you, she replied with a beaming smile. I know. I should have called you. Looks like you were busy anyway, said John. Tracy was wearing white yoga pants and a light blue tank top. Her hair was up in a messy bun, and from the sheen on her face and the towel around her neck, I guessed she'd been working out. When Tracy noticed me on the boat, she froze in her tracks. Hi, I said, secretly enjoying the flush of anger on her face. She looked like she was ready to claw my eyes out. Why is she here? Tracy asked coldly, ignoring me. Relax. Mia needed a ride, he replied, getting off of the boat. She was on Damien's yacht. Tracy looked confused. I thought you said that she was dating him? No. Mia and her friend Ridley were just catering the bachelor party, he replied, running a hand through his hair. She frowned. I don't understand. Wasn't that happening this weekend, and why did you leave if that was the case? Interesting, I thought. It was obvious that Tracy didn't have a clue as to what John was up to. As I mentioned, Mia wanted a ride which was a great reason to leave the party. He gave her a charming smile. I really wanted to see you before you left. Her face softened and she gazed at him lovingly. You're so sweet. His sweetness left a bitter taste in my mouth. He brushed his lips over hers quickly. So, are you packed and ready to go? Yes, she said. I have to take a quick shower before I leave for the airport. Where exactly are you going? I interrupted. Tracy smirked. Somewhere tropical and luxurious. 
John is going to meet me there in a couple of days. After he takes care of some business. Ah. Well, John is a very busy man these days, I said, looking at him. His lip twitched. Yes, but I'll be retiring soon. And I can't wait, said Tracy, throwing her arms around his neck. She stared up into his eyes. Then we can get married, like we talked about, and start a family. How wonderful. I'm sure John will be a terrific father. He's so good with kids. You should see how he is with Damien's son, Jake, I said. John gave me a dirty look. I need to go and make a phone call, he said, pulling away from Tracy. Do me a favor and show Mia into the house. Tracy frowned at his abruptness. Of course, she said, as he took out his phone and stepped away from us. Sighing, she turned to me. Let's go inside. Okay, I replied, following her toward the house. Nice place, by the way. Is it yours? She stopped at the sliding glass door and pulled it open. No. It's a friend of John's. Is it just you two staying here? I asked when we were inside and alone. Yes. Well, Travis has been staying here, too. He's the gardener-slash-maintenance guy. A live-in gardener. You don't find that very often, I said, thinking that he was probably someone John had hired to keep an eye on her. I know. It's kind of annoying, she said, lowering her voice. I feel like he's always underfoot. I bet. I looked around the kitchen, which opened up into the living room. It was sparsely furnished, and there wasn't a lot of decor or artwork. I should go and get ready. There's water and soda in the refrigerator, if you're thirsty. Thank you. Congratulations on you and John getting married, by the way. She smiled, and then her eyes became wide. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot that you and John were once engaged. He told me about that after we ran into you at the club. Although she'd been the reason we'd broken up, after everything, I almost felt grateful. Don't be sorry. You and he are a much better fit, I said truthfully. I'm sure you'll find someone, she said, looking at me with pity. I think I already have, I said, thinking of Damien. Good for you. Is he rich? To be honest, I have no idea how much money he has. I really don't look for that in a man. It was the truth. I really didn't know Damien's net worth, and didn't care he was a loving father, and a man who would do anything for his son. Those kinds of traits had nothing to do with the size of his wallet. I used to think that way myself. But not these days. I work my tail off to look good, and as far as I'm concerned, deserve to be with someone who can pamper me. Just like my mother always said, there are a lot of fish in the sea, just don't let yourself fall for a bottom feeder. Right. Too bad her mother hadn't taught her anything about ethics, I thought. Well, I'd better go and get ready. It was nice seeing you again, she said. You too, I lied. Tracy smiled and then left me alone in the kitchen. Before I could look around the house, John stepped inside. Where is she, he asked, sliding the glass door shut. She just left to take her shower. He nodded. Are you ready to go? I guess. Where is Jake? Not here, if that's what you're wondering. I couldn't help but wonder. He didn't say anything for a while, just stared at me. I wondered if he was having second thoughts about me. I walked over to him. Did you find out if the money was sent yet? I asked quietly. They're working on it, he replied. So, what's going to happen to her? I whispered, motioning upstairs. Nothing. She's going to jump on that plane to Aruba and from there it's up to her. 
Are you going to join her? He reached over and touched my cheek. I'd been planning on it, but now that you're back in my life, hell no. I forced a smile to my face. You are back in my life, aren't you, Mia? He asked, his eyes burning into mine. Obviously, I said, my gaze not wavering. He leaned forward and kissed my lips. What the hell? We both turned to find Tracy glaring at us. John ignored her comment. Why aren't you in the shower yet? He asked sternly. You're going to miss your plane if you don't get ready. I think the real question is, why were you kissing her? She replied angrily, walking toward us. Oh, come on. It was an innocent kiss, he replied. She raised her chin stubbornly. Really? From where I was standing, there wasn't anything innocent about it. Honestly, he's right. It was just a peck, I said, amazed that I was defending him. But we were wasting time, and I wanted to get to Jake. John and I are just friends. Friends don't kiss each other like that, she protested. It was nothing at all. You're making a mountain out of a molehill. Now, for the love of God, get into the shower. If you miss your flight, you're on your own, and I'm certainly not paying for another ticket, said John, frustrated. Do you have any idea how much money I've already invested in this trip? Still looking pissed off, she turned on her heel and stomped away. John relaxed. Here are the keys to my car, he said, pulling them out of his pocket. It's the CTS parked outside. Get in the vehicle and wait for me. I'm going to deal with her before she screws everything up. Okay, I said, taking them from him. He disappeared, and I went to the front of the house and stepped outside. In the driveway were two vehicles, one a Cadillac sedan and the other an SUV. I got into the CTS, started the engine, and turned on the air conditioner. Noticing the glove compartment, I opened it up and was shocked at the contents. Inside was a revolver and a cell phone. My heart began to pound as I took the gun out and checked to see if it was loaded. It was. 52. Damien. What's taking so long? asked one of the masked men. We were in my office, and I'd just gotten off the phone with my financial consultant. Without getting into any details, I'd made her aware of the fact that I needed to round up a large sum of money for an investment opportunity. When she'd started asking me questions about the deal, I cut her off, explaining that I wasn't able to discuss the logistics of it. Just like I told John, rounding up this kind of money isn't a walk in the park, I said angrily. And I don't carry all of my account numbers with me when I travel. He shoved the rifle into my face. I wasn't born yesterday. If you're messing with me, I'll start messing with your guests. Starting with that one. He motioned toward Ridley, who was in the room with us. The masked man had taken a liking to her, in a very bad way. Something told me that if he had a chance to do whatever he wanted with her, she'd be beaten and raped. Leave her alone, growled Ransom, who was sitting across from me. He hadn't yet collected the ten million dollars the kidnappers had requested. He was waiting on his accountant to verify funds and make some monetary transfers. I'd assured Ransom that I'd pay him back. This was my fault, and we both knew it. I'd placed everyone's lives in danger. It didn't matter that he'd agreed to stay on board and face the kidnappers. Thankfully, he wasn't holding any grudges. I wasn't so sure of the other passengers on the ship, however. They were now being held in the parlor, with most of my crew and security staff. The kidnappers had taken all of their phones and wallets away, which seemed to have pissed them off more than the knowledge that the ship had been hijacked. Chuckles had made it clear to each of them that if they tried anything, Jake wouldn't be the only one murdered. We have addresses for all you and your families, he'd said. 
You try anything and their blood will be on your hands. Knowing that they already had, Jake stopped any resistance from the other passengers. Nobody else wanted their loved ones in the same position. The clown turned his weapon on Ransom and grunted. Or what? You try anything, and one phone call is all it takes to kill little Jake. My stomach clenched in anger. If any of your men hurt my son, I'll make sure that you never make it off of this ship. You keep making threats like that, and we're going to find out if Blue Blood really does run in your family, he replied, pulling a knife out of his front pocket. We'll check Jake's too. Your heartless coward, said Ridley, glaring at him. Threatening children and innocent people. You're disgusting. Keep it up, he said, moving toward her. And I'll cut out your tongue. She flipped him off. Ridley, I warned, not wanting her to get hurt any more than she already had. What? Like he's going to let any of us live, she said in a glum voice. Once these guys have the money, it's all over for us. Of course we're going to let you live, the gunman replied, a smile in his voice. I mean, what kind of a deal would that be if we didn't? A one-sided one, which is where I think this is headed, said Ransom. Besides, we know what John looks like. One of us could identify him. Why would he want us alive? Don't worry about John, said the gunman. He's going to disappear, and won't give a crap if you recognize him or not. New identity, huh? Muttered Ridley. I guess that kind of money can buy you anything you want. My phone buzzed, and I noticed that it was my secretary. Yeah, I said, answering it. Damien, the funds should be available for wire transfer. You just have to log in with your credentials and authorize it. Good to know. Thank you, I replied. You're welcome, she replied. What's going on? asked the gunman, watching me closely after I hung up the phone. I stared at him. As much as I wanted to pay the money and get my son back, my gut told me to wait. They're still working on it. It's going to be a while. His eyes hardened. How long is a while? I have no idea, I replied. Why don't you go and report back to John? And when you do that, I want to talk to Mia. I need to know that she's alive and well. You don't call the shots around here, he argued. So quit giving orders. I may not be calling the shots, but I'm the one writing the check on this little enterprise of yours, and I refuse to pay for damaged goods, I said, glaring at him. That means that I want both Jake and Mia to remain unharmed. Looking frustrated, he pulled out his phone and began dialing a number. Yeah. It's me, he said. Stryker wants to make sure that the woman you left with is okay. John said something to him, and the clown looked at me. How? Ransom and I looked at each other. Okay, said the gunman. I'll tell them. He hung up. What's going on? I asked, irritated that I couldn't talk to her. She's gone, he said. Ridley gasped. What? Gone where? I asked, standing up. Had she escaped? The gunman pointed the rifle at me. Sit down or Ridley will be next. His words sunk in, and it felt like I'd been kicked in the stomach. What are you saying? Is she dead? Yes, he replied. That's what I'm saying. I stared at him in shock, his words still registering with me. John killed Mia. Cried Ridley. No. He didn't kill her. She did it to herself, replied the gunman. Liar, hollered Ridley, glaring up at him with tears in her eyes. She would have never killed herself. It wasn't suicide. She jumped ship and apparently drowned, he said without feeling. 
I remembered the conversation we'd had about teaching Mia how to swim, and it tore me up inside. I pictured her in the water, trying to stay afloat and unable to do so. It was horrifying to imagine her dying that way. Oh my God, choked Ridley, putting her hands over her face. She started to cry. I got up and went to her. I'm so sorry, I said, pulling her up into my arms, my own heart heavy. I couldn't believe that she was gone. I'd already felt something deep for Mia, and to think that I'd never see her again was painful. Ridley buried her face in my shirt and sobbed. 53. Mia. I realized that the gun was probably John's and knew that I should put it back, but I just couldn't. I shoved it under my seat and put the cell phone back into the glove compartment. Just as I slammed it shut, the front door opened and he stepped outside, with Travis following close behind. They went to the trunk and opened it up. I could hear John moving things around back there and was curious as to what was happening. It didn't take me long to figure out. Travis stepped back into the house and then reappeared carrying something long wrapped in a blanket. My breath caught in my throat as I noticed a hand slip out from underneath. Oh my God. It was Tracy. They'd killed her. I'd hated the woman, but death wasn't something I'd wished upon anyone, even her. Trying not to fly into hysterics, I looked away and reminded myself that I had to get to Jake. Travis dropped Tracy into the trunk with a thud, and I shuddered. I couldn't believe what was happening. It was all so gruesome, and it felt surreal. We were going to be traveling with a dead body in the back of the sedan. John slammed the trunk shut and a few seconds later got into the car with me. You killed her, I stated, trembling. He shrugged. Yeah, so. She saw us kissing. She had to go. Why? I asked, disgusted with his logic. It was just a kiss. She'd have gotten over it. The truth was, I'd planned on killing her anyway. But she'd seen us kissing, and I couldn't take any chances of her mentioning it to Travis. I still couldn't believe how casual he was being about murdering people. So you don't trust Travis either? I trust nobody, he replied. I stared at him. Sighing, he took my hand in his. Relax. This will all be over soon. Fighting the urge to take my hand back from him, I swallowed. How many more have to die? As many as it takes, he said. John, did you ever kill anyone else before all of this? His lip twitched. Do you really want to know? Yes. I do. He kissed my hand and then let it go to start the engine. You're better off not knowing. I guess that answers that, I murmured. You have to trust me, he said, pulling out of the driveway. Speaking of which, open up the glove compartment. I stiffened up. Why? Impatient, he stopped the car and then reached over to open it himself. He pulled out the cell phone and then the car manual. John slammed the glove compartment shut. Oh, Mia. I'm very disappointed in you. What are you talking about? I asked my eyes wide. The gun. I know you have it. I raised my hands up. What gun? I don't have anything. Right. He unbuckled his seatbelt and started searching the vehicle. He found the gun right away and held it up. You didn't hide it very well. I didn't hide it at all, I lied, giving him a dirty look. And don't you think if I had known there was a gun in the vehicle, I'd have shoved it into your face by now? He grunted. No. You're much too smart for that. You'd never see Jake alive or your friends on the yacht. I groaned in exasperation. 
You think you have everyone figured out, and in truth you don't. He studied my face for a few seconds before answering. All I know is that the gun was in the glove box, and now it's not. Maybe your girlfriend moved it. You should call her. Oh wait, you can't because you killed her, I replied dryly. Mia, I do have feelings for you but my patience is wearing thin. What does that mean? I'm your next victim? This isn't a game, he said angrily. And as you've noticed, I'm not afraid to get rid of distractions, so you'd better stop being one. You're the one accusing me of something I didn't do, I lied. Noticing a car behind us, he started driving again. Okay, let's drop this. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, this time. But I'm warning you, this situation is very serious, and I'm doing you a favor here, by allowing you to live. Don't cross me or you'll regret it. I turned and looked out of the passenger window. The only thing I regretted was agreeing to go out with him three years ago. 54. Ransom. Time ticked by slowly as we waited to hear back from Damien's secretary. I had my funds lined up but was waiting until I knew for certain that paying these guys off really was the only way. We had until six anyway, and something told me that once the money was wired, we were all dead. I glanced over at Damien. He looked like he'd aged overnight. From the distraught look on his face, I knew that he was going through a worse hell than anyone. First his son being kidnapped. Then finding out about Mia. His feelings for her were obvious. Our situation seemed to be getting worse by the hour, and time was running out. I knew we had to do something, but with numb nuts babysitting us in Damien's office, we couldn't even talk about a solution. An image of Taffy popped into my head. What I wouldn't do to be home with her right now. To be able to wake up to those laughing blue eyes. I wasn't sure if I'd get to see her again, and the thought tore me up inside. She was everything to me, and if the roles were reversed, I'd never be able to carry on without her. Life before her had been a blur of booze and women. I'd been miserable and out of control. Thank God she'd saved me from myself. Now I lived each day just to have her in my life. And that beautiful smile of hers. It was like catching a glimpse of heaven. Nope, I definitely couldn't live without her. Taffy, on the other hand, was strong and would persevere no matter what obstacles life brought her way. I knew that if I didn't make it out of this situation alive, she'd not only overcome her grief, but hopefully understand why I had to stay. My phone began to ring. I pulled it out and recognized the number. It was Taffy again. She'd called earlier, but I'd been too afraid to answer it. There was a chance that she'd catch something in my voice and know that something was wrong. I couldn't lie to her either. We'd made a solemn oath that there'd never be any secrets between us, no matter what the circumstances were. I sighed. Was it possible that she'd somehow caught wind of what was happening? More than likely, Taffy had learned about the large sum of money being transferred to one account and was wondering if I'd lost my mind. Aren't you going to answer your phone? The gunman asked. My eye twitched. I wanted to tell him where to go and had to practically bite my tongue not to. Hello, he said, irritated. The others called him Franz. He was short and stocky, with a slight German accent. His deep hoarse voice told me that he either smoked or used to. I'd stopped smoking cigarettes years ago, but one sure sounded good right now. No, I'm not going to answer it, I said. Why not? Maybe it is your finance guy. Maybe he has news about the money, he replied. It's definitely not. I told him. Oh. I see. It is your girlfriend. It's none of your business, that's who it is, I said sharply. His eyes narrowed under the mask. 
Give me your phone, Franz said, holding out his hand. No, I said, glaring at him. He raised his gun to my forehead. You don't and you'll die. Hey now, said Damien. There's no need for that. Just a reminder, Franz, if I die, you won't get your money, I said with a cold smile. How about I just make it so you wish you were dead, he replied. Maybe I shoot you in the ankle. Do you have any idea how painful that is? I was about to tell him where to put his gun when the door opened and one of the other clowns entered. The idiots were all still wearing the masks, so it was hard to distinguish one from the other. What's up? asked Franz. I'm supposed to relieve you, the other guy said, walking toward him. So you can grab some food or take a piss. It's about time. I've been asking to be relieved for the last hour, Franz muttered. Thank God, I said with a smirk. He's a whiny drama queen when he's hungry. Franz turned back around, his face red with anger. I've just about had enough of you and your mouth, he said angrily. The clown behind Franz hit him hard in the back of the head, and he dropped like a sack of potatoes. The three of us stared at the clown in shock. We don't have much time, he said, raising his mask. It was Marshall. What are you doing? Damien asked, moving over Franz to check on him. He's out cold. Keeping everyone alive, said Marshall. I've been doing a lot of thinking, and there's no way that these guys are going to let any of us go, especially Jake. You don't know that, argued Damien. Come on, Damien. You know as well as I do that once the money is deposited into their account, they're not going to hand him over. He'll die and so will the rest of us, said Marshall. And if we don't agree to pay them the money, how is that going to make anything better? replied Damien. It's certainly not going to help my son. It will if my plan works the way I think it will, he said. You have a plan. I sure the hell hope so, Damien said angrily. Because now all of our lives are on the line. Relax, Damien, I said, relieved that Marshall had come up with something. We were all just sitting ducks, waiting to die, as far as I was concerned. Even worse, we were paying them before it happened. Let's hear what he has to say. Go ahead, he said, folding his arms across his chest. We have to take back the ship and find your ex, Marshall said. Damien's eyes widened. Find Marissa? Why? Because she knows where your son is, he replied. I overheard Chuckles talking about her. His face darkened. What did he say? Something about her showing up where she didn't belong, replied Marshall. Damien stared ahead angrily. She's in on this? How could she do this? He nodded, his expression grim. Come on now, does her involvement really surprise you? From the expression on Damien's face, it shocked the hell out of him. 57. Damien. I wanted to murder her. How could she do this? Jake had looked so frightened in the picture they'd sent. Obviously, he had no idea that his mother was in on this. Are you certain? As much as I hated her, something like this was hard to swallow. Screwing John was one thing, but using our son as a pawn to get more money from me was deplorable. The woman was insane. Yes. Kendall got loose too, by the way. She just called me, said Marshall. Did she call the police? I asked him. No. I told her not to, he replied. What about Alice? I asked, picturing the nanny. She was an older woman in her fifties. The ordeal must have been terrifying for her. Did she mention anything about her? She's alive. They're both heading over to my place. 
Alice really wants to call the police. I explained that if she did, Jake could die, said Marshall. Hell, even if Marissa is involved, that doesn't mean that he's safe. These guys might get desperate if they find out the police are looking into things. If I get my hands on Marissa, I'm going to be the one going to jail, I said, running a hand over my face. I wanted to strangle the woman. How could she do this to her own son? The woman is a greedy, sick individual, Ransom said. Marissa might be a cold-hearted, money-hungry whack job, but she loves Jake in her own way, I replied. I have a feeling that once they get the money, Jake will be released to her. I agree. Even she's not evil enough to allow her own child to be murdered, said Marshall. Ridley cleared her throat. And I thought my ex was an ass. I can't believe how vile Marissa is. I'm still trying to swallow it myself, I replied. Something tells me that no matter what happens, Marissa is going to want you dead, Damien. Then she'll regain custody of Jake, and obviously, you'll be out of the picture for good, said Marshall. Exactly. And nobody would suspect that she was involved, I replied, my blood boiling. She'll have everything she wants. That's why we have to act, said Marshall. So what now? I asked, feeling a little relieved. As horrible as it sounded, the news was actually good for us. Jake was still in danger, but it wasn't life-threatening. Not like I'd thought. And now, knowing this, we could finally do something about the situation on the ship. We take back the ship and send out someone to rescue Jake, said Marshall, as if reading my mind. Sounds easy enough, I replied dryly. It won't be easy, but I have a friend who's a Navy SEAL and on temporary leave at the moment. If we can find the location where Jake is being held, I know he'll get him back for us, said Marshall. Okay. How are we going to find out where Jake is being held, asked Ransom. We send someone to find Marissa, I replied, staring ahead. And have them do whatever it takes to make her talk. 55. Mia. We drove in silence. I could tell that he was having some serious doubts about me, and so after a while, I began a light conversation. As frightened and sick of him as I was, I knew that the only way I'd make it out of this alive was to make him warm up to me again. So, how has your back been doing? I asked. John had a history of back problems. One of his legs was slightly shorter than the other, although you'd never know by looking at him. When we'd been together, he'd visited the chiropractor at least once a month to have what he called adjustments. He looked at me out of the corner of his eye. It's been okay, actually. I've been doing a lot of stretches. That's good. I went to see a chiropractor last month, I told him. I know you were always telling me to go in and have an alignment. John smiled. You did. How did that work for you? Pretty good, actually, I replied. The truth was that it had felt good, but I didn't really know for certain if the woman had necessarily made my back any better than what it had been before. I told you, didn't I, he said. Everyone should go in and have it done. I bet your spine is straighter than it's ever been. Ah, maybe. I thought you looked like you were taller than I last remembered, he said with an amused expression. I smirked. So, you think the chiropractor made me taller? He shrugged. No, but I'm sure you're standing up much straighter than before. Still smiling, John turned on the radio. What would you like to listen to? Whatever you'd like to, I said. Are you still taking photos, he asked. John hadn't ever taken an interest in my hobby, so I knew that it was a sign that he was trying to make me feel more comfortable. Yes. Do you still have that old camera your dad gave you? 
Yes. You don't use it, do you? No. I've kept it for sentimental reasons, though, I replied. I'll have to send someone to your place to retrieve it, John said. Once we get out of the country. Thank you, I replied, feeling ill. The thought of fleeing the country with him was frightening. You're going to have to leave most things behind, he said. But the good news is, we'll have a lot of money to buy you anything you want. Suddenly, there was a loud thumping noise from the trunk. John swore. Oh my God, is she still alive? I asked, feeling both relieved and frightened for her at the same time. Another loud thumping noise, as if Tracy was kicking the trunk, made me gasp. I don't know how she can be, he mumbled. Shouldn't you check? I whispered. I can't. Someone might see her. We were on a busy road, and there were a lot of drivers. I pictured John opening up the trunk, and Tracy leaping out. How far away is this place that we're going to? I asked as Tracy began kicking again. About an hour away. What if someone hears her? I asked as we approached a set of stoplights. Sighing, he opened the windows and turned up the radio, blocking out the noises from the trunk. He switched the station to something heavy metal, and it blared through the speakers. As we slowed for the red light, a young couple in the car next to us gave us the thumbs up. John smiled at them. The light turned green, and we began moving again. He turned down the music. By the way, he said, you're dead. I stared at him in horror. What? He laughed. I told my associates on Damien's yacht that you died. Why? To keep you alive. I told them that you tried getting away by jumping into the ocean. You drowned in the process. You didn't learn how to swim in the last few months, did you? It would make the story more believable if you haven't. I haven't learned how to swim yet, I replied, staring down at my hands. I'm sure that they told your boyfriend, Damien. He's not my boyfriend, I said irritably. John laughed. My, you're sensitive. Is the Red River flowing this week? I gave him a dirty look. He laughed. Seriously, though. My men think you're dead and that's a good thing. What about Travis? He saw me leave the house with you. Travis knows nothing about the kidnapping and isn't part of the group on the ship. I frowned. Who is he then? He works for Thomas Gambini, replied John. Why does that name sound familiar? I asked and then it hit me. John had mentioned Gambini when he'd tried talking me out of getting on Damien's boat. He was mafia. Thomas's nephew was a client of mine. I defended him when he was charged with robbery and arson. The evidence all pointed to him and he should have gone to prison. John smiled proudly. But he had me for a lawyer. So you got him off and now you have a friend for life, I said dryly. I don't know about for life, but I called in a favor and they sent me Travis. I'm sure in their eyes, the debt has now been paid. Which is fine. What about the guys on the ship? How did you meet them? I suppose you're going to find out soon enough. I met them through Marissa Stryker. My jaw dropped. Damien's ex-wife? He nodded. Are you saying that she's involved with kidnapping her own child? Marissa has a lot of hatred toward Damien. She blames him for making her life hell and taking away her son. Making her life hell? I repeated. If I remember correctly, Marissa was the one who caused the divorce with her partying and neglect of Jake. Oh, she was. But Marissa doesn't see it that way. She thinks of herself as a victim 
and believes that Damien is the one responsible for all of her misfortune. She sounds like a selfish, bitter woman. She's also ruthless and isn't afraid to do whatever it takes to get her way. So she's doing all of this for money? Among other things, he replied, Marissa wants her son all to herself. Is she planning on disappearing with Jake? Actually, they're not the ones who will disappear. She wants Damien dead, I said, feeling sick to my stomach again. The woman was a monster. Yes. So, he's going to pay the money and then die. Not just him, he said. There won't be any witnesses. The kind of cash involved in this there can't be. But rest assured, now that my associates believe you're dead, we can disappear. Once I get my share of the money, we'll fly to Europe. What do you think of Monaco? Monaco? I asked. Yes, Mia. It's always been a dream of mine to visit there. I licked my lips. I remember. He'd always talked about going to Western Europe and the French Riviera. With my cut, we can buy an amazing house and live there. Just you and me, he said, grabbing my hand. Another thud from the trunk. What do you say, he asked, ignoring it. We can start over and live the kind of life we both deserve. I felt like I was in some kind of a crazy Quentin Tarantino movie. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry. I forced a smile to my face. It sounds lovely. 56. Damien. After removing Franz's coveralls, I went into the bathroom and quickly put them on. Afterward, we carried him back into the bathroom, took his mask and cell phone, then placed him into the tub. You recognize him? asked Ransom. No, I replied, staring down at the man, who was in pretty good shape for a man in his fifties. Neither do I, said Marshall. It didn't mean that we hadn't met him before. Franz wasn't anyone who would stand out in a crowd. He was ordinary-looking, with a shaved head and goatee. How long do you think he'll be out? asked Ridley. Not for long, I replied. Let's barricade him in here so he can't get out if he does wake up, said Marshall. Good plan, I answered. We walked out of the bathroom and then jammed a chair under the door handle. What about the other gunman? I asked, slipping the clown mask over my face. One of them is with the captain on the bridge. I'm pretty sure the others are still in the parlor watching the group, he replied. You must have taken one out already, said Ransom, motioning toward the coveralls he wore. I was supposed to show one of them where your office was so he really could relieve Franz, he said. Needless to say, he's one less problem for us. I patted my cousin on the back. Good job. You could have been killed, though. I figured we all had better odds of surviving by going this route, he replied. I nodded. Well, we appreciate it. So what do you want me to do? asked Ransom as Marshall pulled the mask back over his face. Stay here, I told him. Are you sure? I could grab one of the other guns we've hidden. You know they're going to think twice about firing at me. I haven't paid them their money yet. That's true, said Marshall. In fact, we could probably use him as a distraction. I sighed. I didn't want to place Ransom's life in any more danger than it already was, but something told me that when the time came, we were going to need another armed person. Take me with you as an excuse. You can explain that I've paid the money, said Ransom. Good plan, said Marshall. We'll head up to the bridge first and take down the guy guarding the captain. Then you'll have a costume too. From there we'll disarm the others. The plan sounded crazy enough to work. 
I just hoped that we'd be able to disarm them without anyone getting hurt. If we're going to go, we'd better do it now, said Ransom, before someone else decides to check in on us. Okay. Hold on. I walked over to one of the pictures on my wall. Behind it was a safe. I opened it up and pulled out a Glock 42. I quickly loaded it and handed it to Ransom. I kept this one here just in case the other guns were found. Good idea, said Marshall. He reached into his coveralls and pulled out a pistol. By the way, I grabbed this one on the way over too. Nice, I said. We're going to need it. Speaking of which, what about me? asked Ridley. Marshall turned to her. Have you ever fired a gun before? No, she replied, looking anxious. He stepped over to her. Listen carefully, Ridley. This is the safety. You can't fire it unless it's off. Marshall then explained how to use the gun if she had to. Oh my God, she said, taking it from him. I noticed that her hands were shaking, and I wondered if it was a good idea for her to even be handling a weapon. Keep it pointed down, he said, frowning. The safety is off, but it's still loaded, and you never want to take any chances with one of these. Sorry, she said, pointing it toward the floor. Don't be, he said. I just gave you a crash course and you're scared. I don't expect you to know everything. Just don't forget to take the safety off if he gets out of the bathroom. I'm staying here, she squeaked. Yes. You'll be safer here than with us. We'll come back for you once we handle the situation. If Franz somehow gets out of the bathroom, don't be afraid to shoot the bastard, said Marshall. She shuddered. What if I can't? Then he'll more than likely get the gun from you, and believe me, he won't have a problem with pulling the trigger. Don't give him the opportunity, I said. Okay, Ridley replied. Lock the door when we leave, Ridley, I told her. She nodded. I looked at Marshall and Ransom. You ready? They nodded. Taking a deep breath, I opened the cabin door. 57. Read. There were four of them in the parlor, each wearing garish clown masks and threatening us with AK-47s. What a nightmare, huh? murmured Thane, who sat next to me. That's an understatement, I said, thinking back to when the clowns had first boarded the ship. Excuse me. Called out Simon, raising his hand in the air. I need to use the bathroom. He probably needs another hit of coke, I murmured. Thane snorted. Sounds accurate. You just went an hour ago, said one of the gunmen, chuckles. Simon smiled sheepishly. Yeah, sorry. I have a small bladder. That's not my problem. That's yours. You can wait, said Chuckles. No, I really can't. He stood up. Tell you what, I'll just piss over there in that vase. Sit down, ordered Chuckles. What's your problem? Do you not know who I am? asked Simon, glaring at him. No. Why don't you enlighten me, O oh great and powerful Oz? Chuckles said dryly. Very funny, Chuckles. The name is Simon Catterall, he answered. The clown stared at him. Why didn't you say so? Simon Catterall. Is it really the Simon Catterall? Yes. In the flesh, replied Simon, rubbing his nose. Did you hear that? Chuckles said loudly, turning toward his friends. We have Simon Catterall on board. I had no idea this day was going to turn out to be such extraordinary day. Silly me, and I almost decided not to show up to work today. Simon's eyes narrowed. I don't know who you are and I don't particularly care, 
said Chuckles, turning back to face him. But you're getting on my nerves, so sit down and keep your mouth shut before you have a permanent hole there. He's Ransom's drummer, said one of the other clowns. Ransom's drummer, repeated Chuckles, sounding amused. Tell me if I'm wrong, Teddy, but isn't the name of Ransom's band called Ransom? Yes, said the other clown. I believe so. I mean, it's definitely not called Ransom and Simon. It's not even called Ransom and Company. It's just plain. Ransom. I'm pretty sure it's that way because the rest of you idiots can be replaced he said, waving his gun around. But not Ransom. He's the voice and the face that people expect to see when they pay all of that money for a ticket. So you, Simon Catterall, should get over yourself. Hell, you're not even worth collecting a ransom on. Look who's talking, said Simon, losing his temper. You sit there and criticize me, and yet here you are, standing around wearing a clown mask with your thumb up your ass, waiting for direction from somebody with authority. You're just a bloody wanker with an itchy index finger, whereas I'm something you'll never be. A celebrity. You know, you're right. And, like most musicians, you'll probably be even more popular after you're gone. By the way, you're welcome. For what? asked Simon. Chuckles pointed the rifle at him. For immortalizing you. Before I knew what was happening, Simon was riddled with bullets and people were screaming. 58. Damien. What in the hell was that? I said, hearing the gunshots. Nothing good, said Marshall as we made our way to the bridge. Maybe the others decided on a mutiny, said Ransom, who was walking in front of us. I guess we'll soon find out, I murmured. Once we made it to the bridge, Jeff, who had his gun trained on the captain, asked if we'd heard the shots. Yeah, I replied, pretending to be Franz, was East Loss? A little much, said Marshall under his breath. What was that, Franz? asked Jeff. He's just wondering what's going on, said Marshall, his voice deeper than usual. Like the rest of us. Just waiting for orders, said Jeff, looking at Ransom. What's going on with him? He claims that he sent the wire. We need to verify it, said Marshall. He grinned. Sweet. Did you radio John so that he could check on it? Not yet, said Marshall. I'll do it, he replied, pulling out his phone. He turned around and began dialing. Marshall quickly slammed the butt of his rifle into the Jeff's skull. He dropped to the floor. You're getting very good at that, I said, impressed. He deserves much more than a bump on the head, said Marshall with disgust. Damien? Marshall, said the captain, who'd been silently watching us the entire time. I pulled the mask up. It's us, Charles. Oh, thank God, he said, looking relieved. I've been worried sick about what's been happening. I walked over and put my hand on his shoulder. Are you okay? I am now. I can't believe that Jeff was in on this, he replied. None of us can, said Marshall. What about the other gunmen? Did you free the other passengers and crew? Not yet. We're heading there right now, I said. Be careful. All of you, he answered, looking stressed again. I don't know about you, but I could have sworn that I heard gunshots. We heard them too. Hold tight and wait for me to return with instructions, I said, watching as Ransom began removing Jeff's coveralls. And if he wakes up, threaten him with this. I handed him a gun. Charles relaxed. Will do. Once Ransom was dressed and had the mask on, we headed to the parlor. Here goes nothing, I said, putting my hand on the knob. Wait, we can't just go inside and expect them to turn their guns over, said Marshall. You have a better plan? I asked. 
Actually, yes. I do, he replied. 59. Read. After Simon was shot, one of the other clowns hollered at Chuckles, while the rest of us moved away from the body, the horror of our situation clearer than ever. You killed him, shouted one of the band members, staring at the clown in disbelief. What in the hell is your problem? I just took care of my problem, he replied. Unless you decide to be just as annoying as Simon the Celebrity and give me another one to deal with. That was a stupid move, said one of the other clowns. John's not going to like it. He'll get over it, said Chuckles, looking around. Now, if anyone else has something to say about this, speak now or forever hold your peace. Nobody said anything. I thought so, he said. Can we at least cover him? asked one of the crew members. I must insist that you do, said Chuckles. I have a weak stomach myself, to be honest with you. I don't mind the killing part, it's the bleeding part that makes me ill. I rolled my eyes. It was obvious that Chuckles was the wild card in the group. Someone who was much more unhinged than the others. Chuckles looked at Thane. You. Why don't you take that tablecloth over there and cover Mr. Celebrity? Sighing, Thane stood up, walked over to the parlor and pulled the tablecloth off. He returned with it and placed it over Simon's body, his face grim. As he was about to sit back down again, the parlor door opened and one of the other clowns stood in the doorway. What's up? asked Chuckles. Stryker is missing, he replied. Chuckles swore and then started walking toward the doorway. I'll help you look for him. Then both men were gone, leaving just three clowns in the room with us. Thane and I looked at each other. Something is definitely up, I whispered. If he disappeared, then something was wrong. He wouldn't take any chances unless the rules had changed. I say we try taking these guys, whispered Thane. With what? We have no weapons, I murmured. One of the clowns noticed us talking and came over. I see that look on your faces, he said. That look that says you're about to make a bad decision. I don't know what you're talking about, I replied wide-eyed. The man cocked his rifle. I think you two should sit apart from each other. The door opened up and a clown walked in. He was taller than the others. What now? asked the one threatening us with the AK-47. Chuckles wants to talk to you. Me, he replied, sounding surprised. Yeah. Why? asked the clown. He shrugged. Not sure. He said it was urgent, though. Fine, he said, and then headed out the door. The clown who'd sent him away headed over to us. I looked up at him as he approached and our eyes met. He winked at me. I could use some taffy right about now, he said softly. My eyes widened. Ransom? He winked again. A few seconds later, there was the sound of a rifle going off. What in the hell is that? snarled one of the other clowns. I'll go check, said the other. He quickly left the room. I looked at Ransom to see what he was planning on doing, now that there was only one clown left in the room. The parlor door flew open and Chuckles staggered into the room, blood all over his chest and some dripping from his mouth. He toppled to the ground. As everyone stared in shock, Ransom lifted his mask. Hey! Over here, he called out, dropping his gun. Stunned, the last clown turned toward him, missing Marshall and Damien's entrance. Both of them had rifles of their own. Weapon down! Hollered Marshall, cocking his gun. He turned around. Put down your weapon, ordered Damien. Ransom picked his gun back up. 
The others in your group are down or dead. It's just you now, said Marshall. It's over. The man put down his gun. 60. Mia. About two hours into the drive, John announced that we were almost at the house. I hate to do this to you, he said. But you're going to have to hide in the trunk. My accomplices can't see you with me. But Tracy is in the trunk, I replied, staring at him in horror. John had checked on her earlier and confirmed that she was now dead. We'll dump her body first. I am not getting into the trunk, I said firmly. I mean, seriously? You can't really believe that I'd want to lay in a spot where a corpse had just been resting? She's barely cold, he argued. And it wasn't like she was bleeding out or anything. I shuddered. There's got to be a different way. Yeah, there is. You arrive with me. They see you. You die. Can't I just wait for you a couple of blocks away? Tapping his thumbs on the steering wheel, he sighed. Why, so you can make a run for it? I see. You still don't trust me, I replied, pretending to be hurt. He didn't reply. I forced tears to my eyes and then made a dramatic point to wipe them. Look, I'm sorry, he answered. It's not my intent to upset you. Well, you are. He let out a ragged sigh. You expect me to trust you, and yet you won't reciprocate? Need I remind you that it was you who broke the trust between us originally? I said to him. This is quite different, he said dryly. Look, there is no way in hell that I'm getting into that trunk, I told him. Twenty minutes later, Tracy was out of the trunk, and I was locked inside, kicking and screaming. You're overreacting, he said loudly. I could smell traces of her cologne and sweat, and it made my stomach curdle. Get me out of here, John. I will never forgive you if you don't get me out of here. He ignored me. You won't have to be inside for very long. Now listen, I'm going to start driving soon, and when I turn the engine off later you can't make any noise. If you do, you're going to die and that is no joke. I won't be able to save you. Do you hear me? I let out an angry growl. Let me out. Sighing, he got into the car and started the engine. For the next several minutes, I found myself getting tossed around and angrier by the moment. Just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, we left the smooth pavement of asphalt and entered a bumpy road. You okay back there, he hollered. Instead of answering, I vowed that I'd do whatever it took to free myself and rescue Jake, if it was the last thing I'd ever do. 61. Marissa. Hey. Wake up, said Dan, nudging me. I'd fallen asleep on the couch after smoking a joint with Pete. Leave me alone, I mumbled, my eyelids heavy. I couldn't stand Dan. He was jealous of my relationship with his brother. Not to mention, he was an idiot. If not for me showing up when I had, Jake might have gotten away. John is on his way, he said. I opened my eyes and sat up. Already? Where's Pete? In the bathroom, replied Dan. Do you know if we've been paid yet? I asked, grabbing my pack of cigarettes from the coffee table. I don't know. All I know is that Peter said to wake you. I lit up a smoke. Anyone check on Jake? I did. He's still sleeping, said Dan. I don't think you should have given him that sleeping pill. He frowned. He's just a kid. Like you know anything about children, I muttered. More than you, he murmured. Excuse me? I snapped. Pete stepped out of the bathroom. John's on his way. 
I heard, I replied. Did Damien pay up yet? Doesn't sound like it, said Pete, walking over to me. He grabbed my cigarette and took a drag. What would your fans say? I mocked as he handed me back the smoke. I don't smoke that much, he said. Pete played third baseman for the Sea Rays. Recently, he'd torn an ACL muscle and was still recovering from surgery. Although it had been an accident, the timing couldn't have been better. I stood up. I could use a drink. The suspense is killing me. Why is John driving all the way back out here anyway? asked Dan. I opened up the refrigerator and grabbed a can of cola to mix myself another cocktail. I don't know. He probably wants to check on Jake. Make sure you didn't let him get away again. That was an accident. I didn't know he was going to try running, said Dan. Obviously, I replied. I had to admit, however, I was proud of my son's courageous attempt to escape. He definitely got his street smarts from me. Is he going to return him to his father after he pays us the money? asked Dan. I snorted. Are you on crack? Of course not. Jake is staying with me and Pete. Isn't that right, hun? Ah, uh, yeah, he answered, turning on the television. I bit back a smile. Pete would do anything I wanted. Little did he know that after today I wouldn't need his help anymore. I wouldn't need anything from him or anyone else for that matter. That's not what you said before, Dan said, looking at his older brother. Pete glanced at him, frowning. Of course it is. Dan looked confused. No. You said that. I said that I didn't know what John meant to do with Jake, he said. Because at that time, I didn't. But Marissa has cleared it all up for us. John's not touching my Jakey, I replied, feeling guilty enough that they'd scared the hell out of him. I'd seen the picture they'd sent to Damien. After being kidnapped, and then surrounded by all of the freaky masks, he'd obviously been frightened to death. Your mascara is all over your face, said Dan, looking at me. I rubbed under my eyes. Did I get it? He shook his head. No. You still look like a crack whore. Pete coughed. I turned and saw that he was smiling. Don't encourage your brother. He's not funny, I said, glaring at him. I didn't even say anything, said Pete, wiping the smile from his face. You didn't have to, I mumbled, heading toward the bathroom. Personally, I think you look like a girl who just got laid. Now those are sexy, said Pete. Too bad you're not going to see a girl like that anytime soon, I replied sarcastically. Oh babe, you know I was just. I slammed the bathroom door shut and looked at myself in the mirror. I had to admit, my makeup looked like shit and my eyes were still a little red from the pot. Sighing, I turned on the water, washed my face and then ran my fingers through my hair. After I was finished, I stared at my reflection. Damien had always claimed that I looked like the movie star, Anne Hathaway. I'd almost taken offense to it, thinking that I was much prettier. Right now, I couldn't hold a candle to her. I seriously did look strung out. It's lack of sleep, I told myself. One good night's rest will fix everything. I'd be getting enough of that right after John paid me my share of the money, and I knew that Damien was gone. Stepping out of the bathroom, I walked right into Pete. There's my beautiful girl, he said, pulling me into his arms. Screw off, I said, pushing him away. He gave me a hurt look. Come on, babe. Don't be like this. You know I love you. If you love me, go and get us some tacos. I've got the munchies, I told him. I'm hungry too. I'm going to wait for John first though, he replied. Then I'll head out for food.
I suppose you'd better, I said, knowing that John would be pissed if Pete wasn't here. So, did you get the tickets? Pete asked, sitting back down on the sofa. Not yet. It would be too suspicious, I told him. John made it clear that I couldn't leave the state or do anything that might attract attention. I couldn't even shop for clothes until everything had blown over. The plan was that after the money was wired and verified, there'd be no witnesses. Damien, his crew, and his friends were all going to die. Even Ransom, the arrogant asshole. I'd tried flirting with him once, and he'd made it quite clear that he wanted nothing to do with my advances. What's wrong with you? He'd said, staring at me with annoyance. Damien is my friend. You're his wife. You should be ashamed of yourself. Like he was anyone to preach. Ransom had screwed his way through Hollywood, back before he'd met his annoying fiance, Tiffany. No, I had no qualms about taking some of his money, along with Damien's. Once Damien was out of the picture, I'd be able to get full custody of Jake. At least, that's what John had told me. We'd both be wealthy millionaires, and nobody would suspect anything, since taking out key witnesses wasn't going to stop at sea. He's here, said Dan, who was standing next to the window. Good. Maybe he'll have more news for us. Anyone else want a drink? I asked, filling my glass with ice. No. We're going to need a clear head from here on out, said Pete. Just in case things fall apart. Nothing is going to fall apart, I replied, unscrewing the bottle of rum. Damien will pay us the money. He'll do anything to get Jake back. I'm sure he will. He might also send someone out to look for him, said Pete. Which is why I think we need to be wary. John stepped into the house and looked around. When his eyes rested on me, he frowned. Hey, I said, smiling at him. What are you doing here, he asked. Making sure my son is comfortable, I replied, hiding my distaste for the man. Although we needed each other for this venture, I couldn't wait until he was out of our lives for good. He was a slime ball. Keep your voice down, he whispered harshly. He might hear you. He's out cold. He can't hear anything. Besides, he already knows I'm here, I answered. John's eyes narrowed. He saw you. I explained how Jake had escaped out of the bathroom window when Dan was supposed to have been watching him. So Jake knows that you're involved, said John. Yeah, but it's a good idea I showed up here, I said. The boy would have been long gone by now. John looked at Dan and then at Pete. You morons. Do you know how much time and energy we've put into this? If he had gotten away, everything would have been for naught. It's all good. The boy is in the bedroom sleeping, said Pete. There's nothing to worry about. John walked over to the bedroom and peeked inside. His shoulders relaxed. See, I said, walking over to him. I looked over his shoulder and smiled at my sleeping son. And you don't have to worry about him going anywhere. I gave Jake something to help him sleep. Good idea. John closed the door and turned to me. Speaking of ideas, I think it's time. I frowned. I thought we were waiting until after we were paid. There's no reason to. It will be less for us to clean up later. Letting out a ragged sigh, I move out of his way. I suppose you're right. You want one last kiss? He asked with a smirk. I looked at Pete, who was staring at us curiously. He had no idea what John meant. The guy wasn't much brighter than his brother. I blamed it on the many times he'd been hit in the head with a baseball. No. What's the point? I replied. John pulled out his gun and aimed it at Pete. What are you doing? he asked, looking stunned. 
Without answering, John shot him in the chest, and he crumbled to the floor. Peter, cried Dan, his eyes filling with tears. He rushed over to his brother. You killed him. Don't fret. You'll be joining him soon enough, said John, before shooting him as well. I let out a sigh. As much as I'd been looking forward to their deaths, it wasn't as satisfying as I thought it would be. Check to make sure they're both dead, said John. I walked over to where Pete was lying and nudged him with my shoe. Nothing. I did the same with Dan. He was gone. They're both dead, I told him. Good. Now, didn't you say there was an old well nearby, he asked. Yes. The house we were in belonged to Pete and Dan's aunt, who died three months before. It's less than a mile from here, near an abandoned farmhouse. Where about, he asked. I told him how to get there. Thank you. You've been very helpful. He turned the gun toward me. What are you doing? I cried, staring at him in horror. He smirked. No witnesses. Remember? I'm not a witness, John. I'm the one who set this thing up. Please, I begged. Don't shoot me. Actually, I was the one who set it up, he corrected. But you needed me. Yes, you're right. We did. But now we don't. But, but Jake needs me. You can't do this, I said, pleading with him. He needs his mother. From where I'm standing, you're the last thing he needs, he replied, and then pulled the trigger. Realizing that I'd made a very bad mistake, I screamed in anger, and then everything went black. 62. Mia. After John stopped the car and got out, it seemed like it took forever for him to return. Even worse, it was hot and I could barely breathe. When he finally made it back to the vehicle, I felt like I was going to die from heat stroke. John opened the trunk. Shielding my eyes from the sun, I glared up at him. Sorry, Mia, he said, holding out a gloved hand. I had to do this. It really was for your safety. Your idea and my idea of safety are two very different things, I muttered, climbing out. He stared at me with concern. I'm sorry. You're sweating. I didn't even think about how hot it would get in there. Are you okay? I'm better now that I'm out. Where are we? I asked, staring at the old White House behind him. It was a single-level home, surrounded by trees and obviously very rundown. Parked next to us were two vehicles, one a white Mercedes and the other a black pickup truck. This place belongs to a friend of a friend, he replied. Oh, I thought you wanted to keep me a secret. I asked, wondering why he'd let me out of the trunk. There's no reason to now. I frowned. What does that mean? You'll see soon enough, he said, walking over to the Mercedes. He popped the trunk open and started moving things around. Pulling out a pair of black leather gloves, he held them up. Perfect. I guess she wasn't as dumb as I thought she was. Whose car is that? I asked, wondering who he was talking about. Marissa Strikers, he replied. My eyes widened in surprise. She's actually here? Yes and no. He walked over to me and held out the gloves. Here, put these on. We don't need your fingerprints on anything. I did what he told me to do. So where is she? I asked, following him up the stoop. Inside, he said, opening up the front door. I stopped. But... I thought you didn't want anyone to see me. I whispered. He chuckled. Relax. You have nothing to worry about, Mia. Chewing on my lower lip, I followed him into the house, 
ready to meet the monster who had made Damien's life hell during and after their marriage. Not to mention how she'd used her own son to extort money. I hated her already. Watch your step. There might be blood on the carpeting, said John. Oh my God, I gasped, seeing three shrouded bodies lying in the middle of the living room. He walked over to them and looked at me. Sorry. I should have warned you, he said with a smile. But I like catching people off guard. It's much more fun that way. Are one of these, Marissa? I asked, shaking. I couldn't believe that we were standing over three dead people, and he was grinning like a lunatic. He tapped the smallest body with his foot. That's her. Do you want to see what she looks like? No, I said, staring at him in horror. I just meant. I know you were probably wondering what his ex looked like. She used to be quite the looker. I don't care what she looks like, I replied, the bile rising in the back of my throat. The man was insane. I couldn't believe that I'd once shared a home with someone like him. It's probably for the best. If I were to unwrap her, she'd bleed all over. The less blood now, the less I'll have to clean up later. I looked back down at the bodies. It was obvious that the other two were taller than Marissa, and not child-sized. Where is Jake? I asked, frightened of his answer. Our eyes met. In the first bedroom, he said, nodding toward the hallway. My chest tightened as I walked around him and headed toward the bedroom. I told myself that as evil as John was, he still needed Jake alive. At least until he was paid. Mia, said John. I stopped outside of the bedroom doorway, afraid of what I might find inside. What? I wouldn't go in there, murmured John, coming up behind me. I could feel blood rushing to my head as I grabbed the door handle. Why? He took my hand away from the knob. Because you'll wake him, and we don't want the boy seeing what's in the living room. I released my breath, an overwhelming sense of relief washing over me. Jake was still alive. Thank God. Come on. Let's get rid of the bodies, he whispered near my ear. And then we'll wake him and get out of here. I nodded. 63. Damien. We tied up the last gunman and covered the other bodies. I think it's time we got the authorities involved, said Reed. I could only agree, especially now that I knew Marissa was involved. I had to believe that Jake's life wasn't in immediate danger, but the sooner we found him, the better. And then there was John, who pissed me off even more than my ex. As much as I hated her, she was too flighty and stupid to be anything but a pawn in this operation. I blamed John for this, along with Mia's death. We'd need the police to help locate him. Do you think it's possible that John picked up something on one of the wiretaps? asked Marshall. I mean, he could be aware of the change of events on the boat. He hasn't called my phone or any of the others, I replied, hoping to hell that he didn't know what was going on. We had all of the gunman's satellite phones in our possession and had been monitoring them for calls. So far, there'd been nothing. Maybe they've bailed, he suggested. I guess it's possible. Especially if they know that we are aware of Marissa being involved, I replied. We'd better act fast before she does something crazy, like leave the country with Jake, said Marshall. I'm on it, I said. I called the Coast Guard, and explained to them what was happening. They told to me to stay put. They're on their way, I said, hanging up. You should try contacting Marissa, suggested Marshall. Don't accuse her of anything, but try and feel her out. Maybe she'll give something away. I'd been thinking the same thing. I pulled out my phone again and dialed her number. It went straight to voicemail. 
Hey, Marissa, I said, trying to sound as pleasant as possible. It's me. Call me when you get a chance. No answer, huh? said Marshall. I put my phone away. Nope. It went straight to voicemail. Maybe you should call Pete, he suggested. I scowled. They were living together. Something told me that he was part of the operation. Although, I couldn't imagine him risking his baseball career. He won't tell me anything. We'll let the FBI deal with him and Marissa, I replied. If they can find them, said Marshall. There's that, I said. Let me call Kendall and let her know what's happening. I'm sure that the police are going to want to talk to her as well, said Marshall. Let her know we'll be seeing her soon and that I'm thinking about her, I replied. Will do, said Marshall. I ran my fingers through my hair. I felt frustrated and so utterly useless at the moment. Time was ticking by, and I had no idea what was happening with my son. I wanted to call John and threaten him. To tell him that most of his men were dead, and he wasn't going to get away with this. That he'd better give me back my son. But I couldn't afford to screw this up because of emotions. If we were going to find Jake, we'd have a better chance of doing it by surprising them. All I could do was wait for the authorities to get involved and hope they didn't mess this up. 64. Mia. John carried Marissa's body to the trunk of her car. I need you to help me with the others, he said, setting her inside. They're a lot heavier. Can't we just leave them here? I asked, horrified. The thought of touching, let alone carrying a dead body was mortifying. No. It's evidence, and I need to get rid of it. What are you going to do with them? I asked. There's an old abandoned well not far from here. I'm going to drop them inside. I pictured the scene in my head, and it made me shudder. It was as if I was living in a real-life horror movie. I half expected a man, wearing some kind of ski mask, to come running up with a chainsaw blaring. Mia? Wake up. I blinked. I know this is a lot to absorb, but the sooner we get this done, the better. I followed him back into the house, my eyes scanning frantically for some kind of a weapon. What are you looking for? John asked noticing that I was a little preoccupied. There's a lot of evidence sitting out. Like the booze bottle and glasses, I said, thinking of something quickly. I know. Before we leave, we'll clean up a bit, he replied. Okay, I said, noticing something out of the corner of my eye. It was Jake, and he was peeking through the bedroom doorway. John kneeled down next to the second body. You take that end, and I'll take the other. Right, I said, wishing that I could say something to the boy. I couldn't imagine what he was thinking. The body was heavy, and it was a bit awkward carrying it. But we got it outside and into the trunk. As John was rearranging the two corpses to make way for the third, I turned around and couldn't believe my eyes. Jake had somehow gotten out of the house, and was running toward the trees. There, said John, brushing his hands clean. That should work. Knowing that he was about to turn around and see Jake, I tried distracting him by pointing to something in the trunk. It appeared to be an earring. What's that? Shoot. Her earring must have fallen off. He picked it up. I'll take care of it. As he was slipping it into his pocket, I heard a cry from Jake's direction. We both looked, and my heart stopped when I noticed that the little boy had fallen. 65. Jake. Although I was groggy, I'd heard my mother arguing with the man when I'd been lying in the bed. When she screamed, I'd bolted upright, frightened that she was hurt. 
I quickly rushed over to the door and cracked it open. I saw my mother on the ground and a man standing over her. I started to cry and quickly closed the door so he wouldn't hear me. I heard his footsteps and ran back over to the bed. I crawled back under the covers and pretended to be asleep when he opened the door to check on me. I could feel his eyes on me and held my breath until he closed the door and walked away. I have to get out of here, I thought, my heart racing in my chest. He was going to kill me, too. I had recognized the person's voice and knew it was the man from yesterday. The one who'd been wearing the scariest of all masks and the one who'd taken me from my house. They'd called him John. He was a very bad man, and I knew that with my mother gone, there was nobody else to protect me. After several seconds, I heard the front door open and close, and wondered if he was going away. If so, it probably wasn't good news for me. Especially knowing that my mother was gone. I tried not to think about her, lying dead on the floor, but it was so hard. The front door opened back up, and I could hear voices. I couldn't tell what they were saying, but after a few seconds, the bedroom door opened and I could hear whispers. After a few seconds they left, and I sighed in relief. Then I heard the front door open. I pushed the covers away and got out of bed. I walked over to the bedroom door and peeked out. I saw a woman holding the front door open for John, who was carrying someone wrapped in a sheet. Realizing that it had to be my mother, my eyes filled with tears again. Can't we just leave them here? The woman said, shortly afterward. John stepped back inside and I closed the door. I heard them talking and peeked through the doorway again. The woman was looking my way, and I could tell that she saw me. Scared, I shut the door and ran to hide under the covers, waiting for one of them to come inside and yell at me for spying on them. Nobody did, which surprised me. Instead, I heard them talking and then the front door open and close again. I could tell that they'd left the house once more, so I walked quickly to the doorway and opened it. This time, when I checked the living room, I saw that there was another body lying on the floor and wrapped in a sheet. Thinking that if I didn't get out of there, I'd be next, I raced out of the bedroom and into the bathroom. I closed the door, quickly removed the window screen and climbed out of the window again. I started running toward the woods and looked back once to see if they'd noticed me. It was a bad idea, because I tripped over something in the grass and twisted my ankle. It hurt so much that I cried out in pain as I went down. 66. Mia. Swearing John ran toward Jake. I quickly followed. When we reached him, the boy was sitting on the ground crying and holding his ankle. Are you okay? I asked, crouching down next to him. My ankle, he sobbed. It hurts. His face was covered with tears, and it was obvious from his expression that he didn't trust me. You shouldn't have been running away, said John angrily. Serves you right. I gave him a dirty look and then turned back to Jake. Here, let me look at it, I said gently, reaching my hand toward his leg. He immediately backed away from me. Thankless brat, said John, glaring at him. She's trying to help you. I want my dad, he cried. Jake looked so scared and frightened. I knew how much he'd been through in the past few hours, and my heart went out to him. It's okay. I'm not going to hurt you, I said in a soothing voice. Don't touch me. His eyes stared at me with accusation. I knew he believed I was on the kidnapper's side. I wanted to tell him that I was on his and would do whatever I could to help him escape. Jake, I know you're scared. You have no reason to be frightened of me. I won't hurt you. I promise, I said, pleading with my eyes. He hung his head down low, but didn't say anything. I'll try to be as gentle as possible, I said, touching his foot and ankle carefully. What do you think? 
Anything broken? asked John. The boy was shoeless and not wearing socks. I wasn't a doctor, but it didn't feel like anything was broken. It was probably just a sprain. I don't know. We should get him to a doctor. Just in case. That's not going to happen, John said dryly. Obviously. It's starting to swell. We need to at least get an ice pack on it. I want to go home, moaned Jake. You want to go home? Well, forget it. That's not going to happen. You've been a lot of trouble, said John, the heartless bastard. You tried escaping earlier, and you tried it again just now. Do you know what happens to little boys who don't do what they're told? John, leave him alone. He's frightened, I said, glaring at him. John grunted. Mia, see, this is why I never wanted to have kids with you. You're too soft. I wanted to scream at him that he shouldn't have kids because he was a psychotic freak, but bit my tongue. Maybe I am, but he needs something for the swelling. Can you go and gather an ice pack from the freezer? How about you do it and I'll carry him to the car, said John. Okay, I replied. Just be careful of his ankle. Just go and get that ice pack, said John, sounding irritated. He bent down and picked up Jake, who I could tell wanted to be anywhere but in his arms. I'll be back, I said, running toward the house. I went inside and rushed over to the refrigerator. It was then that I noticed someone had left a cell phone on the counter. I picked it up and swiped my finger across the screen. It showed a missed call from someone with the contact name of Asshole. The person had left a message, but there wasn't time to listen, so I started looking through the text messages. I sucked in my breath when I realized the phone belonged to Marissa, and that asshole was actually Damien. The front door opened startling me, and John stepped inside. I quickly hid the phone in the back of my pants, covering it with my shirt. How is he? I asked, opening up the freezer. The same, he replied. At least he's in too much pain to try and run this time. I reckon so. What do you know, there is ice, I said, pulling out a small bag of it. I set it on the counter next to a bottle of rum. He stepped into the kitchen. Of course there is. It's always cocktail hour for Marissa Stryker. Or rather, he smirked. It was. So rum was her thing. I'm not much of a rum drinker myself, I said. I don't know if it's the taste, or the fact that it can really knock you on your butt. I love cooking with it though. I knew I was babbling, but couldn't help it. I was anxious about him finding the phone. I remember, he said, watching me closely. I began to wonder if he knew that I was hiding something. So, um, are you still a scotch drinker? I asked, grabbing the hand towel. I laid it flat and began filling it with pieces of ice. I don't know why you're even bothering, he said. I looked at him. What do you mean? You know he's not going to be around too much longer, he said, opening up the refrigerator. Man, I'm parched. Doesn't anyone drink bottled water anymore? I stared at him in horror. You are not really going to murder that little boy, are you? Like I've been telling you, no witnesses, he said, reaching into the refrigerator. He grabbed a can of soda and opened it. But he's just a child. John took a sip of soda. A child who has seen my face and knows that you're alive. You know we can't have that. John, you can't kill him. I'll do anything you want. Just please don't murder that child, I beg. If we had any other choice, I'd consider it. But we don't, he replied as calmly as one would discuss the weather. Now hurry up. I want to get the other body out of here, so we can clean up and head out. Where are we going? I asked, 
knowing that I needed to act before Damien paid the money. To Tallahassee, he answered. I have an apartment set up there. We're going to need a place to stay while we set up your fake passport. Don't worry, it shouldn't take too long. Oh. Okay. He nodded toward the ice pack. Get that out to the boy and then get back in here. We may as well make him feel more comfortable so he stops whining. Damien and Ransom have until six to make their payment, so we might be stuck with him until then. Which reminds me, I should call for an update. Good idea. I hurried out to John's car, where Jake was sprawled out in the back seat, crying softly to himself. Here, honey, I said, kneeling down. You need to try and hold this against your ankle. His hands shook as he took it from me. Listen, I whispered. I'm friends with your dad. I'm going to get you out of here. He stopped crying. You are. Yes, but first we have to get away from the guy in the house. He's a very bad man. Jake nodded. I know. He killed my mother. I know. I'm sorry. We'll get you to your daddy, though. He looked past me toward the house. Can't we just drive away? I wish it was that easy. He has the keys. Do you have a gun? Maybe you could shoot him? Spoken from the mouth of a babe, I thought. The poor kid was already getting numb to the idea of killing other people. Mia, hollered John, standing on the stoop. Get in here. Hold on. I yelled back. I turned back to Jake. You're going to have to be strong, okay? Let me worry about John. You just keep this on your leg. It's too cold, he said. I know, but it's the best thing for your ankle. It will help the swelling go down. Mia. Sighing, I stood up and straightened my shirt. It was then I realized that I still had the small can of pepper spray in my front pocket. 67. Damien. The Coast Guard arrived, and after assessing the situation, contacted the FBI. They're going to be meeting you at port, along with the local police, said the commander of the Coast Guard ship. In the meantime, we'll accompany you back to shore. Thank you. What about my son? He's still missing. I know that my ex-wife is involved, I replied, and then went over the entire story of how he'd been kidnapped. She knows where he is. I'm sure of it. Someone has to try and locate her. The only surviving clown, who apparently was Chuckle's little brother, had claimed he didn't know where Jake was, had never met Marissa and barely knew John. I was recruited through my brother and last night was the first time we'd met, he told us. I didn't even know that there was a kid involved until we got on the ship. Although it was possible that he'd been lying, I could tell he was young and knew that John wouldn't have trusted him with too much information. The FBI will assist you with that, Mr. Stryker. Since he's still missing and the situation is complex, I would work directly with them to get your son back, he replied. Okay, I answered, running a hand over my face. We're also searching for the carver you described, he said. We'll let you know if we come up with anything. Thank you, I said. Staring down at his notes, he turned and walked away. Would you like some coffee? asked Ransom, walking over with two steaming cups. I smiled. Yes. Thank you. I was exhausted and could barely think straight. We'd made it through a very deadly ordeal, and although I should have felt relieved that the rest of the passengers and crew were safe, I felt empty inside. My son was still missing, and a woman had lost her life because of me. If I wouldn't have tried making John jealous, he might not have taken her off of the ship. If I wouldn't have insisted on getting full custody of Jake, 
maybe Marissa wouldn't have tried blackmailing me like this. These things went through my mind, and it all came down to the fact that my selfishness and arrogance had cost people their lives. Are you okay? asked Ransom. I'm just thinking about Mia and Jake, I said. I'm really sorry about what happened to her, he answered. She seemed like a really nice girl. To be honest, we'd only known each other for a couple of days. But for the short time we were together, I found her fascinating. He put his hand on my shoulder. I'm sure there will be a lot of people grieving for her. I know Ridley is taking it hard. They must have been best friends. I looked over to where Ridley was sitting between Reed and Thane. She was smiling sadly and her eyes were red-rimmed. I could tell they were trying to comfort her. Yes. They had big plans together, I said, fighting my own tears. I thought back to the night we'd had dinner with Michael. Listening to them talk about buying an island and opening up a hotel had been amusing to me, but they'd seemed very serious about it. I decided that when all of this was over, I'd do whatever I could to help Ridley fulfill her dream. Even if Mia wasn't around to enjoy it with her, I owed it to them both. Just because one of them had died didn't mean their dream had to. Marshall walked over to us. I bet you can't wait to get back to the mainland and start searching for Jake, he said to me. My cousin knew me all too well. Even with the FBI getting involved, I wouldn't be able to sleep until he was found. I needed to get involved. Did they tell you they've contacted the FBI? I asked. Yes, he answered. Hopefully they'll find Marissa quickly, and this nightmare will be over soon. Marshall looked at Ransom. Did you get a hold of your fiancé? Ransom had called Tiffany right after we'd taken back the ship. To say that she was upset was an understatement. It took him a long time to calm her down. She said that she had something to tell me, said Ransom. It sounds like some pretty big news, because she refused to get into it over the phone. Good news or bad? I asked. It sounded good, said Ransom. Maybe she's pregnant, said Marshall, smiling in amusement. Pregnant, he repeated and then smiled. It's funny that you should say that. She has been rather emotional lately. I bet she's got a bun in the oven, I replied, remembering when Marissa was pregnant. She'd been emotional too, but fortunately, had refrained from drinking during her pregnancy. Ransom's grin widened. Wouldn't that be something? I hope she is. After this experience, I want a child in our life. That way if something ever happened to me, she'd always have a part of me. For me, it's the opposite, said Marshall. I'd hate to leave my child or have one taken from me. You two are cousins, aren't you? asked Ransom. Yes, said Marshall. You look like you could be brothers, he said. Marshall and I looked at each other. People had always said that about us, although I didn't see it. Our mothers were sisters, I explained. Although, some people think I look like your old man, said Marshall with a smirk. I hope not, I replied, chuckling. I heard he'd been quite the ladies' man. At least before he met my mother. Were your mother's twins? Maybe your old man got confused one night, joked Ransom. That's twisted, I said, smiling and shaking my head. And no. They weren't twins. Ransom chuckled. Sorry. I'm a sick individual, at times. Anyway, back to Jake. I'm tagging along with you guys, said Ransom. And don't try arguing with me. I want to help you get him back. I feel totally vested in this now. You're a good friend, I replied. So are you, he said. One who almost got you killed. By the way, I'm so sorry about Simon. I truly am, I said. Ransom sighed. 
Me too. He was a jerk at times. He chuckled. Okay, many times. But he had some good moments too. I'm going to miss him. I sighed. I'm sorry for your loss. I'm sorry for yours too, he said somberly, speaking of Mia. As horrible as it was, we're alive and have to be thankful. You know, if it would have turned out the way John wanted it to, none of us would see another sunset, said Marshall. That's true. Speaking of which, has John tried calling any of the phones yet? I asked. No. I hate to say this, but if the ship really is bugged, he probably knows what's happening, said Marshall. What if he takes it out on my son? I said, horrified at the thought. What if he kills him? Let's assume he knows what's going on now. Realizes that the FBI is going to get involved. He still has Jake. He's not going to kill him. He needs him now more than ever, said Marshall. And remember, Marissa won't let John hurt him. I wanted to believe that, but after the last few hours, I wasn't even sure about anything anymore. 68. Mia. I walked back into the house, my pulse racing. I knew that before I sprayed John with the pepper spray, I would need to get the car keys from him. He's getting very warm in the car, I said. I think we should put the air conditioner on for him. He'll be fine. Did you leave the back door open? He asked, bending down next to the last body. Yes, but it's getting hot outside, too, I replied. It had to be almost 90 degrees already. He looked up at me with scorn in his eyes. Don't worry about him. Let's get this body into the trunk and do what we have to do. Sighing, I walked over to the other end of the corpse, and we picked it up. Just like the last one, it was awkward and heavy. There, he said, slamming the trunk shut after we managed to get it inside. Now we just need to clean up, and then you can follow me with this car to the well to dump the bodies. Then we'll head out to Tallahassee. I looked over at his car. That's fine, but we need to put the air conditioner on for Jake while we clean. I don't want him having a heat stroke. He scowled. You're being way too overprotective of that kid. Is it because he's strikers? No, I replied angrily. It's because he's an innocent little boy who has been through enough in the last few hours. You know, I don't know exactly what you plan on doing with him after you get his father's money, but at least show me that you have some decency in you, John. Rolling his eyes, he reached into his pocket and pulled out the car keys. Fine. I thought that sparing your life showed you just how much decency I had, but apparently not. I wanted to say something sarcastic, but held my tongue. Since he'd never freely give me the keys, especially with Jake in the back seat, I needed him to start the engine. I do appreciate that, I said warmly. I just hate to see anyone suffer. He let out a ragged sigh. I know you do which is the only reason I'm going to put the air conditioner on for him. I relaxed. Okay. Thank you. He smiled darkly and winked. Oh, you can thank me later when we get some alone time. The thought of him touching me was repulsive. Of course, I said, forcing a smile to my face. Gladly. Still smiling, he leaned forward, kissed me quickly on the lips and then walked over to the CTS. I watched as he shut the back door, got into the front, and started the engine. Reaching into my front pocket, I grabbed the can of pepper spray and took it out, hiding it behind my back so that he wouldn't see it. John got out of the car. There you go, he said, shutting the door. He should be cooled down in a few seconds. Thank you, I said again. He walked over to me. Are you happy now? Extremely, I said, bringing the pepper spray up to his face and spraying it. 
John screamed angrily and closed his eyes as they began to burn. I quickly ran around him and tried opening the front door, but it was locked. You bitch, hollered John, stumbling toward me blindly. I knew you were up to something. I knew it. I quickly moved out of his reach and ran to the other side of the vehicle. The doors were locked there as well. Jake opened the door. I yelled as he stared at me inside, wide-eyed and frightened. As he leaned over to unlock it, John felt his way around the car, his pain overshadowed by rage. I got into the back seat just as John reached my door. Unfortunately, my strength was no match for his. As I tried pulling the door shut, he flung it open. I backed away from him, toward Jake. Leave her alone. Jake screamed at him. John grabbed my ankle to try and pull me out. Gasping, I leaned forward and sprayed him again with the pepper spray. This time, even my eyes began to burn from the mist. John howled and released me. Using all of my strength, I raised my foot and kicked him in the chest so hard that he fell backward. Shaking, I pulled the door shut and locked it. Don't worry, I told Jake who was crying. Everything is going to be okay. Okay. I crawled into the front seat, my eyes still stinging, but thankfully I wasn't totally blinded. John got up and this time he was holding his gun. He pointed it at the car. Get out of the car or I'll shoot. Ignoring him, I threw the vehicle into drive and we tore off, the tires kicking up rocks in our wake. I could hear the sound of his gun going off, followed by a bullet hitting the trunk. Get all the way down on the floor. I ordered, frightened. Jake huddled behind my seat. Are you okay? I asked, looking in the rearview mirror. It didn't look like John was attempting to follow us. I knew that shooting him in the face again with the pepper spray had probably saved our lives. He wasn't catching up to us anytime soon. I'm fine. Good. Are we going to see my dad now? asked Jake. Yes, I replied, and then noticed the gas gauge. It was almost completely on E. 69. Damien. We'd reached port, and I was being interviewed by the FBI when my cell phone rang. It's Marissa, I told the two men who were questioning me. They nodded for me to answer it. Hello. I said into the phone, my hands shaking. They told me that if she called, to stay calm and pretend that I knew nothing of her involvement. Damien? Thank God you answered. It's Mia. Her voice shocked the hell out of me. I stood up. Mia, you're alive? Yes. So is Jake. I have him. I have your son. I sat back down, wondering if I'd actually heard her right. You have Jake? Yes. And you're alive. As far as I know, she said, and then laughed nervously. The relief was overwhelming. What? How? It's a long story. He's safe now, so don't you dare send that money. I definitely won't, I replied. We made it off of the ship, Mia. She let out a sigh of relief. Thank God. Is everyone okay? Yes. She sounded as if she was crying. I can't believe it. It's a miracle. I thought. I know. Everyone is fine. Well, not Simon. She sucked in a breath. Ransom's drummer. What happened? He was killed. That was the only innocent casualty, at least. Put her on speakerphone, said one of the agents, Garrison. Mia, I'm going to put you on speakerphone, I said. I'm with the FBI. Okay, she said. 
Hello, Miss James. My name is Detective Richard Garrison. Are you safe right now? I believe so, she answered. What's your location? he asked. She explained that they were about two and a half hours away from Naples. We're at this truck stop called Rooster's Diner, she replied. I believe the name of the town is called Williamsburg. Do you know if John is around? I asked her. No. I mean, I doubt he could find us. I'm parked behind the diner. We aren't far from where we left him, though. We're going to contact the local authorities and have them meet you there, said Garrison, motioning for the other agent to take care of it. Okay, she replied. I stood up. I want to drive out there too. Certainly. I'll drive you, said Garrison. Meanwhile, Ms. James, can you give us your account of what happened? Just so that we have an idea of what's going on. We'll take your full statement later. Sure. Mia gave us a rundown of everything, beginning with when she'd been forced to leave my yacht. She told us that John had killed Tracy, along with three others who'd been involved with the kidnapping. Lowering her voice, she also mentioned that Marissa had been one of the victims. Marissa Stryker? asked the agent, looking at me. Yes, she replied. I mean, I didn't see her face, but there were three bodies. One of them had to be her. Damien, I'm sorry. She put herself in that situation, I said, feeling sad for Jake. Unfortunately, she paid with her life. The only one I'm sorry for is Jake. Yes. Me too, said Mia. He's a good little boy. Despite the kind of person Marissa had become, I once loved her. The news didn't give me any satisfaction. Did he witness it? I don't think so, but he knows she's gone, Mia said softly. Do you have an address for either of the houses that John took you to? asked Garrison. No, but I could lead someone there, she replied. Okay. Good. Garrison looked at me. We should get going. I agreed. Stay put and wait for the local police, he told her. I will, she said. Let's go, said Garrison. I took her off of speakerphone and followed him. Can I talk to Jake? I asked her. Yes. Of course. She handed Jake the phone. Dad, is that you? Yes, I said huskily, my eyes filling with tears. It was so good to hear his voice and to know that he was safe. Jake, I love you, son. I love you too, Dad. Did they hurt you at all? No. I fell down and twisted my ankle though, he replied, and then went on to tell me how he'd tried escaping not once but twice. Mia saved me, Dad. I think John was going to kill me and still take your money. I smiled at his seriousness. He was still young but so darn intelligent. She's a nice woman. I owe her my life for saving you. He told the story of how she sprayed John with some pepper spray and then stole his car. You were both very brave, I said. I'm proud of you guys. Thanks, he said. I'll be seeing you soon, I said. Just hold tight, okay? I will. Put Mia back on the phone, I said, following the agent to the main deck. Okay. Hi, she said. We're leaving shortly. Okay. By the way, this phone is about to die and I don't have the charger, she said. Okay. We'd better hang up then. Yeah. One more thing. I don't know how I can ever thank you. You don't owe me anything. If anyone deserves to be thanked, it's Michael. If it wasn't for the pepper spray, I don't know if we'd have gotten away. Smart guy, I said, 
and then noticed Ridley sitting down on one of the lawn chairs, staring off into space. Wait a second. Ridley doesn't know you're alive. She sucked in her breath. Let me talk to her. Hold up, I told Garrison. He stopped. Ridley, I have someone who wants to talk to you, I said, stopping next to her. She looked up at me. Smiling, I handed her the phone. Seventy. Mia. Hello, murmured Ridley. Ridley. It's me. There was a long stretch of silence, and then she gasped. Mia. Yes. We were told that you died, she said, her voice breaking. Really? As far as I know, I'm still here. She was crying and laughing at the same time. I thought I'd lost you, she said through her tears. Those monsters lied. John lied because he wanted to take me away with him, I said dryly. How romantic, huh? She called him a bunch of names. How did you get away? It's a long story. I'll tell you when I see you. By the way, Jake is also here with me. Thank God, she said. Where are you? In Williamsburg. The phone is about to die, so I have to let you go. I'll see you soon, though, okay? She sniffed. Yes. I love you, Mia. I'm so happy you're alive. I love you too, and ditto. Ridley was about to say something else when the phone died. Crap, I said, staring at it. Can I go home now? asked Jake, who was still sitting in the back seat. No, but your dad is coming out to get us, I replied, staring at him through the rearview mirror. Along with the FBI. His eyes lit up. The FBI? Cool. I smiled at him. He was such a little cutie. He looked like his father, but with dimples. We just have to be patient and wait for them to arrive. The police should be arriving first. He yawned. Can we get something to eat? I'm hungry. I had no money. No identification. Nothing. I'm sorry, Jake. We're going to have to wait until your dad gets here. Maybe the police will have some water for you, though. Okay. Can I go to the bathroom then? He asked. Can't you hold it? No. I have to go really, really bad. I looked at the diner. There was an employee door that we could go through, next to the dumpster. Okay, I'll take you, I said and then got out. I opened up the back door and helped him stand up on one foot. Can you put any weight on your other ankle? I asked as he held on to me. I'll try. Jake put his foot down and tried standing on it. Ow. No. I can't. It hurts too much. The swelling had gone down a little but it still looked very tender. Okay. Just hold on to me, I said, leaning down so that he could put his arm over my shoulder. We hobbled over to the back door, and I tried the knob. It was open, so we went inside. Two men were bustling around in the kitchen, one was flipping burgers, the other was dropping french fries into the fryer. Sorry, I said when they noticed us. I smiled. He sprained his ankle and needs to use the bathroom. It's by the entrance in the front, mumbled the guy making burgers. He was the older of the two, and looked a little grumpy. It probably would have been a lot easier if you would have parked in front. Someone is trying to kill us, said Jake matter-of-factly. So we had to park in the back. The man's eyes widened. What? Someone's really trying to kill you, said the other cook, wiping his hands on his apron. Unfortunately, it's true, I replied, smiling nervously. The police are on their way here to help us. 
Who is it? asked the older man, scratching his chin. Your husband. No, I answered, although we'd have been married by now if I hadn't caught him cheating. I almost felt indebted to Tracy for the affair. Unfortunately, she'd been the one who'd paid dearly in the end. You said the bathroom is in the front? A waitress walked into the kitchen carrying a plate. Table four said his chicken is still clucking, she said, and then looked at me. Who are you? Before I could answer, the younger fry cook started talking excitedly. She said someone's trying to kill her and the kid. Is he in the diner? No. I mean, I hope not, I replied, stopping in my tracks. What if he was? We were only a couple of miles away from the house. I hadn't wanted to risk going too far with a car that was almost out of gas. She sprayed him in the eyes with pepper spray, said Jake. He can't see. He tried firing his gun but missed the car. Lord have mercy, said the waitress, her eyes wide. Someone was really firing at y'all? I nodded. We need to use your bathroom, I told her. Come with me. I'll show you where it is, she said. My name is Ruth, by the way. I'm Mia and this is Jake, I told her. You just tell me if you see that guy in the diner and I'll have Rooster get his gun, she murmured. Rooster was the owner. Where is he? I asked. He's the man who was frying up hamburgers back there, she replied. My husband. I helped Jake to the front of the diner, to the men's restroom. Do you need help getting in there? I asked him. No. I think I'll be fine, he said, letting go of me. He limped toward the bathroom door. I'll be right here, I told him when he turned around to look at me, an anxious expression on his face. He nodded and then went inside. I let out a ragged sigh and turned around. When I did, I noticed that everyone in the diner seemed to be gawking at me. Honey, you've got blood on your shirt and some on your neck, said Ruth, pointing. I looked down and grimaced. It had to have been from carrying the bodies. I'd been so caught up everything that I hadn't even noticed. You might want to go and clean that up, she added. Okay. Let him know that I'm in the other bathroom, I said to her. I'll be right out. No worries. I'll let him know, she said, grabbing a coffee pot. I stepped into the ladies' room, cleaned the blood from my neck, and splashed some water on my face. When I walked out of the restroom, I stopped dead in my tracks. Parked outside was the white Mercedes. 71. Mia. You okay? asked Ruth, walking back over to me. You don't look so good. Where's Jake? I asked, my head spinning. We had to get out of the diner. It was obvious that he knew we were inside. How? I had no idea. He's still in the bathroom. I think. I turned around and knocked on the men's room door rapidly. Jake. Are you almost done in there? Yes, he said loudly. I'm just drying my hands. Okay. Hurry up, I said, and then turned back to Ruth. You see that white car right out there? I said in a low voice. I didn't want to start a panic. That's the man who's searching for us. He's armed, and I've seen him kill people. Oh hell, she said loudly. Rooster. Get out here. Her husband walked out of the kitchen. What's up, he asked, wiping his hands on his apron. Come over here, she said, waving her hand. He stepped closer. What is it? The man trying to kill her and the boy is parked out in our lot, she replied. His eyes turned stormy. Where is he? I pointed to the Mercedes. He kidnapped Jake and then me, I whispered. 
and killed at least five people that I know of. I thought the police were on their way, he said, frowning. So did I, I answered, looking up the street. Nobody was on the road, let alone a cop. The men's room door opened and Jake hobbled out. Oh my God, said Ruth, staring outside. He's getting out of the car. That's him, you say. I turned back around. Yes, I replied, watching John approach the diner. I didn't think he could see us, but the expression on his face was a frustrated anger. Bring the boy into the back, said Rooster, walking behind the counter. He reached below and pulled out a shotgun. Folks, we might have ourselves a situation. I need for you to get down underneath your tables now. I put my arm around Jake. Come on. We have to hurry. What's wrong? asked one of the male customers, standing up. This guy coming in. He's armed and dangerous, Hal, said Rooster. Get your wife under the table in case I have to start shooting. The room erupted with gasps and frightened cries. We'd just gotten to the kitchen when the door jingled. Stop right there, I heard Rooster say. Whoa, what's this about? replied John. Keep your hands where I can see them, said Rooster. Up in the air. I'm scared, squeaked Jake. It's going to be fine, I whispered, trying to look through the partition without John seeing me. Ruth, call the police, said Rooster. There's no need for that, said John. I'm leaving. Stay where you are, said Rooster. Or I'll put a bullet in you. You can't shoot me. You'd go to prison, said John. There's no probable cause for you to fire that gun. Believe me, I know. I'm a lawyer. Rooster didn't say anything. Maybe I should sue you for threatening my life. There are a lot of witnesses here. They haven't seen me do anything. You shoot me, though. You'll be behind bars for a very long time. Is that what you want? Rooster remained silent. That's what I thought. I'm leaving. Have a nice day, he said dryly. The door jingled again, and I let out a sigh of relief. I turned back to look at Jake. He's gone. The boy relaxed. The next thing we heard was a loud explosion of glass, followed by frantic screams. I looked into the dining room and saw that John had driven the Mercedes through the glass, slamming into Rooster in the process. I stared in shock as the poor man was dragged under the vehicle. Rooster, screamed Ruth, trying to get to him after the car stopped. Oh my God. Horror and guilt rushed through me, knowing that her husband may have died because of us. Where in the hell were the cops? Where is she? Hollered John, getting out of the vehicle and waving a gun around. I saw the car parked in back. I know you're here, Mia. Oh no, whispered Jake, looking like a frightened rabbit. Let's get out of here, I said, putting my arm around him. If you don't get your ass out here in ten seconds, I'm going to start shooting people, John yelled. I froze. Don't go out there. Please, Mia, begged Jake. Take him out of this place, I said to the cook. Hide him somewhere. Whatever you do, please don't let John find him. I won't, he said, putting his arm around the boy protectively. My car's in back. Let's go. No, sobbed Jake. He'll kill her. I turned to look at him. I'll be fine. Be brave, Jake. He didn't say anything. The cook picked him up and began carrying him out back. I know you're in the kitchen. Get your ass out here, John hollered. Shaking, I turned to walk out of the kitchen when I noticed a box cutter sitting on one of the counters. I quickly unclipped the blade and put it in the palm of my hand. Mia. Last time. I'm coming. I hollered back. 
Taking a deep breath, I walked out of the kitchen to face John. When he saw me, I thought he was going to kill me right then and there. Instead, he asked where Jake was. He's not here, I said, staring in horror at Rooster, who was lying on the ground with blood dripping from his mouth. His eyes were open, and he looked to be in shock. Ruth was sitting next to him, crying. Where is he? John hollered. You know I'm not leaving here without him. I need him more than I need you. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed one of the customers reaching down to his ankle. He raised the bottom of his jeans, and I saw that there was a gun attached to his ankle. I quickly looked away. Unfortunately, John must have noticed my interest and turned to look at the man. Hold it right there, he yelled, pointing his gun at the customer. The man froze. John fired his gun at him. Everyone screamed. I charged at John and jumped onto his back. Remembering how Damien had put him into a headlock, I tried doing the same. Get off me, he growled, trying to remove my arm from his neck. You stupid bitch. Panicking, I fumbled with the blade that was still in my hand. I managed to bring it around to his jugular and cut him with it. John made a gurgling noise, and then blood began to pour from the gash in his neck. Horrified at what I'd done, I jumped off of his back, my hand covered with blood. John turned around and our eyes met. I stared at him helplessly. I'd just killed the man I once loved. A sickening guilt spread through me. Holding his neck, he crumbled to the floor. Sirens sounded in the distance and moved toward us. Trembling, I dropped the blade on the counter, wiped my hand on my jeans, and ran outside to look for Jake and the cook. I noticed that they were about to leave the parking lot, in an old SUV. Wait! I screamed, waving my hands in the air. Thankfully, his windows were open. The vehicle stopped. I ran up to them. It's okay. John is dead, and it looks like the police are finally on their way. I nodded toward the road. There were four cop cars speeding toward us with their lights flashing. Jesus, lady. Did you kill him? asked the cook, noticing my bloody hand and jeans. I nodded. Man, the cook said, looking pretty shocked. I wonder if they'll make a movie about this someday. If they did, I wanted no part of it. The last several hours wasn't anything I wanted to relive again, even on the big screen. Are you sure he's dead? asked Jake, still looking uncertain and scared. I walked around to the other side of the vehicle and opened up the door. I promise you, he's gone. His lip began to tremble. I want my dad. I know. I pulled Jake in my arms, and he hugged me so hard I could barely breathe. It's over, I told him, kissing him on the head. I swear to you. John is gone. He can't get to either of us anymore. So, all of the bad people are dead? he asked. I thought of John's words earlier. He'd mentioned that he wasn't the only one making decisions. I could only hope that Marissa, and the other two people that were back at the house were the ones he'd meant. Yes, the bad people are gone and you're safe, I said, as the cop skidded to a halt next to us. He relaxed in my arms. 72. Damien. When we reached the diner, I couldn't believe the wreckage. The entire front of the building was smashed in from the vehicle that had plowed into it. I recognized it as Marissa's car right away. Dad? hollered Jake, who was sitting in the back of an ambulance with Mia next to him. I rushed over and climbed inside of the vehicle. I pulled my son into my arms and hugged him. It was the best feeling in the world. I'd thought I'd lost him forever. Thank you, I said to Mia, almost too choked up to speak. She put her hand on my shoulder. 
You bet. Dad, said Jake, pulling away from me. He looked up into my face. You should have seen it. John almost got to us again, but Mia killed him. I looked at her. I could tell by her expression that she was still pretty shaken up herself. I know. I'd heard the story already. Apparently, John must have known that the two couldn't get very far, and had discovered them just a few miles from the place where he'd held my son. Unfortunately, there'd been one more casualty, and a man that had been severely injured from Marissa's car. Thankfully, the owner of the diner rooster didn't die, she said. I don't think I could have lived with myself. I noticed that she was wearing a t-shirt that said Rooster's Diner on it. He risked his life for us too. You should have seen him. He took out this big gun and pointed it at John. I didn't know they even had a gun here, said Jake excitedly. He sounds like a great guy. I'm going to have to make sure he's rewarded for trying to keep you safe, I told them. The FBI agents approached us. Ms. James, would you be able to answer a few questions for us? asked Garrison. I already spoke to the police and gave them my statement. She looked at me. They sent out a squad car to the house where they were keeping Jake. We still need to interview you, said Garrison. I'm sorry. I know it feels monotonous, but we need to make sure we have all the facts for the investigation. It's fine, she said, standing up. I understand. Wait, I said as Mia was about to climb out of the ambulance. She turned to look at me, and I pulled her into my arms and kissed her. I'm so glad you're alive, I said, staring into her eyes. I owe you everything. No, you don't, she said, smiling. I rubbed my finger across her cheek lovingly. Yes, I do. Some day, I'm going to make it up to you, too. Don't be silly, she said, amused. You don't have to do anything of the sort. I know that. But I want to. All I really want to do now is go home, she replied. And sleep. Me too, said Jake. Now that's something we can all agree on, I told them. 73. Mia. After both Jake and I were finished being questioned again by the FBI, we were able to leave. Damien rented a limo and we drove back to Miami, stopping on the way for pepperoni and mushroom pizza, which I learned was Jake's favorite food in the world. For most of the trip back we avoided talking too much about what had happened, including the events on the ship, which I knew had to have been quite an ordeal. I'd learned that all but one of the kidnappers had died. When we arrived back in town, they dropped me off at my place first. I hugged Jake goodbye and then Damien walked me to the door. After you get some sleep, call me, he said. I will. By the way, I had someone help Ridley pack all of your things from the ship and bring them here. Thanks. I knew that my purse and cell phone were probably still on the carver, in the overnight bag. I asked him about it. They're still looking for the boat, he replied. Don't worry. I'm sure they'll get your things back, though. At that moment, I didn't even care. I was so happy to be alive and home. He kissed me goodbye, and then I went inside. Ridley was in the kitchen when I entered. She squealed in delight when she noticed me and almost knocked me over with her hug. I'm so glad you're okay, we both said together and then laughed. What happened to you, she asked me. I quickly went over the events of my ordeal, and then she talked about what had happened on the ship. I'd heard most of it, but knew she needed to talk about it. How is your face doing? I asked, staring at the bruises. Oh, fine. I've been putting ice on my face. It's funny. I've never gotten hit in the face, and in the last couple of weeks, two men managed to break that record. 
Both losers, I replied, hoping that she never went back to Adam. As if reading my mind, she smiled sadly. Yes. At least they're both out of our lives now. I'm sorry he hurt you, I said, speaking of John. It wasn't your fault, she said. I know. I'm still sorry. We hugged again. How is Jake doing? she asked as we pulled away. He must be traumatized by everything. Surprisingly, he's handling it pretty well. I'm sure he's in shock, though. I know losing his mother has been really hard. He's better off without her, she said, scowling. I can't believe that woman did what she did. I know. Thank God Jake has such a wonderful father to fall back on. Do you think he'll need counseling? asked Ridley. He might. I'm sure it's too early to tell. I think I'm going to need it, she said truthfully. That was terrifying. I nodded. She looked at my t-shirt. What's with the shirt? They needed my other one for evidence, and it was so bloody anyway, I replied. Speaking of which, I need a shower. Yeah, I bet, she said. Go and take one. When you're finished, let's have a glass of wine. I don't know about you, but I could use about ten of them. I chuckled. Me too. By the way, my brother is coming over later. He wants to make sure we're okay. He said he'd just stop by for a few minutes. He knows we're tired and could use some sleep. I was exhausted. I'd slept for about a half hour in the limo. Good. I'd like to thank him. If it wasn't for the pepper spray, I don't know what I'd have done. And I was giving him crap about it. He basically saved mine and Jake's life, I replied. Who knew that my brother's overprotectiveness actually won out this time? He's going to gloat when he hears, she said. That's okay. He should. It was then that I remembered that I still had Marissa's cell phone. I pulled it out of my pocket. Whose is that? asked Ridley. It was Marissa's, I replied. It's dead. Her eyes widened. Nobody wanted it? To be honest, I think we all forgot I had it, I said. I'll give it to Damien. Did you get a chance to look at her messages? Not really. Just a couple. Let's charge the phone and look through it. There could be some more evidence in it. More than likely, a lot of evidence. It's an iPhone. My charger should work, she said. I gave her the phone. I'm going to take a shower while it charges, I replied, heading toward the stairs. Okay. I took a long time in the shower, thinking about the past couple of days. So much had happened and so many lives had changed. I thought of Jake most of all. He was such a sweet kid, and I still couldn't believe that his mother had risked his life because of greed. She'd had a little boy who was worth more than any fortune, and it hadn't been enough. I knew in my heart that Damien would trade every last cent for his son. I was just so happy that I'd been able to help him get Jake back. I knew that the boy would need some time to heal, but having a father like Damien, one who was so committed to his son, the road to recovery wouldn't be so harsh. I got out of the shower, slipped on my pajamas, and then brushed my teeth. When I walked out of the living room, Ridley had a strange look on her face. What's wrong? I asked. Nothing. Marshall just called and asked if you still had Marissa's phone. He's coming by to pick it up. Knowing Marshall, he also wanted Ridley's phone number, I mused. Did you look through it? No, she said, walking over to stand next to me. I forced myself to wait for you. That must have been hard. Of course, she said, smiling. I swiped my finger across the screen. 
look through her messages. I'm just curious to see if she was conversing with the kidnappers the entire time. I did what she asked. Marissa had messages from a lot of people, including asshole and asshole number two. I think asshole is Damien, I said. I wonder who asshole number two is. We looked at the text messages she'd received from Damien. They were basically requests for her to call him. He sent that earlier, she said, pointing to the date. We went into asshole number two's text messages. There were several, and the person sounded frantic. Shit is hitting the fan. Call me. He has taken the ship back. FBI is getting involved. Get him out of the house. Ridley and I looked at each other. This must have been sent from the guy they arrested, I said. She frowned. He said that he didn't know anything about any kid being involved. Of course he said that. He's a lying asshole, I replied. I suppose you're right, she said. The doorbell rang. That must be Marshall, she said. I followed her out of the kitchen, and we answered the door together. Thank goodness you're okay, were Marshall's first words when he saw me. He gave me a quick hug. I wanted to go with Damien when they found you, but things were still crazy on the ship. I smiled at him. It's no problem. Come on in, said Ridley. He stepped inside and looked around. So you two live together, huh? Yeah. I moved in after having those problems that I was telling you about my boyfriend. Excuse me, my ex-boyfriend, she answered, smiling up at him. It's nice and I think it's great that you two have each other's backs, he replied. I know, she said, looking at me. I don't know what I'd do without her. When I thought you were dead, I wanted to die myself. Her eyes were misty, and it made my own well up with tears. I feel the same way, I said, smiling at her affectionately. So, I suppose I'd better get the phone over to the FBI. Where is it? asked Marshall. In the kitchen, I said. He followed us in there, and I handed him the phone. Looks like you charged it. Did you get a chance to scroll through her text messages at all? he asked. A little. We did find out who asshole and asshole number two is, Ridley replied. His eyes widened and he smiled. What? She labeled two of her contacts those names. Obviously Damien is asshole, she said. He scrolled to her text messages and began reading them. And we're pretty sure that asshole number two is the guy who was on the ship. The one who survived, I said. It's kind of strange because he claimed that he didn't even know about Jake, and yet he was sending messages to Marissa. Unless it was someone else, he replied, frowning. Do you think that there was someone else involved that is still out there? Ridley asked, looking surprised. A crew member? Or maybe it was one of Ransom's friends. I said. You know, John hinted that there were others involved. I'm sure the FBI will be able to track who asshole number two is, she said. I can't wait to find out myself. You won't have to, said Marshall. I can tell you right now who it is. We both looked up at him. He was holding a gun and pointing it right at us. Ridley looked shocked. What are you doing? You still don't get it, do you? He replied, a sad expression on his face. You know, I really liked you too. It's a shame that it has to end this way. 74. Damien. As we were heading toward home, I received a phone call from Ransom. How did it go? He asked me. I told him what went down, and he whistled through his teeth. Wow, what a nightmare. I'm just so relieved that it's finally over. I bet. 
How is everyone else doing? Fine, he replied. Happy to be home with their loved ones. Speaking of loved ones, I said, smiling. Did you find out what the big news was with Tiffany? You were right. She is pregnant, he replied, a smile in his voice. Congratulations. You're going to make a great father. I'm excited for you. Thanks. I'm pretty excited myself. We spoke for a few more minutes, and then he reminded me about the wedding. How can I forget? I wouldn't miss it for the world. Bring Mia, if you're still seeing her by then. I grinned. I don't know how she feels, but I'm planning on seeing her at least a few more times. If she's still interested. He chuckled. Time will tell. Yes, indeed. I'd better let you go. I'll call you in a few days. We'll touch base. Sounds good. Thanks again for your support and help, Ransom. You're a great friend. You too. I'm just glad that everything worked out in the end. I thought about Simon. Almost everything. He sighed. Shit happens. It could have been a lot worse. Definitely. Have a good night. You too. After hanging up with Ransom, another call came in. It was from Detective Garrison. We never recovered Marissa's phone, he told me. We need it as evidence. Mia must still have it. That's what I'm thinking. Is she home now? We'll send an agent out to her place to retrieve it. I was actually curious as to what was on the phone myself. I tell you what, I just left her place and she looked wiped out. I'll go back and get it from her, and then meet you somewhere. That way she can get some sleep. You mentioned that you had a few more questions for me anyway, right? Yes. Okay, I'm almost to my home. I'm going to drop Jake off there and head back to Mia's. Once I have the phone, I'll call you. Sounds good. We hung up. Forty minutes later, I pulled up to Mia's in my truck. As I was about to ring the doorbell, I heard someone crying out in the house. It sounded like Ridley. Then I heard a man's voice. It sounded angry. I didn't know what was going on, but my gut told me that they were in danger. Maybe Ridley's ex-boyfriend had returned? I wondered. Instead of ringing the doorbell, I tried looking in the living room window, but didn't see anything. I rushed to the side of the house and peered into the kitchen. What I saw made my blood run cold. It was Marshall, and he had his gun pointed toward Ridley and Mia. 75. Mia. You were involved in this all along? How could you do this to your own cousin? asked Ridley, staring at him in disbelief. Because he's a rich, arrogant prick who has had everything handed to him on a silver platter, Marshall said angrily. So, you're saying that you did this because of jealousy? I replied. He ignored me. Damien's mother and my mother were sisters. Did you know that? We both shook our heads. Another thing you wouldn't know is that Damien and I aren't just cousins. We are half-brothers. I stared at him in horror. What are you talking about? When my mother was on her deathbed, she told me that Damien's father, Edward, was the one who got her pregnant with me. Not the man who I'd been told all my life was my father. So they had some kind of affair? Your mother and Edward, asked Ridley. They were together for one weekend. You see, my mother worked for him. That's how Edward and Damien's mother met in the first place. Anyway, my mother was his secretary. They went out of town together once for a business trip, and things happened. 
Nine months later, boom, I was born. Are you sure you're really Edward's son? I asked. She claimed that during that time, she and my father didn't have marital relations. That they'd been separated. Funny thing is, I'm surprised he didn't find it strange that I was conceived during a time they weren't together, he replied. Maybe he didn't want to know, I said, feeling sick inside. It was like one big soap opera. Sometimes real life was stranger than fiction. Does Damien know? asked Ridley. Not that I'm aware. I told his grandfather after my mother died. He didn't believe me. He became angry and accused me of trying to claim part of the Stryker family fortune. Maybe you could have had some kind of a blood test taken? I replied. To prove you were brothers? A DNA test? Not possible. Edward had been dead for many years, and the truth was, I didn't want to hurt the man who raised me, he said. Is your father alive today? I asked. No, he said. Could you imagine how hurt he'd be if he knew what you did? I said. His face darkened. I'm due some of the money that Damien has inherited. It's my birthright. It was then that I noticed Damien creeping around the corner behind Marshall. His eyes told me to keep him talking. You should have spoken to Damien about it, I said quickly. Instead of having his son kidnapped. Maybe if you told him what your mother had told you, Damien would have reacted differently than his grandfather. He's a reasonable guy. Are you kidding? Even Damien isn't that reasonable. Not when billions of dollars are at stake. Although, I really don't have any other options anymore. It's obvious that his son is going to be guarded 24 hours a day from this day forward, said Marshall. Damien rushed him from behind. He knocked the gun out of Marshall's hand, and both of them went down to the ground. Oh my God! cried Ridley, moving close to me, as the two men began to wrestle. What do we do? Get out of here. Damien growled up at us as he tried putting Marshall in a headlock. Leave and I'll blow his brains out. Hollered Marshall, reaching his gun. Ridley and I looked at each other helplessly. 76. Damien. When I overheard Marshall, I felt sick to my stomach. I couldn't believe he was involved with the kidnapping, and all because of greed. As far as him being my brother, I hoped to hell he wasn't. Mainly because it would break my heart even more. Drop the gun, I ordered, getting my arm around his neck. I don't want to kill you, he said, struggling to get out of the headlock. How could you do this, Marshall? I growled. I loved you. Jake loved you. He wasn't supposed to get hurt. Neither were you. That's why I helped take back the ship, he replied, elbowing me in the stomach. I grunted in pain, but didn't release him. Instead, I let go of his neck and tried taking the gun from him. He elbowed me again and scrambled to his feet. I got up and scowled at Mia and Ridley. They were still standing there. Damn it, Damien. Why are you here, he said, looking like he was on the verge of tears. You weren't supposed to be here. The limo left. I saw it. I raised my hands in the air. Put the gun down. I swear to you, it was never my intention to hurt Jake. John was supposed to go back and kill Marissa and the others. Then he'd give you back your son once the money was wired. Why did you help me take back the ship if you were in on this? Damien asked. To throw off suspicion for one, and because we didn't want to split the money with Chuckles and the others, he said. It was just going to be divided between myself and John. We needed the other men initially, though. To help kidnap Jake and later take the fall. 
But John screwed up by taking me, Mia said. Yes. He wasn't supposed to. I had no idea that he was going to do that, said Marshall. Anyway, the only reason I'm here is because Mia has the cell phone and the record of me texting Marissa. People died, I snapped. All because of your greed. Your selfishness. It's easy for you to talk about others being greedy and selfish when you're rich. You had everything you ever wanted. Do you know that there were times when my parents could barely afford to put food on the table? I'm sorry about that. But Marshall, at least you had your parents, I replied angrily. I barely remember mine. Do you know that I would have given everything I had to grow up with them? I would have given up my inheritance if that would have been an option. I used to cry myself to sleep, wishing that my parents were around. Yes, in your grandfather's million-dollar mansion. Poor little rich boy. My heart bleeds for you, he said dryly. The contempt in his eyes pained me. He'd been my cousin and my best friend. I felt so betrayed. So now what? I asked, nodding toward the gun. You're going to kill me? I have no choice. I'll go to prison if I don't, he said. You have a choice. There's always a choice, I said. Mia, who was hunkered in the corner of the kitchen with Ridley, started pleading with Marshall. Don't do it. Jake has already lost his mother. Don't take his father away, too, she said. His mother, replied Marshall, a disgusted look on his face. Jake is better off without her. Do you know she spread her legs for anything that moved? She even came on to me. I just stared at him. I didn't take her up on the offer. She disgusted me. She was a whore, he said. Instead, you screwed me, I said. I, you had more than enough money. This would have hardly put a dent in your piggy bank, said Marshall. Does Kendall know about this? I asked him. No. She doesn't even know about your father and our mother, he replied. I think it would break her heart. The FBI is going to find out about this, I told him. They're going to check Marissa's phone records and link the number to you. In fact, Agent Garrison knows that I'm here and that Mia still has the cell phone. I could tell by the look in his eyes that he was starting to panic. I continued. If he finds us murdered, it won't take long for them to come after you. Didn't you realize that they'd see your phone number on Marissa's log? I only sent her a couple of texts to try and warn her. I was going to erase them before they were ever viewed, he said quickly. Marshall nodded toward Mia and Ridley. Unfortunately, those two were nosy and now everyone has to pay. Nobody has to. Put the gun down, I told him. He was so upset now that he was sweating profusely. Damn it. This wasn't supposed to go down like this. The only people who were supposed to die were the ones who hijacked your boat and the people holding Jake hostage, he said. Give me the gun, I replied, holding out my hand. We'll figure something out. We'll do it together. As a family. No. Nothing is going to be figured out, he said, a wild look in his eyes. Kendall will never understand. Jake's going to hate me. I didn't want that. I didn't want you to die, either. Hell, I didn't really even want them to die. He started crying. I'm sorry, Damien. Before I could stop him, Marshall raised the gun to his own head and pulled the trigger. 77. Mia. Three months later. Mia, said Jake. Don't forget the glass of milk. It was Christmas Eve, and we were in the kitchen putting together a plate of cookies for Santa Claus, along with something to wash them down with. Oh, I almost forgot it, 
I said, opening the refrigerator. I grabbed the carton of milk and poured it into the Santa cup Jake had given me to use. The same one that Damien used as a child. Okay, are we set? He nodded and then yawned. Come on, let's go and put them by the tree, I said, yawning as well. I followed him out of the kitchen, through the hallway, and into the large drawing room where the main tree stood. It was seventeen feet tall, and it had taken us an entire week to decorate. The results were breathtaking. Then there was the rest of the room, which was also adorned with holiday decorations. There was even a miniature train track with a running choo-choo train that trailed throughout the room, which Damien had spent hours putting together. A Christmas in the Stryker home was truly magical. You have everything ready for Santa? asked Damien, who was seated at the grand piano. Yes, said Jake, setting the plate of cookies down on the fireplace next to the tree. Can you play one more song before I go to bed? Actually, let's have Mia play the song she's been practicing, he said. Jake's eyes lit up. Okay. I don't know. I think we should let your father play another song instead, I replied. The song I'd been practicing was Silent Night. It still sounded choppy when I played it. Nonsense. We want to hear you. Look, I've already found the song for you, he answered, smiling brightly. Damien stood up and moved away from the piano. Play it, Mia. You said you would, exclaimed Jake. I sighed. Fine. It's your ears. I walked over to the piano and sat down. Taking a deep breath, I played the song for them, thankfully only messing up on a couple of keys. Bravo, said Damien, clapping his hands. That was great, Mia. Thank you, I said, getting up from the piano. I think it's time for you to be tucked into bed. Santa is going to be coming soon, said Damien. And if you're still awake, he might not leave any presents. Okay. He turned to me. Mia, will you tuck me in? I stared at him in surprise. He usually always asked his father to tuck him in. Ah, uh, sure. I'd love to. Good night, Dad, he said, throwing his arms around Damien's waist. Don't stay up too late. You might scare Santa. Don't worry. Mia and I will be heading off to bed very soon ourselves, he said. Okay. I'll be back, I said to Damien as Jake pulled me out of the room. Take your time, he said loudly. As we walked through the sprawling mansion, we met up with Garrick, who was now Damien's head of security. Although he was the size of a football player and usually had a brooding look about him, Garrick was a big softy around Jake. You're not in bed yet? asked Garrick, approaching us. We had to get the cookies ready for Santa Claus, explained Jake. Ah, of course. You don't want to forget those. Santa has a hearty appetite. He needs all the sugar he can to keep his energy up, replied Garrick. I know right, said Jake. Cookies wake you up. They won't let me eat any for breakfast. If Santa can, I don't know why I can't. Because you are a little boy who needs real nutrition and not a temporary sugar rush. Anyway, I'm sure Mrs. Claus fixes him a very healthy meal before he heads out to deliver packages, I said. Garrick smiled. She's right. And if you want to have big muscles someday, you're going to need to eat the healthy stuff first before the cookies, kid. Is that what you do? asked Jake, who idolized Garrick. Especially since he knew that the man was in charge of keeping him and his father safe. Every day, he replied. That's how I keep sharp and strong, both in mind and body. I knew if Ridley were here, she'd want to see proof. She'd met him last week and had almost tripped over her tongue. I ate all of my asparagus tonight, said Jake proudly. Good. How was it? asked Garrick. 
He frowned. It was okay. They let me put that hollandaise sauce on it, so it tasted better. Did you know that asparagus makes your pee smell funny? Garrick laughed. A small price to pay for a healthy body. Jake yawned. We need to get you to bed, I said. Before you're too tired to walk to your room. Yeah. Good night, Garrick, said Jake. Good night, kiddo, he replied. I smiled at Garrick, and we began climbing the long spiral staircase to the top floor. It's too bad your grandfather never put in an elevator, I said, a little out of breath when we reached the top. Damien had inherited his mansion, and although it was a luxurious home, it was also insanely huge. I'd even gotten lost in it a couple of times. As impressive and elegant as the place was, it was too much for me. I could never see myself living there. There's one, but it's on the other side of the house. By my grandpa's old office. I was going to say, he must have been in good shape just to walk from one end of the house to the other, I mused. He obviously ate all his veggies, huh? Jake nodded. We walked down the hallway, passing Damien's suite, until we reached his. I waited for Jake to open the door, but he just looked at me. Can you go in first, he asked. Damien had mentioned that ever since he'd been kidnapped, Jake had been anxious about entering his room. He thought someone or thing would be waiting for him inside. Of course I will, I replied. I opened the door and flicked on the lights. As usual, the bedroom took my breath away. Not only was it huge, but magical. From the castle-themed loft bed to the dragon playhouse that featured a slide made out of the creature's tail. Not to mention that Jake seemed to have every toy imaginable. I couldn't believe Damien had found gifts that the boy didn't already have to put under the tree. You'd better brush your teeth and use the bathroom before you get into bed, I told him. He groaned. Can't I just miss doing it tonight? Is that why you asked me to tuck you in? I teased. Because you thought I'd be easily manipulated? His eyes became serious. No. I just wanted to you because my mother usually does that on Christmas Eve, Jake replied, and then his lip began to tremble. I knew he was thinking about how much he missed her. Even after everything, he was still having a hard time accepting that his mother was gone. Damien had even mentioned that some nights, when he went to check on him, he found Jake crying in bed. I put my arms around the boy and hugged him. We'd gotten very close the last three months, and it hurt me to see him in pain. I'm sorry Jake, I said, kissing him on the top of his head. I know it's tough. He nodded. Hey, if you go and brush your teeth right now, I'll read you a bedtime story as soon as you're finished. Would you like that? Yes, he replied, sniffling. Could you read The Night Before Christmas? That's the one I was hoping to read to you. Do you have the book? He let go of me and ran over to his bookcase. He pulled it out and brought it back over. Read this one. As soon as you use the bathroom, I reminded him. He turned around and rushed into his bathroom. When he was finished, Jake quickly took the ladder up to his loft bed and then turned around to look down at me. Is it okay if you read it up here to me? Of course, I replied and then climbed up after him. Fortunately, there was enough room for me to sit next to him on the bed, and it was certainly sturdy enough. Don't worry, he said, noticing my hesitation when I reached the top. My mother used to sit up here with me, and she was bigger than you. I smiled. I can imagine why. It's a really neat view from up here. I said, looking down and around his room. Yeah. I'm getting tired of the bed, though. It's too babyish. I stared at him in surprise. Really? 
This is so cool though. It is, but I'm going to be nine soon, he replied. I'm too old for this. I knew the ordeal had made him grow up very fast, and it pained me to hear him say that. Did you tell your dad that you'd like something different? He nodded. He said we're moving soon, and that when we do, I can pick out something else. I looked at him in surprise. I hadn't been aware that they were moving. Where are you moving to? I asked. I forgot, he replied, yawning. Can you read the book now? I'm tired. Please. Of course, I said, opening it up. I read him the story, half of my mind on the fact that they were moving, and the fact that Damien had failed to mention anything about it. When I was finished, I looked over and noticed that he was sleeping. I gave him a light kiss on his forehead, and then climbed out of the loft. I love you, he whispered. I looked over at him, thinking that he was talking in his sleep. His eyes were open, however, and he was staring at me. It warmed my heart and brought a tear to my eye. I love you too, Jake, I replied, smiling at him. Smiling back, he closed his eyes. I climbed down the ladder, made sure his nightlight was turned on, and then quietly backed out of Jake's room. 78. Mia. How is he? I gasped and turned around to find Damien standing there. Sorry, he said with an amused grin. I didn't mean to scare you. It's fine. I just wasn't expecting you, I replied. Anyway, he's doing good. I just read him a bedtime story, and he should be asleep very soon. Good. He loves you, you know, said Damien, grabbing my hand. We started walking back downstairs. I love him too, I said. He's an incredible little boy. Yes, he is. I thank the stars that he survived. That you both did. My family means everything to me, he said. My eyebrow went up. Did he just refer to me as family? I know, I said. If only. Damien's voice trailed off, and he got that faraway look in his eyes. I still can't believe what happened with Marshall. He'd never been just my cousin. I'd always thought of him as my best friend. We grew up together, and yeah, I always knew that my grandfather was rich, but he didn't spoil me. He made me work hard for everything that I acquired. I even paid for my own car insurance as a teenager. So did I, I replied. I'd had my first job at 15, working as a dishwasher at Pizza Joint. It had gotten me my first car, an old Ford Taurus that had seen better days. But it had worked, and I'd been very proud of it at the time. What about your first vehicle? I asked. It was an old Mustang. I bought it myself, if you're wondering. My eyebrows went up. I hadn't expected that. I'd thought for sure that his grandfather given him his first car. He did actually offer to buy me my first vehicle, though. But he wouldn't do it until I was 18 and graduated from high school. I couldn't wait that long. I smiled. Understandable. Especially knowing how much Damien enjoyed his cars. You know, as rich as he was, my grandfather was very tight with his money. Like everyone else, I had chores and was required to do them. Not asked. Required. What kind of chores? When I was really young, I had to help the housekeeper dust and sweep this monstrosity. The mansion had to be over 20,000 square feet. It would have been a lengthy task for anyone, especially a young boy. Damien went on. As I grew older, I was in charge of making sure that his cars were washed and polished every Friday. He had quite a few of them. He smiled. I'm sure that's probably where I became obsessed with classic vehicles. My grandfather loved them too. 
I bet. I'd seen Damien's collection of cars and knew that they were worth millions of dollars. Anyway, I also had to walk his dogs and keep their kennels clean. Damien then went on to name several other jobs he'd been given, and I was impressed. What was your allowance like? He shrugged. I don't know. I think when I was really young, he just treated me to ice cream on the weekends. When I grew older, I think I'd get anywhere from $15 to $20 a week. It wasn't anything outlandish. I guess not. My grandfather didn't come from money. He earned it and wanted me to as well. From what I heard, however, my father had been spoiled. That might be why he wanted to try something different with me, said Damien. I knew he'd been wondering about Marshall's claim of the two of them being brothers. The fact that his father and aunt might have been having an affair really bothered him. Was your father? My words trailed off. An arrogant rich asshole, he said, smirking. Yes. Sorry. I didn't know how to put it. He laughed. It's okay. To be honest, I don't remember. I just remember that he laughed a lot and took me to fun places, like the zoo and Disney World. We went there a few times. That's great, I replied. And it seemed as if my parents got along very well. They never fought. At least from what I can recall. They might have hidden it from you. They might have hidden things from each other, he said, sighing. Very true. We walked down the staircase and headed back to the drawing room. I took the liberty of chilling you a bottle of your favorite wine, he said. Or maybe I should say it's mine, since you attacked me after drinking it. Knowing that he was referring to the first night we'd made love, I had to smile. That was because of your music. Not the alcohol. Then forget the wine. Let's go over by the piano, he joked, setting the bottle down. Are you hoping to get lucky again this evening? It's my hope every evening. I laughed. He opened up the wine, poured me a glass, and then went over to the piano. Sit down next to me, he said softly. I did what he asked. He looked into my eyes. I wrote something for you. You did? I asked, smiling in pleasure. He nodded and then began to play. 79. Mia. The song started off soft and almost whispery. It was delicate. Ghostly. Ethereal. I closed my eyes and listened as its melody went from breathy to something more velvety and lush. I pictured the two of us together, making love, and almost didn't let him finish the song. As the music tapered off, however, I wanted him to play it again. It was so beautiful. The depth of the song touched both my heart and my soul, and it brought tears to my eyes knowing that he'd written it for me. Damien looked at me after he was finished. Before he could ask me about the song, I put my hands on both of his cheeks and kissed him on the lips. Does that mean you liked it? He whispered, staring into my eyes. I loved it. It was so beautiful, Damien. Can you play it again for me? Maybe, he said with a twinkle in his eyes. Please. I'll do anything, I replied, giving him a wicked grin. You know what your music does to me. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a small box. You'll do anything. My heart pounded in my chest as he opened it. Inside was a beautiful sparkling diamond ring. He held it out to me. Would you even wear this? My mouth formed a small circle. What is this? I know that I haven't said it yet, but... I love you, Mia. I was speechless. I just stared at him. 
Was he asking me to marry him? I love you too, Damien. You do? I thought so, but I wasn't sure, he said with a smile in his voice. I wanted to tell you that I loved you, but I thought it would be too soon, and... I didn't want to scare you away, I replied. Scare me away? I thought the same thing. To tell you the truth, I think I fell in love with you back at the club, the night we met. I can still remember seeing the pain in your eyes after you met Tracy, and it hit me right in the chest. All I wanted was to take all of the hurt away. To protect you. Are you sure it wasn't pity you felt? I've never felt any pity for you, he said, his eyes growing stormy. I love you, Mia. Besides Jake, you're everything to me. When I thought that you died, I was ready to kill John with my own bare hands. Thankfully, you didn't have to, I whispered, looking at the ring again. It was so beautiful. It took my breath away. No, but if he was still alive and threatening you, I wouldn't have thought twice about it. I'd have traveled the world to find the man and make him pay for everything he did to you. I could tell by the look on his face that he was deadly serious. Damien took the ring out of the box. Mia, you and I are meant to be together. I couldn't imagine waking up in the morning without you next to me. Tomorrow or fifty years from now. I've never felt like this before. Not with anyone. Tears sprang to my eyes. I licked my lips. I love you. Jake loves you. Lord knows that we both need you. Would you do me the honor of being my wife? Yes, I whispered in a husky voice. He let out a shaky sigh of relief and slid the ring on my finger. I laughed at his reaction, as if I'd say no. His lip curled up. I wasn't sure. If you couldn't tell that I loved you, then we'd better get you fitted for glasses, I told him, wiping the tears from my eyes. He wrapped his hands around my waist and began kissing me. Soon one thing led to another and our clothes ended up on the ground. When we were finished, we lay next to each other, holding hands and talking again. By the way, Jake mentioned that you two were moving, I said. Yes. I suppose I should have mentioned it, he said, sitting up. Probably. Maybe even before you asked me to marry you, I said, amused. I'm selling this place. My eyes widened. What? He looked around the drawing room. This isn't me. It's far too big and elegant. You don't like elegant? I replied. What about that boat of yours? That's different. It's not a real home. It's great to travel on and I like impressing my friends, he admitted and then smiled. Rich or not, guys like to do that. I figured, I said dryly. But when it comes to a place where I'd like to finish raising Jake and possibly have more kids, I want something much smaller. More kids? I asked, delighted. He grinned. Yes. I'd like to have more children. I'd really like to have a girl. Maybe two. Hell, maybe five. I know Jake needs some siblings, and I think it would be good for him. I would love to have kids. I looked around the drawing room. It was impressive, and reminded me of something you'd find in a castle. But, it was a little too much. I totally agree that this house is a little overwhelming. Good. Then it's settled. We'll start looking for a new place, and announce our engagement after Christmas is over. Wait a second. You've put in a lot of requests, which is fine, but I have one of my own. I gave him a serious look. One that is firm and non-negotiable. His smile fell. What is it? There will be absolutely positively no bachelor parties. Is that it? 
I thought you were going to ask me to fire my hot new secretary. I laughed. His hot new secretary was twice his age and could double as his bodyguard. No, but I might send her after you if you have one of those wild, crazy parties. He took my hand and kissed it. Believe me, I've had my share of bachelor parties and have no qualms about skipping my own. I know. How about we have a couple's party? He nodded and smiled. Great idea. Just make sure that you invite Garrick, I replied. He'll be there no matter what. He's the head of my security team. I know. From what I'd learned, he owned the security company and was very well off. Why do you want him there? Ridley is hot for him. He frowned. What is it? I asked. You should probably tell her to stay away from him. He's made it pretty clear that there is no room in his life for romance. I laughed. You talk to him about romance? We talked a little about his private life when I was interviewing him for the job. Does he even like women? I asked. Damien laughed. For sex, yes. I'm not sure if he likes women for anything else. My eyes widened. Nice. Exactly. So tell Ridley that she'd be better off looking for love somewhere else. Maybe he just hasn't met the right woman? And you think that Ridley might be? I don't know. I do think that she needs something to take her mind off of what happened on the ship, though. Maybe it's a challenge like Garrick. I'm sure there are a lot of guys who could take her mind off of that. She could even join a dating service. God, no. She doesn't need to. Guys are always asking her out. But that's not what she wants. She likes challenges. Thrives on them. And you think he's the answer? I don't know what the answer is for her. All I know is that she's been having nightmares about John and everything that happened on the ship. Maybe she should see a shrink for that. She did. The man told her to keep busy and that time would heal all of her wounds. She should get a new shrink, said Damien dryly. She did drop him. Anyway, I think, in a way, that Ridley really does need some kind of distraction. Even if it's just a casual ling. His eyes lit up and he laughed. Funny. She said the same thing to me about you. My eyebrow went up. She did, huh? Yes. He told me about the conversation they'd had at the restaurant. How she told Damien that I needed to get laid. As mortified I am of her right now, she was right about us in the long run. I think I should try and return the favor. He frowned. We don't really know this guy, Mia. He might really be a complete jerk toward women. I thought about the way Garrick had talked to Jake with such warmth and honesty. I could that he was a caring individual. Maybe he just hadn't found the right woman to bring out that side of him. And he might not. Enough about them. We only have a few more hours before Jake is up and looking around for presents, he replied. And I have another package with your name on it. I smiled. Oh yeah? Come back over here so that I can deliver it. I snorted. Santa, you are being a very naughty boy. I think it's time to teach you a lesson. Ho ho ho, he said with a silly grin. I'm starting to think that being on the naughty list might not be so bad. Especially on this cold winter's night. I laughed. You're crazy, do you know that? His face became serious. Crazy in love. Me too. I murmured before he pulled me into his arms and we spent the rest of the evening celebrating our craziness together. 
The end. Thank you for listening to Billionaire at Sea, written by K. L. Middleton. To hear more stories, please don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you'll be notified when new books are released. Thank you so much for listening.